My long-time refusal to give arbitrary scores at the end of reviews has earned me several complaints from people, obviously some extremely thick people who can't pay attention for 10 seconds because they get distracted by clouds and shiny objects, who claim to be frequently unable to decipher whether or not I think a game is good. And since it's the new year, traditionally the time when self-important gaming media outlets bestow accolades to the utter indifference of gamers and developers alike, here are the Zero Punctuation Awards for 2008. I wasn't sufficiently married to this idea to create actual trophies, but winners are encouraged to make their own if it's that important to them. <laughs> Two thousand and eight was a year suffering from a terrible case of the sequels. Most of them were really just going through the motions, stagnating their respective franchises rather than outright slaughtering them. But no series this year was euthanized quite so thoroughly as Metal Gear Solid. Not content with transforming the widely beloved central character into a terminally ill old fogey with a magnum PI mustache, Metal Gear Solid Four then proceeded to irreversibly tie up every slightest loose end with the rapid efficiency of an obsessive compulsive man in a shoelace factory. None of which would have mattered so much if they hadn't killed most of the stealth aspect in favor of frustrating action sequences and an entire mini series worth of cutscenes, culminating in an ending as sickening and arduous as a cheesecake the size of a manhole cover. Rest in peace, you preachy, overwritten pile of tripe. <laughs> Silent Hill Homecoming was my first choice for this award for creating an instalment to a series that specialises in subtlety and pacing and opening it with a bloke getting a bust sword up the jacksie. But then I remembered Alone in the Dark from earlier in the year, which took subtlety and pacing, lit them on fire and ramped off them several times in slow motion. And it would have been remiss of me not to also mention Dead Space, which might have been alright if it had merely copied System Shock completely, but which felt it had to extract all the subtlety and pacing and blast them out the nearest airlock. So rather than choose from the many worthy candidates, I've decided to award biggest disappointment to the entire survival horror genre because there weren't any mainstream horror games this year, just a bunch of action games full of enemies with arms growing out of their tits. <laughs> For most of the year it seemed like Ethan Thomas from Condemned 2 was going to sweep this award for his game's spectacular abandonment of gritty seriousness that left him using shouty superpowers to fight stage magicians, but that was more stupid character development than behaviour, and he was pipped at the post by the Prince of Persia in the recent instalment of the same name, who, without giving away the kind of spoilers that get me spat on in the street, does something at the end of the game that destroys everything he'd been working towards for the benefit of a character no one likes. And they force you to do this within gameplay if you want to see the ending, that's like refusing me my desserts until I've pushed the entire main course up my nose. Sort of. <laughs> Mirror's Edge was a hot contender for this award, until I remember that the game's badness didn't come as any surprise to me because it was by EA, and I am apparently more skilled in pattern recognition than most. So the award goes to none other than Grand Theft Auto 4, which decided that the best way to bring its speciality madcap sandbox fun into the new console generation was to dip the graphics in filthy dishwater, construct all the vehicles from depleted uranium, and break up the gameplay every five minutes to make you wheel your fat cousin to places and shovel burgers into his gob. Congratulations go out to all at Rockstar as soon as someone wakes them up. <laughs> Again, Mirror's Edge was a hot contender, as were Too Human and Haze and every other game no one gave a toss about before release and gave even less of one afterwards, but at the risk of beating a puddle of wobbling giblets that used to be a dead horse, I couldn't in good conscience give this award to anyone other than Sonic the Hedgehog for his latest opus because he has been trying so damn hard for something like six games, but continues to fail to notice that all along he's been running on the spot in a pile of sticky unplayable mess, which is at least laudable for its consistency. Sonic Team are to be congratulated for their epic storytelling and orchestral soundtracks and their sheer dogged determination to overlook the fact that their main character is a fucking cartoon rat. <laughs> Long time viewers may be perplexed by GTA 4's award because in my original review I may have accidentally called it a good game. At the time you see I was jaded by release drought and the never ending flow of completely drivelous fan mail and was spending most of my time in a blurry haze in which I mistook the slightest mental stimulation for actual fun. It wasn't until recently when Saints Row 2 came along that I remembered what a fun sandbox game is and isn't. What it isn't is brown gritty enforced tutorials and what it is is taking all your clothes off, hurling yourself out of a plane and landing arse crack first on a sunbather's face. Saints Row 2 might not be the smartest game in the world but I had more fun with it than any other 2008 release, so I guess it had better be my game of the year. But don't let it go to your heads. <laughs> What with pretty much all the big releases this year being homogenous interchangeable sequels and everything, it's only natural that a couple should slip the net. Gears of War 2, Tomb Raider Underworld and Far Cry 2 all escaped the year unreviewed, largely due to my utter indifference. But never let it be said that I am prejudiced. Now we're out of the Christmas release glut, there should be plenty of time to give them a good sound maiming to ring in 2009, and all of them could potentially surprise me and cause me to rethink my choice of game of the year. Except Tomb Raider, obviously. And so once again we slip into the D-cups of Lara Croft, world's worst archaeologist. When she's not putting her foot through inestimably valuable samples of ancient pottery, she's stealing every slightly 
slightly shiny thing that was ever buried with some royal dead guy and hoarding them in her basement. And yet the academic world continued to let her run amok, probably because A, academics are basically the alpha males of the nerd pack, and B, Lara Croft is built like a giant bong with two footballs nailed to it. There's also a reasonable explanation for why this series is still going, because any cover art that shows off a decent enough pair of perky nips directly penetrates the primitive part of the male brain, and awkward nerds have to fight a powerful instinct to club the game with a jawbone and drag it into a cave by its hair. Not that men ever seem to do very well around Lara Croft, they usually end up either dead or carrying her shopping, but if she did choose to settle down, I've got a perfect candidate for her husband, Jason Voorhees. They've got so much in common, they've both had an embarrassing number of adventures that all follow an extremely specific formula, they both have an irresistible compulsion to murder God's creatures, they've both spent a lot of time underground, and most importantly, neither of them will ever just fucking die! Tomb Raider Underworld's story goes as follows. Lara's looking for her mum, who is dead, only she isn't really, she's just stuck in the afterlife, so maybe she is dead, I don't know. And there's this evil lady who blows up Lara's house because, uh, I guess she really doesn't want Lara to find her mum. The story follows on from Tomb Raider Legend, which I haven't played, so I spent the whole game trying to figure out what was going on and who I was supposed to care about. The answer to that last question I eventually discovered, absolutely bloody no one, especially not myself. In fact, towards the end I was considering slitting my own throat with the game box just because pressing the off button would have taken slightly longer. The more games that pass, the more clear it becomes to me that Lara Croft is a completely unlikable character. Part of it is her face. They've made an effort to keep her general appearance consistent with the days when she was depicted in 90s rendering, by today's standards the computer graphics equivalent of fuzzy felt, and now alongside more realistic characters, her face looks like a dinner plate with some paper cutouts arranged on it. But the main reason why it's hard to sympathise with her is because she's, well, evil. Most of her villains are really just trying to steal the treasures before she can, and many of them are clearly significantly less wealthy than her. In Tomb Raider Anniversary there were several amusing moments when she was forced to kill human boss characters, and after every single one she'd always look at her hands in an insane, grief-stricken, what kind of monster have I become kind of way, but really she's fooling no one, she's off her fucking rocker. This isn't even mentioning her whole animal problem. At the beginning of Trunderworld, Lara has a boss fight with a giant kraken, but the term boss fight may be a little generous. The bloody thing doesn't move. He's just chilling out in his front room. You can swim right up to his face and shake your ass, and he won't even and try to eat you, he just wants you to fucking leave before all the other oceanic horrors arrive for his housewarming party. So of course Lara drops a fucking spiky chandelier on his head and lets him die in agony. This is not appropriate conflict resolution. Normally I'd spend some time explaining the gameplay, but why should I have to do that at this point? There have been nine of these fucking games, you already fucking know how it plays. Innovation is to this series what cheeseburgers are to a lactose intolerant Hindu. You fling yourself around ancient cities where a whole bunch of sophisticated ancient mechanisms still perfectly function even while most of the ceilings have collapsed, and you die a lot because your camera is being operated by an eight year old autistic child hooked up to an IV full of sherbet, and Lara is extremely snobby about what ledge-like objects she will and won't dangle from. Controls are still a bitch. I would have thought that pressing forward and jump while under a ledge would communicate that I want to jump onto the ledge, but apparently I'm not speaking the right language because this game assumes I want to breathlessly hump the wall like an extremely flat stripper's pole. Oh, Trunderworld isn't completely without innovation. There's a rather heavy emphasis on deep sea swimming this time around that comes with an intriguing new wetsuit costume cut so finely around Lara's buttocks you can practically see the fabric disappear up her rectum every time she bends over. There's also a new texture effect wherein Lara gets dirty as she runs around, and if you look at the box art and can tear your gaze away from Lara's proudly displayed bristles, you'll notice that the dirtiness thing is prominently featured, and you know a series is stagnating when that's the best they can come up with as a selling point besides the aforesaid torso fritters, and the dirtiness thing combined with the wetsuit thing keeps giving me the troubling feeling that Lara's bum needs wiping. But don't let the top of the range buttock physics distract you from what Tomb Raider Underworld is. It's the same thing every Tomb Raider sequel has been, another lazy stamping out of the same levels with different wallpaper and minor graphical and gameplay upgrades. Tomb Raider Underworld is a particularly Bone Idol example, the playtime is shorter than a documentary on French war heroes, all the puzzles are artificially lengthened by having you do them all twice to open both sides of a door, and the same enemies are recycled from locale to locale. You fight jungle tarantulas in a jungle, then fight the exact same tarantulas in the English countryside, they all having presumably come over on a package tour. It'd be nice if people could prove me wrong for once, and not buy a game just because there's a set of big wobbly udders on the front, but then I have no faith in the human race, at least not while Michael Atkinson is still alive. Far Cry, or Far Cry 1 as it must now be known, chronicled the adventures of Jack Carver, a man who's loud shirt so offended the gods of fate that he was forced to run around a tropical island full of mutant super soldiers while wearing a giant neon sign on his head that made him visible from inside a toilet five miles away. And now four years on, Jack Carver returns to Far Cry 2, if by returns you mean has nothing to do with. Dude's nowhere to be seen for once in his life. We've also traded up the tropical island for something slightly more equatorial. Is there at least an army of mutants? Yes, but only if you classify a hilarious South African accent as a mutation China. Sort of makes you wonder why they called it Far Cry 2, rather than something more appropriate like how to run over zebras. The only things the two games have in common is that they're both FPSs and they're both big on huge exotic locations with lots of vegetation that doesn't conceal you for shit. You're one of several lumpy-faced mercenaries sent into a fictional war-torn African nation to find the local arms dealer and kill him, presumably because he's making the CIA feel redundant satire. Sadly, the instant you begin the mission you contract the local sniffles and have to be nursed back to health by the very person you're supposed to kill. Now, as assassination missions go, that's pretty fucking pathetic. Your character probably lost a hell of a lot of lunch money at mercenary school. Anyway, your target disappears and your former employers aren't answering the phone, so there's nothing left to do but piss the time with some odd jobs and tyke out your frustrations on the zebras. Meanwhile, the country 
is about as stable as a skateboard in a canoe. Two utterly interchangeable factions are openly battling it out over the best way to make life better for the people, both wearing absolutely massive irony blinkers as they drive around the countryside shooting at anything U-shaped. Yes, it's very difficult to make friends in fiction easier. Your character must be wearing some kind of Michael Atkinson mask because everyone hates you on sight. In fact, most of them will just drop everything to run you off the road in armed jeeps at the merest sight of you, even if you're in the middle of a mission for them. The official reason for this is that they're secret missions. The more obvious reason is that programming friendly AI is hard. First impressions of Far Cry 2 are good. It's got the standard current generation graphics problem where everything looks like it's been dusted with cocoa powder, but in this case it fits. They're going for a realistic depiction of the grim, chaotic oppression these countries exist in, and for the most part pulls it off. Main characters, mutant healing factor and magical teleporting gun shop TARDISes notwithstanding, but shut up, it works. The dialogue's well written, and true to CryEngine tradition, the scenery deliriously humps your eyeballs and ejaculates spurts of wonder across your slack-jawed brain, and by that I mean it looks nice. It all goes together to create a marvellous sense of my beloved immersion that it's a pinch of nutmeg to the bog stinted rice pudding of shooty Gameplay. But after playing for a while, it became apparent that all of the above is nothing more than a colourful sandwich wrapper. It's only when you unwrap the sandwich and bite into it that you discover that it contains nothing but margarine and vitamin pills. As you stumble around the sandbox world, you are free to take missions from the factions, the gun shops, and some weirdo on a phone who sounds like Zordon from Power Rangers, and every mission from a particular source is identical. Both factions will make you blow up something belonging to the other one, Zordon has you assassinate random individuals, and the gun shop will have you ambush convoys, all of which drive reliably around in circles until you lay a mine and put it out of its misery. So presumably they're all being driven by my mum. The problem I have is that after a while I had absolutely no idea of what I was ultimately trying to do. The initial goal of killing the Ames dealer guy had apparently been abandoned because the dude kept selfishly doing me fivers and being friendly. Eventually, after completing a mighty fuckload of fiction missions, I was given a story mission to assassinate the local leader of Group I, let's call them the Mods, and after a sequence of spectacular cock-ups I then also had to kill the leader of Group B, let's call them the Rockers. I kind of assumed this meant things were wrapping up, but then I was made to drive to another very similar sandbox map full of even more faction bases, gun shops and direct lines to Zordon. I continued to do the same identical missions for a while, but there was no sense of achieving anything. I certainly wasn't helping stabilise the region. Once the mods ran out of quests, I ran straight over to the Rockers to do theirs. In terms of calming influences, I was somewhere between Henry Kissinger and a tank of gasoline. You see, for sandbox gameplay to work, you need a deeply varied world that calls for exploration, a la Saints Row 2, and or some kind of clear ultimate goal hovering overhead, a la Assassin's Creed. Far Cry 2 has neither. Its approaches to plonkers without instruction in the middle of nowhere and knock off for lunch. It brings to mind an animal rights activist freeing a captive bunny rabbit into the wild, only for it to bewilderedly sit on a daisy for several hours before a predator comes along and bites its entire body off. There are enough open world sandbox games out to choke a bisking shirk, and letting the player create their own experience is pretty much the new bullet time, but it's always done at the expense of proper pacing. Maybe sometimes I don't want to create my own experience, maybe I want to have an experience that's been carefully crafted by professional designers and artists, but in recent years a prevailing delusion has arisen that absolutely anyone can contribute something valid, regardless of qualifications. In TV news, for example, you'll often see them pause to hear the opinion of a 75-year-old housebound racist from Leamington, and now you get games like Spore, Little Big Planet that rely heavily on user my content, which I prophesize doom for because most people are not game designers and you're just going to end up with oceans of slurry, as indeed we have. It's like giving someone a stick of Piper and a biro and claiming that that's as good as the lightest Dan Brown bestseller. Actually, that's a bad example because you could throw up on a typewriter and say the exact same thing. I've been sitting here sticking skittles at my nose for half an hour and I still can't decide if I like Gears of War 2 or not. It's an over the shoulder shooter lovingly rendered in every colour of the dirt spectrum, featuring the adventures of a bunch of insecure faux macho twats with necks like upturned mixing bowls, saving the the free world with two handfuls of hot, completely heterosexual lead while wearing half a car and verbally swinging their alpha male cocks around in voices like broken JCB engines. You know, the kind of thing that makes me so bored that skittles shoot out of my nose, but as much as I try, I can't convince myself that it's a bad game. The gunplay works pretty well and it's broken up often enough with nicely varied set pieces that it doesn't get tedious, but more importantly you get to kill armoured dinosaurs with orbital lasers. Plus there aren't any quick time events. Oh wait, actually there is one. A little one. I guess that means I have to hate it then. Yeah, let's go with that. Fuck you, Cliffy B. You play the blatantly misspelled Marcus Phoenix, fresh from the nice firm handshake he received for successfully blowing up half the planet at the end of Gears of War 1 and is continuing the campaign against the Locusts, a proud race of extremely thick aliens who remain convinced of humanity's inferiority even after you've killed everyone they've ever met. He's aided by his best friend and nothing else, Dominic, who has a missing wife, something which by god he is quick to remind everyone. Odds are she's dead because happy endings are for girls and this is a game for big manly men with pecs like paving slabs. Anyone who shows any emotion besides grim determination or detached gallows humour is going to either die or get his balls kicked so hard that they blast out of his ears. Other ways to tempt fate in this universe include wearing a helmet, not having a sense of humour, and basically being anyone but the kind of person who'd replace their genitals with a minigun if they thought they could get away with it and found something else they could piss out of. Another thing that characterises the Gears of War universe is chest-high walls. The two opposing armies have both realised that chest-high walls are the key to victory. Every single battleground is littered with chest-high walls, everyone's bombs seem specifically designed to reduce buildings to chest-high walls, the Locusts have developed technology to make chest-high walls rise out of the ground, and if all else fails, Mother Nature herself will step in and make rocks fall from the ceiling, forming chest-high walls. The reason for all this is that the 
gunplay in the game is based heavily around taking cover, although at times the necessity of it is a little questionable. Of course taking cover is very smart in real world firefights, but your characters can regenerate health by channeling the sheer manly power of their unfeasibly huge shoulders and their giant masculine chins have the properties of Kevlar. So often it's quicker to just trudge right up to the enemies, soaking up all the damage and carve them up with your absurdly overcompensatory chainsaw gun. Even if you lose your health you'll still be alright if you can drag your chin over to your friend who can restore all of your health by lovingly tussling your hair, but that's not something you want to rely on in single player because your NPC allies traded in their brains for some baseball cards and shiny objects. Yes, the AI's a bit dodgy all around, not the funny kind of dodgy where they run around in circles or poo their pants, the frustrating kind of dodgy where they fail to notice that your lungs are poking out of your ears so you have to crawl over to where they're hiding and then they run away because a sparrow farted next to their head so you die and you have to start the encounter all over again, or where they stand perfectly still telling you to get on a bloody crane when you're already on the bloody crane waiting for them and then you have to reload your last save and hope that you can get past the bloody crane bit before his brain falls out. I said the game is nicely varied and it is, the ongoing chest high wall sightseeing tour takes you through many interesting locales and is broken up by entertaining little asides and the occasional giant vehicle rampage, but at the same time all the different levels give a glaring sense of inconsistency. A nicely creative squishy level taking place inside a giant worm, rather Freudian in many ways, FNAF FNAF, is immediately followed by a weak pseudo horror chapter in an abandoned laboratory complex, reminiscent of many shocks of the system and bio variety. It's got this whole thing going on about classified military research and super mutants, but it doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the plot and doesn't go anywhere. It's not even made clear why you have to go there in the first place, something about a computer with the location of the Locust HQ on it. If some lone scientist was able to figure this out and stick it on his live journal, surely an entire military organisation can gather enough intelligence to take a rough stab at it. The story is a little hard to follow, it all reeks of design by committee, in fact designed by several committees, all given one mission to do and all locked in different cupboards. Gears of War is second only to Halo in terms of big selling Xbox franchises and as such you can't get much more mainstream without having Simon Cowell sitting on the end complaining about your chainsaw technique. And if something mainstream wants to stay mainstream, that is to say making more money than a triple cunted hooker on the day the troops come home, then it has to stay as safe and homogenous as possible so as not to scare off those emotionally fragile retards who make up 75% of the world's consumer base. So we have noble space marine goodies versus monstrous alien baddies and not a single challenging thought or deed from title screen to end boss and the tone flits randomly from comic relief farting about to whiny drama, typically whenever anyone brings up Dom's cunt wife. But while Gears of War 2 represents everything that's wrong with mainstream gaming, it does so many things right you can't help but respect it. It's worth remembering that sometimes popular things are popular for a reason, because they're good, or because Will Smith is in it. The current gaming renaissance has been a bad time to be a mascot, all told, since the average age of gamers is now far beyond old enough to know better. The need for a gurning cartoon face to convince your mum of a console's wholesomeness has fallen in indirect proportion to the average number of lovingly rendered skull and brain fragments bursting from the backs of people's heads in a typical Christmas release. The hyperactive little shits of the 80s have become the insecure neurotics of today, who need a steady drip of realistic violence to continually postpone the inevitable office shooting rampage. Sonic the Hedgehog now lives in a septic tank in a condemned hospital, and Mario is probably not far from moving in with him since his creators are making much more money selling bathroom scales and MIDI synthesizers to undersexed housebound women. This is a cynical time, and we don't want our big corporations to have friendly and approachable faces. As we weather the economic crisis amongst stockpiles of canned dog food in a refrigerator box, the image of a cabal of black-suited fiends with red glowing eyes sitting around a spotlit conference table in a penthouse office wallpapered with banknotes give us a nice comforting blame figure. Well, maybe for you. I'm part of the notoriously recession-proof entertainment industry, so I've been blowing all my money on guitars and beautiful Filipino boys. But anyway, the PS3 I've always felt looks like something I'd expect to see bursting out of a Middle Eastern mountain range to herald the coming of the Starborn ones, but Sony, it seems, have vowed to bring console gaming back to the family through the power of their big, unfeeling black monster, and hence Little Big Planet. It's astonishing just how much effort has gone into making the game friendly. You get the impression Little Big Planet is waiting for you to invite it to your birthday party. A lot of that is the voiceover by Stephen Fry that feels like a velvet finger soaked in warm honey being gently worked around your ear hole. I said ear hole! And then of course there's the Sackboy character, who looks like the result of a sinister military experiment to concentrate cuteness to a weaponized level for use against angry girlfriends. Sackboy is a mascot for the current age, one with absolutely no identity or personality but that which the player ascribes to them. In most cases then this will mean that Sackboy is a mustachioed crossdresser in a stupid hat, and if you play with friends he also has an irresistible compulsion to punch people in the face at the end of levels. Gameplay is basically platforming so old school it wears a mortarboard and employs corporal punishment. You have to transfer yourself from A to B by way of a jump button and a physics engine. The one acknowledgement of that whole 3D thing the entire games industry has been built around for the last decade is the ability to switch intermittently between three 2D planes, usually at the point when you don't want to. Controls are a wee bit stodgy all over, like a treacle pudding that sits heavily in the stomach after a hearty meal. Jumping is also a rather difficult and inexact science, like coming up with analogies for these reviews when the air conditioning's bust. Playing co-op with some chums is fun, because when you totally fuck someone over, it's doubly funny to then turn to them in real life and make smug preening noises. Everyone gets a shared amount of life, you see, and once it's gone you have to start the whole level again, a gameplay device in place presumably to ruin friendships. But the level design is really, really good. Like... something good. 
that's made of chocolate. They're full of really creative mechanical devices and it's all got this wonderful charm about it that disarms you, then trips you up and plants your face into a muddy riverbed made of chocolate. If I seem to be having trouble with this review, it's because Little Big Planet is so bloody insubstantial. There's really nothing else to say about it. Once you get through the levels, really nice levels, mind, all you're left with is the ability to dress up like a twat and stick googly eyes all over your mission hub. I guess that means this review is a bit shorter than normal, so here's something else to fill the time. <laughs> Oh fuck, sorry I forgot, user made content. There's a very in-depth level designer built in with a host of tutorials you'll be tempted to go through just to have Stephen Fry's voice tonguing your cock, Leah, for hours on end. And at the end of it, perhaps you could make some levels to put online for all to see, an act that will typically hold all the significance of gobbing into a river. I feel there's a fundamental difference of philosophy between me and the developers of Little Big Planet. They believe that every single person is an extra special godchild with a bud of creativity aching to burst out into a single perfect flower, and I believe that every single person is a tosser, and any flowers that pop up are going to be buried under garbage, fiery penises, and countless reproductions of levels from Super Mario Brothers, all of which the moderators hastily delete along with anything that looks at them funny. If a game that stands up by itself wants to release level design and modding tools, then Brillo Bananas. Good modding communities are the sprinkling of cinnamon on a delicious trifle, and hence relying on user-made content is like eating heaped spoonfuls of cinnamon neat from the jar. I don't want to have to wade through waist-high rendering plant runoff to find the good levels, especially when I can do that just by playing the story mode, you know, the levels designed by professional fucking level designers. If I buy a house, I want an architect to design it. If I design it myself, it may have a more personal touch but it's going to fall over very fast and even if it doesn't the giant fiberglass breasts on the front will be very tacky and the neighbours will complain when the gingerbread garage starts to smell. Here's my final word. It would be very ignorant of me to say that courting user made content is lazy. It's probably a lot of work to make the design tools user friendly and create an online sharing system for it all but it's an awful lot of effort when all you're ultimately doing is creating a great big blank wall for people to scrawl giant cartoon cocks on. Once again it's time to retrospectively review an old game I've actually liked, breaking up the emotionally draining output of cold emotionless hatred and giving further fuel for the construction of my psychological profile some years from now after the murders begin. Today we're going back to the primitive days of 1998, back when the World Trade Center was still defiantly sticking two fragile fingers up at the looming threat of global insurgency, Bill Clinton was wholeheartedly regretting Monica Lewinsky's choice of dry cleaner, and of course PC gaming still mattered. As it does to this day. <laughs> A company called Looking Glass Studios, tired of making flight simulators that nobody bought, and released Thief the Dark Project. What with PC gaming still mattering, and the brown glory of Quake having been pooed out two years previously, the FPS was riding high. But it was fast becoming clear that many developers had reached the limit of what can be achieved with putting the player on one side of a big black death cock and a succession of eager spread eagled monsters on the other. It would be some time before Halo would come along and revolutionise the genre with limited weapon capacity regenerating health and being generally shit, so it was left to Thief to have strange and deviant thoughts like what if there was a first person game where you were trying to achieve something something other than genocide, where even one or two measly deaths would have the game slap your hands away from the controls and yell what the fuck and thus was born the stealth em up The philosophy of the Thief games was that barging into the enemy stronghold and repainting the lobby in spinal fluid was all very well, but a really skilled infiltrator should never have to kill. And ideally, the enemy shouldn't even know they've been there, except that all the lights have stopped working and the whole place seems a lot less wealthy somehow. The games had three great strengths that placed them above all subsequent attempts at stealth gameplay, being constantly aware of exactly how visible you were, sprawling non-linear maps that rewarded diligent exploration, and the fact that you could actually defend yourself if necessary. Unaware guards could be taken out with a cosh, but even if you buggered up the stealthing so hard your dick came out its knows, there was rarely an instant game over for it. Worst case scenario was you'd wind up having to fight off a train of 16 sword wielding thugs yelling made up swear words, but if you were skilled enough to get through that it would always still be quite possible to steal all the Lord's ermine robes and stick his toothbrush up your bum before you leave. People have said to me, Yahtzee you ordinary person, how can a stealth game possibly be fun when the gameplay discourages actively dealing with the hazards in favour of hiding under tables waiting for them to go away? Bleh I say, bleh. Well this may reflect poorly on me as a person, but I've had a lot of the fun to be voyeuristic in nature. Don't tell me you've never had fantasies of invisibility, usually while simultaneously contemplating the nearest convenient changing room of the opposite sex. Not that a reasonable person could profitably ogle the guards and civilians and thief, this was still early days of full 3 days, so they all looked and moved like badly made origami polio victims, but there was nothing more impishly entertaining than hiding in a shadow, listening to a pair of thicko guards discuss nose picking strategies, then when they heard your stifled giggling there was nothing more tense than standing stock still with breath caught as the aforesaid thickos peered searchingly into the shadows so close you could practically see their polygonal nostril hairs quivering, as you pray to a god you've never believed in that they'll turn around and facilitate a nice swift bop across the bonds. Stealing riches in gameplay was 
was fun, but it was the richness of the writing that kept me coming back. Masterfully executed Link. The developers understood that it takes a certain kind of person to enjoy this sort of thing and tailored the main character accordingly. Garrett, a misanthropic antisocial loner, making snarky comments to liven up the dark, silent corners he hung around in. An appropriately unheroic character for the situation, the NPCs he pitted his wits against were generally bored, inattentive rent-a-cops, loudly voicing their every slightest daydream, quick to dismiss suspicious noises and sights as the work of imagination or extremely large and resourceful rats. This may explain why Garrett has such contempt for them that he goes around wearing tap shoes that make loud noises when stepping on anything harder than a bathroom rug. All these beautifully voiced and characterised toss pots live in a big pseudo-medieval fantasy city where natural magic and steampunk technology are constantly at war, a war that Garrett somehow keeps getting pulled into despite being constantly determined to not give a shit. It seems even the developers themselves didn't quite believe that people would like stealth gameplay, so the first Thief game forced itself to include a lot of zombie and monster killing, neither of which responded encouragingly to bops across the bonds. But Looking Glass proved themselves to be diametrically opposed to, say, Sonic Team and actually listened to the fans. The 2000 sequel, creatively named Thief 2, was the peak of the series, where the sneaking was the sneaksiest and the sprawly levels were the sprawliest. The third game, Thief Deadly Shadows in 2004, was sadly over the peak and speeding downhill fast. In its haste to suckle at the teeth of current generation graphics, it dropped the sprawling non-linear levels down a flight of stairs and suffered for it. But by then, Looking Glass Studios had already closed its doors, another drowned surfer in the treacherous, ever-changing tide of the games industry, sadly caught in the great big IDOS whirlpool formed by, amongst other things, the sinking of the SS John Romero. A fate undeserved, you might say, but since the popularity of Thief led to the misguided trend for forced stealth sections in action games, I think we can call this one karmatically even. Skateboarding is a good example of something that could only exist in a truly decadent society. Take any other period of history, a guy puts wheels on a plank, grinds down the steps of the Parthenon and breaks both his kneecaps on a pike staff, they'd have him slung in bedlam to be gawped at by gin adult chimney sweeps for the rest of his life. We're now living in a time when overpopulation and free healthcare has abolished natural selection, so now bored pointless white boys with some kind of deep-seated grudge against their own bones can somehow live long enough to breed, and there's an entire trendy subculture devoted to the world's second least practical mode of transportation, just below the unicycle and just above the tea tray. And like Christianity, white supremacy and child molestation, skating is also a subculture with its own video games. Some are a little more immersed in it than others, and Skate 2 is an example of one that's so deeply entrenched that it had to take a canary in spelunking equipment. Half the words are an impenetrable skater dialect, even the challenge briefings, so often the challenge would begin and I'd be left on top of a giant ramp pouting uncertainly like a child in an nativity play who hasn't learned his lines. The game also presents countless individuals who are evidently real-life skating celebrities we seem to be expected to already know, as being able to buy and wear their clothing is considered a reward, and the majority of the voice dialogue has the self-conscious awkwardness of a non-actor who's taken a few too many curbs to the face. So if you're not a skater, but are merely interested in the lifestyle, possibly because you're putting together some kind of health insurance scam, be warned that Skate 2 tends to assume you're already on board, no pun intended, and isn't trying to be accessible or sell the whole pastime as glamorous or interesting, which is good, because if it was, it would be doing a pretty fucking shitty job. And now that we understand that, Skate 2 is fascinating from a purely anthropological standpoint. It's like a little glass bottom boat viewing of some kind of heavenly skater afterlife, a big sunny city with lots of agreeably smooth gradients and where shattered bones knit themselves back together instantly. More importantly though, every other facet of human wrongdoing, murder, theft, arson, etc, have all been abolished, so the man is entirely devoted to bringing down skaters, allowing them to feel like some kind of courageous, oppressed minority fighting for liberty, rather than a bunch of masochistic twats putting their t-shirts on over their jumpers and blindsiding old ladies. The main character is a faceless, voiceless, nameless jerk who was incarcerated in a prison whose entire inmate population consists of skaters and whose friends instantly assume they'll want to start skating again once he gets out, which you can't refuse because you can't fucking speak, lending credence to the theory that rather than being heaven for skaters, this is some kind of hell for people who call skaters masochistic twats. One of the major goals of game design is the old easy to learn, hard to master chestnut. Skate 2 pulls off the second half pretty well, but it's about as easy to learn as piloting a jump jet. The number of movement controls is absurd, X for the right leg, square for the left leg, left analogue stick to shift your weight, left and right triggers for your arms, circle to breathe, triangle to process oxygen, six axis to wave your willy around, etc. Flicking the right analogue stick will do an ollie, flicking it one degree further to the right will do a completely different kind of ollie. The biggest challenge is just trying to remember all the various button combinations required to perform the mandatory tricks, but the absurdly low camera positioning and your avatar's big fat ass selfishly hogging screen real estate make it hard to judge distance and timing, and combine that with the frankly irresponsible speed you have to maintain most of the time, and the two most common tricks you'll pull off will be breaking a hip and getting stuck in the world geometry. Actually, there's a whole minigame for seeing how badly damaged you can get in a single fall, and I managed to do pretty well at that, if nothing else. Most of the actual skating challenges have very specific trick objectives that took an average of 20 million attempts, gradually chipping away at them while they in turn chipped 
away at my patience, the nearby skaters endlessly droning the same four lines of dialogue, reaffirming my ineptitude and second-class citizen status in the Democratic Republic of falling on your ass. Then there are the challenges where you just have to get, say, a thousand points in a single move. After a hundred tries and fast running out of spinal columns to shatter, I finally kick flip onto a rail, grind all the way to the end, pop shove it, backward somersault, cure all the world's diseases, and I'm still 600 points short. I don't know, I can see how Skate 2 would be fun and satisfying for someone who knew what the hell they were doing, but the path to becoming that sort of someone is so arduous and frustrating, you're more likely to just yell fuck it and go back to rock band. Maybe today will be the day I finally complete Green Hills and High Tides on Expert. The point I'm trying to make is that Skate 2 is a game for skaters. The purity of the experience is right there in the title. Skate, because that's all it is. Also, too, because there was another one. If they want to make something for the peeps without dumbing it down into homogenous pap for the masses, then I can respect that. They don't need me kicking their clubhouse door open and demanding to be accommodated. Nobody forced me to play it, except, you know, professional obligations and shit. But be warned that Skate 2 is no ambassador, and people who don't know their pop shove -its from their Tony Hawks and who just want to have fun with their magical electric smiles machine are probably going to be scared off. Personally, I felt more sympathetic for the police than the skaters in this game, no matter how often they were depicted as power-tripping authoritarian tool bags, diabolically infringing upon our personal rights to fling ourselves at top speed down a busy pavement and knock somebody's mum into the path of a Fiat Bravo. You know, I'm not convinced that extremely high-risk military super soldier research projects are ultimately worth it, even if the project goes swimmingly if they don't go kill crazy because you expect the perfect warriors to sit around playing the biscuit game throughout lengthy peacetime, if you don't end up having to murder everyone you've ever met to hush up the inevitable staggering lapses of ethics on your part, if you somehow find a way to skate around all that and start up the Captain America production line, then you'll find that nuclear warheads are a hell of a lot more effective and you don't have to feed them cheeseburgers or distract them from contemplating the nature of humanity. I wish more game writers could come up with some other plot device besides botched super soldier research, like, I don't know, an attempt to genetically engineer the world's greatest lucha libre wrestler? But anyway, Fear 2. Remember those two expansion packs that followed Fear 1? Shut up, no you don't, they don't exist, and even if they did, Monolith didn't develop them so they don't count. This is the real story the original designers wanted to tell. One day, Armor Cam, a graduate from the Umbrella Corporation School of Business with limitless funding and extremely tentative occupational health and safety compliance, went about creating an army of telepathic clone soldiers, so essentially just as good as normal soldiers but slightly quieter and capable of bending spoons. A scary looking little girl called Alma is created to be their psychic commander, and Armor Cam keep her in a tank, knock her up against her will, steal her babies, then leave her to rot, these being sure fire ways to endear oneself to an incredibly powerful psychic in direct command of inexhaustible supplies of mindless gun-toting killing machines. Tits go inevitably up, bombs go inevitably off, and the little girl enacts supernatural revenge upon the world, and to think this could all have been avoided if they just bought her an ice cream now and then. And just to underline the tragic stupidity of it all, the psychic soldiers aren't even that great, being repeatedly defeated en masse by hyperactive mutes with cameras for heads, meaning player characters. And it's a shame that you can't speak, because when your teammates say, hey let's all split up and each go off alone for the fifth time, you could respond with something appropriate, like that's a fucking stupid idea. By the way, forgive me if you're one of those savvy types who already guessed this, but Fear 2 follows on from Fear 1. If you haven't played Fear 1, do it now, I'll wait. Finished? Congratulations, now you don't have to play Fear 2. Fear 2 is a sequel in the same sense that Friday the 13th Part 4 was a sequel to Friday the 13th Part 3. The settings are different and the characters are all played by new actors, but it's all going through the same motions. Death, horror, people getting their tits out. You're part of a small unit of peacekeepers who are unwittingly connected to all the armor cam tomfoolery. You shoot a bunch of guys, then you shoot a bunch of other guys, then you shoot some more guys in robot suits. A little girl makes the lights turn on and off. You ally with a redoubtable armor cam nerd against an armor cam administrator who is stupidly evil for no better reason than because someone has to be. And all the characters besides you get picked of like a bunch of bananas dangling over the monkey cage. Also, there's a bullet time mechanic because Monolith are hoping if they stick with it, it might come full circle and become innovative again. And you get so much of it, you might as well use it all the time, turning the game into the lobby scene from the Matrix repeated ad nauseum, i.e. more than once. So it's a shooter, again. Most of the time you crouch behind a box shooting at anything bullets are coming out of, or more often standing openly in front of a box because you pick up armour and health refills every nanosecond. You get the standard array of weapons, but will only ever use whatever the enemy of the time are using so as not to run out of ammo, despicable little scavenging vulture that you are. All in all, standard FPS stuff very much like Fear 1. Fear 2's only major difference is that there are sequences where you pilot one of the ED-209 robot suits. These are basically amusing little coffee breaks between real challenges where you stroll invincibly down the street reducing enemies to little red clouds. It's like trimming your houseplants with a scythe. Oh yes, and of course there's Fear's ongoing pretensions to being horror games. Amusingly, there are several occasions when a scary set piece will rely upon you looking in a certain direction at a certain time, which in many cases you won't be. So while a ghostly vision farts about off-screen, the soundtrack will give a sudden violin shriek while you stare at a menacing windowsill. Mostly though, the horror comes in to it when Alma pops up and tries to give you a big sloppy kiss and you swat her off with the B button. That's right, we've reduced the horror to quick time events, in fact the same quick time event repeated to frustration point, i.e. more than zero. I'm tempted to hazard that this wasn't intended as a sequel at all, but a console oriented remake with a graphical upgrade, so if you're a console scrub who missed out on Fear 1 because PC gaming is for elitists and your hairy dad, then let me officially welcome you to last week. To everyone else it's an uninspired instalment that serves only to add even more loose ends to an overarching plot that increasingly resembles a partially unravelled cardigan, but most of my ire I reserve 
deserve the game's ending. Now, I want you to imagine something with me. Imagine a world where sequels are banned. Would this not be a beautiful place? Sure, we'd miss out on genuinely good sequels like Thief 2 or Half-Life 2, but I think that's a small price to pay. Every story would have to be fresh, so the writers would have to work extra hard to make the characters relatable. With no sequels, there are no franchises, so there'd be less fandom, so all the nerds will go off and become doctors and scientists and rid the world of all known diseases, and best of all, endings would have to have some fucking closure! Under this regime, ending the game with ambiguous to-be-continued bullshit when you have no idea if you'll even make a sequel will be punishable with prison time. Cautions will be issued for recurring themes and metaphors, and remakes will carry the death penalty. Christ, it's a miserable time to be a game critic. The release schedule is nothing but old titles with incrementally larger numbers on the end. It's like reading the results table posted outside a special school. Street Fighter 4, Killzone 2, my new release options at present are limited to another thrilling opportunity to mash my controller to death, or Gears of War versus the British Space Nazis, so fuck it, I thought. I am the free-spirited, chaotic, neutral rebel of video game journalism. I'm going to review a game from last year that I actually want to talk about. It's a Spider-Man game, which admittedly there have been around 30 of, but I'm validated as long as there's no number on the end, although I may feel the need to cut myself and weep. Speaking of numbers on the end, I picked up Web of Shadows because 2004 Spider-Man 2 The Movie The Game exceeded all expectations by being slightly good. It had the usual movie tie-in problems, being shackled to the original plot mainly, and Tobey Maguire's voice acting sounded like he was reading aloud a school report on his own frontal lobotomy. But web swinging around the open world was amazingly fun, fast, flowing, f intuitive, and the combat was actually pretty shitty, but that didn't matter because the missions, well, the missions were crap as well. In fact, come to think of it, the web swinging was the only part I liked, but I liked it so much that I used to speed through the story as fast as possible just to open up the world and spend hours swinging around buildings, doing races, collecting exploration tokens, and purposefully ignoring the people's cries for help. So ever since then, I've tried to keep an eye on Spider-Man as a gaming franchise. The Marvel Universe oozes from every pore of Web of Shadows, like nerdy contrived toothpaste, and it would be hard to explain the plot to someone who doesn't know the first thing about what I would laughably call the history. There's this black alien goo that turns people evil, unless it's the one from the Spider-Man 3 movie, in which case it just turns them into Jarvis Cocker. Anyway, Spider-Man used to own it when he was going through his black metal phase, but when he started listening to Europop it hopped onto some other guy, only in this game it hops back onto Spider-Man, only now it duplicates itself and creates lots more symbiotes, and already we've raised more questions than we've answered. So at this point the game yells, fuck it, let's just have a great big nerd off. If people want explanations, that's what Wikipedia's for. Then Wolverine shows up, and I swear this is true, he quizzes you on Spider-Man comic book trivia. That's pretty embarrassing, but not as much as the fact that I got most of the questions right. Gameplay consists mainly of beating people up, beating bigger people up, following people until they can stop long enough to let you beat them up, protecting people by beating up the people who are trying to beat them up, and some quick time events. So the game builds itself around the combat, which is a shame because the combat is top heavy and insecure and it wobbles when you lean on it. Oh, it's very varied with a great deal of moves you can buy for both the red and black suits, but once you learn the web strike, it's like owning a giant Swiss army knife with 500 different little blades and one that folds out into a minigun. There's literally no reason to use anything else. I beat every single boss fight by continually web striking back and forth like an aggressive yo-yo in stripy dim jams. Eventually I ended up avoiding every optional combat mission, after all, when you come across 15 muggings on your way home through the New York war zone, it's hard to feel like you're making any kind of impact on crime, and stuck to my beloved web swinging high above the streets. It's fun as always, even if the frame rate chugs a bit when large sections of the city start bum-fucking the processor, but once you're up there there's nothing to do but dick around on people's roof gardens and make up pictures in the clouds. You see, what I liked about Spider-Man 2 was that it treated the web swinging aspect like an extreme sports game in the irresponsible public endangering mold of Skate 2 or Burnout Paradise, with a host of racing side missions and stunt challenges to make the most of a unique and entertaining movement system. In a web of shadows, it only exists to connect one fistfight to another because Spider-Man's too much of a pussy to steal cars. Incidentally, that reminds me, I know that Spider-Man's flaws and humanity are central to his character, Great Responsibility, Uncle Ben, Gwen, Stacy, Clone Saga, Derpy Derpy Do, but I'm sure there's a way to bring that across without making him a whiny little bitch. I don't know who they got to do the voice, but he badly needs to make his balls drop, with pliers if necessary. Whenever a moral choice came up, I tended to go for the evil one because it would make him speak in what he probably thinks is a throaty, dirty Harry voice, which was at least slightly bearable to listen to. The moral choice thing is a tie-in to the whole red and black suit dichotomy bollocks, but its only real purpose is to force us to play the game twice to see both the endings. Oh, and it changes what Marvel Comics characters we can call upon to assist us in combat, but as much as the writers would try to convince us otherwise, Spider-Man should not need a friendly hand to hold while kicking ass, and I never needed the help anyway. Which makes it curious that it's trumpeted on the back of the box, along with two other features relating to the combat, and that disappoints me. Web of Shadows makes the high-speed web-slinging stay in mopping the floors while the combat goes out to beat up faggots. And combat are never going to be unique again. Fists, chains, ropes with spikes on the end, guns, swords, guns that are also swords, these are all roads well travelled. If I want to hurt people, I'll play God of War, or prowl the homeless shelters with a knife and garrot wire, but if I want to swing around on webs very fast, I'll play Spider-Man. The lesson here, kids, is that we all have something about us that makes us special, unless we're 90% of the world's population, but the rest of us have to stand up and let our specialness shine through, then go back to serving coffee to shouty people who look like they smuggle tripe for a living. You know that bit in a zombie movie where the zombie horde are chasing the heroes and the one guy who hasn't been as well 
characterises everyone else lags behind and gets grabbed and the zombies pull him down and start chewing on his nipples. This I feel is analogous to Nintendo's current position, only instead of zombies it's kids and housewives and grandmothers and clammy green skinned casual gamers, and instead of eating him they give him atrocious amounts of money. Meanwhile Microsoft is the flighty heroine with big tits going Nintendo no! And Sony is Ving Rhames going forget him he's lost, then they hole up in a shopping mall and keep the hordes distracted by throwing down Guitar Hero peripherals. Tortured metaphors aside, I'm of the feeling that Nintendo has almost completely switched sides in the invisible war of standard versus casual gaming. As a console for hardcore gamers, the Wii is currently floating face down in the outlet stream of a water treatment facility, but as last Christmas's most sought after baby toy, it's a license to print money, forge diamonds, and deal heroin outside Glaswegian middle schools. And I can't really blame them. Better perhaps to be the king of the land of imbeciles than continue the arduous and futile process that is attempting to appease one's hardcore fan base. But if Nintendo is the king of retard land, then Sega is the scheming vizier behind the throne, who between House of the Dead Overkill and the upcoming Mad World seem to be making one big last ditch effort to keep the Wii afloat as a gaming platform before writing it off forever as a hyper advanced etcher sketch. House of the Dead Overkill is a rail shooter because really what else are the screen pointy controls good for in which several buildings or houses if you will have been taken over by large numbers of the non-living. Your task is to go in and kill them all or re-kill them or whatever in an overly extravagant manner so as you can see the title neatly encapsulates everything you need to know and so far I know it doesn't sound like it's revolutionising the formula but it's the presentation that makes it stand out. House of the Dead as a series has long been the butt of jokes for its atrocious stories, disastrous translation and calamitous voice acting but at the same time it's also got a history of canny self-parody. House of the Dead 2 was re-released as a surprisingly hilarious typing tutor in which the guns were replaced by magical keyboards that blew off zombie limbs and heads with deadly shuriken-like nouns and verbs, and which I heartily recommend to anyone who feels that zombie massacres need not be precluded from the development of secretarial skills. And House of the Dead Overkill is so self-aware that its eyes have swivelled 180 degrees in their sockets. It's presented as a 70s exploitation film in which a dorky white cop and a sassy black cop who uses the word motherfucker the same way most of us would use a comma are forced to team up with a tough talking but completely ineffectual motorcycle riding stripper wearing about two handkerchiefs worth of material against the looming threat of mad science. We see all the action through a film grain filter and every character is introduced with a bombastic grindhouse trailer style voiceover. If my description sounds a bit dry it's because there's nothing to be gained from taking the piss out of something that's already taking enough piss to drown even the most open-minded prostitute. While most of the good ideas are nicked from a certain Robert Rodriguez movie they seem to acknowledge that and the cutscenes are so hilariously overdone you'll want to keep on playing just to see what boundary they'll overstep next. But as great as the writing is a game must have gameplay otherwise it's just machinima that you have to press buttons to watch. And this area is Overkill's big red glowing weak points. Fittingly it's totally retro with the entirety of the controls being little more than press B to shoot and don't press B to not shoot, but for real shooter veterans Overkill will come across as insultingly easy. That might be because you're forced to play through the shorter easier mode before the full length harder mode is unlocked and after that what's the point? Appropriately enough it's like you're watching a trailer that gives away all the best scenes and plot twists. I suppose then the harder mode is just for the challenge but the fairly vast problem with this supposition is that there isn't one. It takes all of one level to be able to buy an automatic weapon and then with infinite ammo you're unstoppable. If you're playing with a friend then the subtitle becomes truly prophetic. The only real challenge is building up your accuracy combo because the camera has a nasty habit of suddenly whipping around like a dog in a squash court. So if it's just the story and soundtrack then what's stopping you from watching the cutscenes on YouTube and saving 60 bucks? To be honest I don't know. Perhaps the retro charm is enough to redeem the shallowness of the experience and it is a lot of fun to show to your friends if only once. But academically it's interesting to hold up as a counterpoint to another recent release Killzone 2. Now I'm not going to do a full review of that one because it would really only consist of the phrase Gears of World War 2, possibly underlined a few times. A game that purports to take place a billion years in the future but features American soldiers fighting Nazis using contemporary weaponry and I have a theory that the developers were actually making a World War 2 game until someone realised they didn't know any German voice actors but anyway. Both games embrace cliché but while Overkill does it for laughs, Killzone 2 does it straight faced and ironically becomes the bigger joke. Killzone 2 flits absentmindedly between laughable war is hell drama and obnoxious macho republicanism and doesn't have the slightest idea what it wants to be. Overkill knows exactly what it is and what it is is totally mouth breathingly paste eatingly chasing the girls around the playground with a piece of dog pooingly stupid and I wouldn't have it any other way. Readers of my online journal, I refuse to use the word blog because it sounds like something that lives on a riverbed and communicates through farts, will know that my continual disappointment in my preferred genres of entertainment have made me more open minded to things I wouldn't usually consider so I gave 50 cent blood on the sand a chance. Rap after all is no less worthy than regular poetry as a cultural medium, more so perhaps. If you want to bone someone I've never understood why you can't just come out with it rather than dance around the issue for 50 stanzas, at least hip hop tends to be direct with its subject matter. It's just unfortunate that the subject matter is almost always guns, whores, and whores getting shot with guns. Let's just make a nice little disclaimer to hang over the rest of the review. No, I'm not racist, you knee-jerk, lemon-scented pussy wipes. Believe me, anyone who pulls their pants down around their knees, blows all their money on jamming diamonds into their teeth while living in a slum, and treats women like dogs you can put your knob in, they're just as much a ridiculous poisonous fuckhead whether they're black or white. It's very depressing when you can't make honest cultural commentary without having to disavow the assumption that your feelings are motivated by an irrational hate trigger response to different levels of melanin. You know what? A society where anyone can make jokes about anyone else and everyone laughs is a truly tolerant society. Political correctness chart
charged censorship only serves to engender resentment and distance between social groups. Besides, gangster rappers don't need defending, they've got guns for that. Hip-hop hasn't been an exclusively black thing for a while now anyway, not since Whitey started co-opting it. 50 Cent himself was discovered by Eminem, which must have been pretty fucking embarrassing. His first game, 50 Cent Bulletproof, was about as well received as a flesh wound, so here comes blood on the sand to rub a nice handful of healing salt into it. You play 50 Cent, obviously, fresh from having performed a concert in the Middle East where the hecklers must be pretty fucking brutal because he wears full combat gear on stage. A shady concert promoter is persuaded to pay him with an ancient diamond encrusted skull, a priceless piece of boneyard bling that is almost immediately stolen by the local warlord. No one forms attachments to gaudy trinkets faster than 50 Cent, however, so he vows to end as many human lives as it takes to win back the priceless historical treasure he doesn't really have any claim to anyway. Hey, I think we found another potential husband for Lara Croft. Gameplay is blog standard linear third person action with scripted vehicle sections, this being a sort of default form for games these days that you can stamp any licensed branding onto and call it a day. But the way I see it, no one's expecting this game to light the world on fire. Everyone who plays this will be doing so for one of two reasons, either because you genuinely like the idea of watching 50 Cent jerk off through several hours of asinine action hero fantasies, or because you just want something mindless and shooty to kill another pointless nugget of time between cradle and grave. People in the latter category will find an unchallenging but at least functional experience. You shoot the guns and the peoples fall down, the prerequisite quick time event sequences are thankfully not mandatory, and there's a scavenger hunt element that adds an extra exploratory factor to gameplay which is more than a lot of mindless shooters do, but it quickly starts repeating itself. In lure of boss fights, for example, you shoot down the same helicopter about four times. I don't know what 50 cents got against helicopters, maybe a helicopter stole his high school sweetheart and this is his chance for revenge. Every single major villain when cornered hops into a hitherto unnoticed gunship and flies around taunting you, it's like they're being issued by the government. Sometimes I get the impression that the game is covertly taking the piss out of 50 cent, which I could understand because if the game itself is to be believed, his usual strategy when doing business with people is to kick the door down, pin them to walls and bark demands like a fucking five year old. All the other characters talk and act like they're in a rejected Indiana Jones plot, eloquently soliloquising their motivations while 50 cent swaggers about slurring thick urban dialects, sticking out like a sausage roll in a souffle. But if this were deliberate it would imply some level of sophistication on the part of the writer which I can't accept. If it were an Indiana Jones plot it'd be one dictated by a phantom menace era George Lucas to a secretary who doesn't speak English. If the baddies want the skull so bad why didn't they just take it from the concert promoter guy before he gave it away? Why is the main villain killed off halfway through and replaced with another one we don't know? Why does 50 Cent rough up and insult all his allies then act surprised when every single one of them betrays him? This is not so much writing as it is making a big mess with a pen. As functional as the gameplay is, after a while the nagging sense that we're willingly playing 50 Cent's own personal masturbation material will alienate non-fans, remove your presumptions and we find ourselves playing a game about an extremely rich man who wears two hats for no adequate reason, destabilising a developing nation in order to steal what little wealth it has for himself, presumably to spend on fur coats made of diamonds to wear on stage while singing about how great he is. Maybe this is the sort of thing you need to have baggy trousers on to understand, but is this really a life to aspire to? Writing a million songs about mistreating women so that one day you can live out the wealth fantasies of a shallow materialistic 13 year old? Taking a lot of pictures of yourself holding large wads of money really close to the camera with an angry look on your face like the cameraman just broke wind? Destined to one day fall victim to the overhanging glock of Damocles or live long enough to be chewed up and spat out by the exploitative music industry? Maybe if the world was a little less prejudiced and a little more accepting then people might see that we all have the potential to be so much more and then we could all work together to build a better world for everyone. Not that they'd know anything about work, the lazy nick. Resident Evil 1 was a snore-worthy corridor fest that controlled like reversing a golf cart around a hedge maze, strung together by an extremely silly plot with more holes than a triple-cunted hooker in 19th century Whitechapel. The sequels that followed brought only arbitrary gameplay additions that improved bugger all and more unresolved plot threads to stable onto an arching storyline that increasingly resembled a colony of octopi going through the wood chipper. But Resident Evil 4 was the first game in the series I liked, completely retooled gameplay and a story which, while reading like something written out in piss on a snowy pavement, seemed to be going about things with a deliberate sense of ironic retro camp, which is about as sophisticated as Capcom gets. Most importantly, it was only tangentially related to the established plot, keeping things accessible to new players and largely untainted by the stink of mangled octopus giblets. Now we have Resident Evil 5, a sequel that brings only arbitrary gameplay additions that improve bugger all and more unresolved plot threads to oh dear. Resident Evil 4 was a game with an abundance of ideas. At any given moment you could be fighting a lake monster in a tiny boat, riding a minecart, navigating lava pits, or lest we forget exchanging quips with squeaky voiced midget Napoleon in the verbal warfare equivalent of two retards playing happy slaps. So perhaps it could be understood if the idea trough was running low when it came time for Resident Evil 5's din dins. But the deja vu hits within minutes when the entire population of the village you're in turn out for a crisp sandwich and you're forced to desperately fight them off and survive for a few minutes before rescue, which is of course a less Spanish version of the memorable opening of Resident Evil 4 that I fondly recall instantly turning my scepticism inside out. Fair enough, it's extremely effective, but when a bloke with a chainsaw and a sack on his head showed up, I began to wonder if we weren't just going through the same script with different actors. Or rather, since RE5 is considerably shorter, going through the cliff notes. While the all-important frantic swarming combat is basically the same, there have been some gameplay alterations, it's just that all of them make me want to cough up blood. Let's go right to the big one, the one that made me spit out chunks of lung, your sidekick. You had one before, but Ashley was more of a hanger-on, and you know, I never thought 
thought I'd miss that wailing jug-eared chimp, but at least he had the decency to get captured or hide in a bin for half the game and for fuck's sake didn't try to be helpful. Your new sidekick feels she needs to be more than a nice ass bouncing around the room. Oh yes, now she feels she has to be equal to the men, isn't that cute? You have to look after her equipment too, so I let her have the machine guns because I wasn't going to touch the bloody things, and there were moments when she was carrying 500 bullets for them and was still using her fucking pistol all the time. She'd stand there, pathetically picking away at the indestructible carapace of the giant crab monster of the moment, and when she was finished wasting pistol ammo she'd run off to break some crates and nick some more before I could. It's like watching someone beat their fists against a wall then running off to hospital before coming back to do it some more. And they used my medical insurance. And it's my wall. For a while I let her carry the healing items because I needed the inventory space for grenades and pipe wrenches and dumbbells and other manly things, but she couldn't be trusted with that either. She'd waste entire health sprays on me if I so much as stood on a thumbtack. I appreciate the sentiment, but you're not my fucking mum, woman. One time I was low on health, but not too low, and was about to use a small herb to keep myself going when I saw my partner coming towards me, brandishing a valuable large herb, and when you're running away from your support character with more desperate terror than you'd feel for any of the actual monsters, something has definitely gone wrong somewhere. My advice is to get someone to play co-op with you any way you can. If you live alone, kidnap a hobo, or train your dog extremely well, anything. But you'll still run into my biggest complaint, which you may have already figured out, the fucking inventory system. RE4's attache case inventory was unique and intuitive. Sure, you had to pause the game every time you wanted to change weapons. Sure, you usually ended the game with massive piles of ammo and enough green herbs to knock out Cheech Marin, but at least an egg was the size of an egg. In Resident Evil 5, an egg takes up exactly the same space as an AK-47, and each character only has nine spaces. Ammo stacks, but healing items don't, so we have the curious scenario that nine green herbs create just as much burden as 108 explosive grenade launcher rounds. And if both inventories are full, the fun begins. Say my partner has an egg that I want to use, can't just hand it to me or even just pop it straight into my mouth like a flirty dinner date. I have to exchange it for something of mine, use the egg, then request my other item back, assuming she hasn't eaten it. It's like one of those fucking fox chicken worm puzzles. And here's the really fun part, if you want to wear armour, that takes up a space too. You're carrying your armour in a pocket of your armour, it's all such a fucking unintuitive nuisance and whoever came up with it should be sent to a special hell where he has to pack shopping for crotchety old women. Or perhaps just punched in the stomach. The game I loved is in here, but the creative spark has gone out and the stuff they added just pours sand onto the wick. In summary, Resident Evil's falling back into bad habits, most unpleasantly attempting to mangle a kind of resolution out of all the tangled stupidity that has come before. Recurring baddie Albert Wesker is the main villain, now apparently channeling JC Denton by way of David Bowie, and the hero is old hand Chris Redfield, whose tiny dorky head on absurdly muscled body looks like someone left a chia pet on top of a fridge. But let's close this review with a revisit of that lovely matter of racism that's been hanging around like a bad smell. RE5 actually does a lot to defer that accusation. Your partner is black, a bit, quite a few whiteys are scattered throughout the early hordes, and real effort has been put into a somewhat realistic and sympathetic depiction of modern Africa. And then, halfway through the game, we suddenly find ourselves in a succession of mud hut villages, fighting crowds of jabbering black people in loincloths and war paint, chucking spears. Oh dears. Talk about sidestepping a pothole only to fall off a bridge, but one really shouldn't worry about this sort of thing unless there's genuine hatred behind it. And I don't get that impression. Capcom aren't bad people, they're just idiots. Okay, I got this, no problem. <clears throat> what makes any game cooler and more likely to appeal to the youth? The letter X. Slap it on anywhere, as in this game, X Blades, or why you don't outsource anime to America. Shat out by developer sarcastic air quotes South Peak, makers of the phenomenally mediocre Two Worlds, but not content with merely making a shitty ripoff of Oblivion, they set their sights on making a shitty ripoff of God of War, and they succeeded. Let's do the rundown. Main characters of an inhuman pallor with one word names wearing a square foot of fabric and boasting chests like two melons nailed to a brick shithouse and an egg noodle respectively. Both carry two blades, which can be leveled up with various skills purchased by collecting souls from your downed enemies and being mindful that a female god of war has already been tried they stole her hair that acts like a bunch of snakes having fucking seizures and tack that on too. But unlike god of war, X-Blade sucks harder than Ayumi would have to do to get this job were she a real person, and she would the dumb slut. To say X-Blade is the first game to use its female main character as a selling point would be so laughably inaccurate it would make the world's most humorless man crap his pants with guffaws but never has it been more blatant or in your face. While most games focus on their girl's gigantic earth-shaking boobage, this game prefers to have out by the back door because it's all about the ass. Box art, promotional pictures, even the in-game camera does everything it can to draw the eye to the thong with strings so thin I'm not entirely sure she doesn't just have white pubes. Put all this together by a dev team from the clearly missed the point of fun school and you get a main character that's as dumb as a post and half as likable, a skill system stolen from God of War that might have worked if the programmers had actually been talking to the level designers, levels cram with so many cannon fodder enemies they feel more like battles of fucking attrition than tests of any relevant skill, controls that make you want to rent out a high-rise apartment just so the controller will fall further when you check it out the cunting windows and a soundtrack that that fuck um i can't take this anymore oh crap sorry about that
Um, yes, Halo Wars. The story so far. I'm embarking upon an occasional quest to play games belonging to genres I've never really gotten into, a campaign I thoroughly expect to wholeheartedly regret the next time a big JRPG comes out, mostly due to my excremental boredom with the procession of identical powered armor space marines that clog up mainstream action gaming like so much hypermasculine mildew. As part of this venture I've been playing Halo Wars, which may come across as a curious choice because it's a game about identical powered armor space marines. <laughs> the crucial difference though is that all the powered armor fuck nuggets are all down there waiting for me to tell them where to go to get killed while I get to sit here in a spaceship with my feet up eating all the packed lunches. Yes, it's real-time strategy, a genre which, as the whiny of my correspondents have repeatedly made me very much aware, I have completely neglected up to now. I've never gotten into them for a number of reasons. Firstly, I'm a man's man, a courageous man who's not afraid to be out in the field looking my enemies square in the eye through the scope of a high-powered sniper rifle from the next town over. I can understand the appeal of being in the position of an aloof sky god pursuing their agenda by flinging conscripts at tanks until the shredded limbs clog up the treads, but I suspect I'm just the wrong sort of person for strategy games. I lack the patience to micromanage every unit. I'm also good looking and successful and socially competent but still halo wars by every account also i'm not a virgin but still halo wars by every account is dumbed down enough to be accessible to the legions of twitching inadequate dog fuckers that are halo's fan base so if it truly is baby's first rts it would be a logical introduction to the genre my other hope was that since i spend most of my time staring down at all the characters as i would little tiny cockroaches at the bottom of a jug then they wouldn't try to make me give a shit about them with half-baked story elements no such luck i'm afraid the action in the campaign mode comes as the filling for a great big pre-rendered cinematic sandwich with too much thousand island. The plot is your standard Halo affair, humans rule, aliens suck, they're conquering ancient planets and plundering them for magic super weapons and we'd rather they didn't. There's the hyper-masculine hero who probably wouldn't even take his power armor off to attend a parent-teacher conference, and he has sexually tense arguments with the spunky love interest who in that curious tendency of female characters in the Halo universe looks like she just got back from the high school gymnastics club. Also the aliens kidnap her at one point, I didn't play far enough to see the resolution for that but presumably they pulled all her arms and legs off. At the most basic level, real-time strategy gameplay has most in common with RPGs, they both involve starting out piss poor and building up to the point that you can take on the next big challenge. Also, they're both most frequently played by losers. No, end sentence, begin anew! The crucial difference is that your status is reset at the start of every mission, and you have the option of splitting up your power to embark upon a strategic attack from various fronts. I say option because all I ever seem to do is build enough tanks to embarrass General Patton and steamroll from one side of the map to the other, hoping that the objective will be one of the things that dies along the way. Sometimes I'll try to be a bit cleverer with it and roll out with the short-range weapons in front and the ground wear in the back, but before long it all comes down to selecting all units and pointing out whichever enemy looks at me funny. There doesn't seem to be much reason to develop troops, vehicles don't move any slower, only take slightly longer to build, and well, they're fucking tanks! The only downside i found is that the Earth armies apparently emit three-point turns in parallel parking from the driving test, and when you're trying to manoeuvre a large group of vehicles through tight passes, it turns into herding a particularly dim flock of sheep during an earthquake, which can get really annoying when the enemy are defending and your big guns are all at the back eating grass and fucking each other. The business of selecting units is also a right arse, and that may sound like a small complaint, but small things lead to big problems, like a tiny piece of broken glass lodged in a urine tracked. Games that evolved in PC waters have trouble adapting to a non-mouse controlled environment and RTS is no exception. Lacking click and drag, all you can do is select one prick, select one prick and all his prick friends standing within a fixed diameter, select all the pricks on the current screen, or call a great big all-map prick hoedown. So if you just want to say select all your flying pricks for a strategic insertion then you're going to have a bit of prick trouble beyond the might of any soothing cream. The inability to click on the minimap and zoom straight to trouble spots is ineptly countered with the ability to press a button and zoom to your next group of units, although how exactly the game decides that one group is more next than another is left as an exercise for the viewer. I have a horrible feeling that this statement will read like an engraved invitation for all the RTS fans to burst out from under rocks and belt their favourite titles at me, but Halo Wars has not sold me on the genre. Maybe RTS controls are just inherently incompatible with consoles. I hear Stormrise uses an innovative new control method that could potentially fill the missing pieces, but frankly I stopped caring about ten missions into Halo Wars' campaign. You see, I was given a time limit to take down three enemy placements in order to rescue a bunch of trapped units. After several arduous battles, I'd ruined the enemy's shit, found the final group and sent them off to base via a path I'd completely cleared on the way there. But at a point when the base could almost certainly see them without a telescope, I ran out of time and the units disappeared. We lost contact, went a character. Bull. Fucking. Shit. All possible threats were dead. We didn't lose contact, I was looking at them. They were right fucking there. We were close enough to communicate by waggling our eyebrows at each other. What the fuck happens when the stupid arbitrary time limit runs out? Do their battle royale collars explode? They all lose honour and disembowel themselves? What? And just to put the cherry on it, you know who they were? Absolutely bloody no one. Generic faceless pricks of the sort I'd vat grown about 50 of that day alone. But we didn't make it in time so they were going to make me do the whole fucking mission again. As the exasperated Chinese zookeeper said to the last male panda in the world, fuck that! 
After the world-shattering television executive frightening success of GTA 4, it seemed you could bring out GTA brand easy bake ovens and still get your investment back, but still, a GTA exclusive to the DS, fevered frogspawn chewing madness. That'd be like releasing a dead space rail shooter on the Wii. In all seriousness, we're probably going to be seeing a lot of this sort of thing, with the monkey of the economic crisis still clinging to everyone's backs, cheekily eating all the bananas, it's more bankable for studios to make games for more widespread systems. They practically give away DSs with the Sunday paper, and I'm pretty sure there are more homes with Wiis than with central heating, so here we are. Perhaps this period in gaming will at last make the Wii actually worth two shits. I doubt it though, you can shovel diamonds into a turd and it'll still be a turd, just momentously more painful to produce. The DS meanwhile is not a turd, and good thing too with all those sharp corners, it's just that it kind of does its own thing. It does it well, but GTA is from a different world. Chinatown Wars is therefore the bastard offspring of two forbidden lovers from two warring families, tragically shot dead while trying to elope by a hired gun, played in this drama by myself. Too late, sadly, to prevent the child being born and coming out a little bit malformed. Chinatown Wars returns us to the Liberty City of GTA 4, albeit missing Alderney, but it took too long to open up Alderney, so no one cares. And today's career sociopath with astonishingly good lawyers is Huang, a spoiled rich triad kid with a dead dad, arriving in Liberty City to get embroiled in the family business. With a top-down presentation similar to the original 2D GTAs, Chinatown is a nostalgic callback to when the series was simpler, cartoonier, and not as good. Yes, GTA only became a truly terrifying money spinner once it went 3D, because top-down 2D is full of inherent problems. You can only see a about 20 feet in front of you, also known as Metal Gear Solid Henchman Syndrome, and there are a lot of things beyond that 20 feet border you need to worry about. Virtually every time I jacked a car, I'd get an instant wanted level because I couldn't see a cop directly behind me helping an old lady across the road. And then there are the toll gates back from GTA 4, just in case they didn't completely get on your tits the first time around, and then almost invariably at the end of long high speed straights, so I lost count of how many times I accidentally sped right through and earned myself another big fat wanted star. The limited visibility is also not helped by a camera that appears to be mounted on the head of a drunk obese man on a Segway, lurching sickeningly about when you're trying to make the god-awful targeting system lock onto an enemy and not, say, an unarmed man on the other side of a wall, on the Hebrides. You may be unsurprised to hear, then, that the game is frustratingly difficult, in which case prepare to be surprised, because it isn't. I breezed through all the missions on a rocket surfboard and rarely had to attempt any more than once. The simple reason for this is that all this professional game reviewing has finally paid off and I'm just naturally good at everything now, but the less vacuous reason is that the enemy AI is crap. Everyone with a gun seems afraid that using it will offend the neighbours. When the police are after you, there's a mechanic wherein you can shake them off by getting them to smash into things, and really all you have to do is drive along a street straight road very fast and they do all the work for you. It's like they've got brick wall magnets mounted to the bumpers. Alternatively just use a respray shop of course, they won't do the job if there are cops around, so the technique I discovered was to park around the corner, wait for every cop car in the area to huddle around the nearest lamppost, then cheekily floor it for the garage doors while they're busy disentangling their necks from their steering columns. One of the unique selling points is the drug dealing system, and really pick any commodity trading element from any game and replace the names with more sensor provoking ones and away we go. Find who sells cheap, buy it all up and flog it to whoever buys dear, 30 go to 10. And you're gonna have to do this whenever you can, because doing the actual missions pays slightly less than vending cardboard boxes to the homeless and you'll need all the money you can get for when the cops catch you on a dozy morning and take all your favourite weapons away. Fortunately, the drug trade has its own underground stock market that tickers hot investment tips directly to your PDA, so making thousands upon thousands in a single deal is incredibly easy. A more patient player than I could probably spend an hour or two trading around and end up with enough money to buy all the safe houses in the game and invite all the gangs to a great big pool party. It seems that the weird thing about Chinatown Wars so far is that all its faults are balanced by its other faults. Stupid enemies compensate for shitty controls, the easiness of trading compensates for its banality. All the foulness mixes together to create something halfway decent in the middle, it's almost prodigious in its retarded genius. The writing's not as stellar as GTA usually is, characters feel interchangeable and arbitrarily drop self-consciousness and references to sexual perversion into the dialogue for no better reason than trying too hard, but from what I've gathered I'm the only person who gives a shit. I think my biggest problem is the whole DS thing, it seems when you agree to develop for the DS or Wii, Nintendo make you sign a contract agreeing to throw in at least one irritating out of place touchscreen gimmick or Wiimote waggle. So being a good little whore, Chinatown Wars breaks things up frequently with an occasional bit of touchscreen flappery like hot wiring cars or throwing molotovs. Nothing wrong with that in itself, but since the movement controls use the buttons you have to either be constantly fumbling for the stylus or just use your thumb and leave Cheeto dust all over the screen. The DS works when you exclusively use either control system, but switching between them at a moment's notice isn't good for my poor arthritic controller ruined fingers. Just because you can have something doesn't mean you should. I can use a syringe to remove the filling of a Cadbury's cream egg and replace it with Branston pickle, but it wouldn't be a good idea. At least I don't think so. Hold that thought. Why will no one believe me when I say the Wii is a lump of owl pellets? I'm starting to feel like Charlton Heston at the end of Soylent Green, running around yelling, THE WII IS MADE OF POO! STOP MAKING GAMES FOR IT! While developers lie around in 360 degree cinemas watching videos of nature's splendour, increasingly obscure movie reference. It'd be wonderfully convenient to just abandon one console as a dedicated casual gaming kiddie platform and let the others concentrate on the blood and titties, but games of a traditionally hardcore bent continue to be produced for it. Does it really not strike anyone else as a bit of a cultural step backwards that the release of a violent game is considered a big deal just because it's on the Wii? Mature games stop 
being novel around the Maastricht Treaty. Not that the word mature can be applied to Mad World without severe qualification, the game involves a televised battle royale between a bunch of roided up rodeo clowns being infiltrated by the motorbike riding, cigar chomping, chainsaw wielding, tiny penis compensating hero Jack, whose task is to win over the television watching public by carving the entire contestant population into sauerkrauts. Mad World is mature in the sense that it's one of those curious cases of a game that approaches gore with the same childlike glee with which a schoolboy approaches trapped insects, then paradoxically forbids children to play it. It could also be considered mature in the sense that it's presented in an idiosyncratic, cell shaded black and white visual style, but one suspects that this came out of artistic statement second and compensating for weak graphics limitations first. As is presumably intended, the presentation reminds me very much of Japanese comic books, because I can never tell what the fuck's supposed to be going on in those either. There really needs to be a name for this subgenre, so I'm going to make one up. Spectacle Fighters. Games in which most of the standard baddies are about as effectual as a panda's love spuds, and the emphasis is less on them being challenges to get past and more on them being squirty punching bags to be dispatched in the most spectacular ways. Devil May Cry, Beautiful Joe, God Hand, and arguably Manhunt are the foamy mouthed horses that already populate this rowdy stable. Mad World consists of a succession of largely non linear urban playgrounds featuring a number of unfenced death traps that somehow went unnoticed by the civilian populace, and you only get to move on once you've scored enough points. The more punishment you bestow on a dude, the more points you get for his death. Fertile ground for all sorts of child warping violence, but they don't really make the most of it. The tutorial shows you how to plonk a tire on someone, jam a sign through their eye, and hang them up on a big spiky co track, and give or take a few other traps, that's pretty much all you'll ever do. Walking around carrying dazed dipshits looking for something fun to throw them at is a slow and flow breaking process. Seen one guy disappear into red particle clouds on a rotating blade arrangement, seen them all. And the novelty is quickly licked away to reveal the harsh, grindy centre. On top of that, the point system often seems to be completely arbitrary, or at least very little to do with the actual impressiveness of a kill. Your horrific blowing people up with explody barrels seems to award far more points than, say, holding them against the side of a speeding train until their back resembles a well tossed salad. Turns out we're really only in this for the boss fights, all of which are at least creative in theme, if not in gameplay, because I beat every single one of them by following the ancient eastern philosophy of dodge then chainsaw up the strap, but they're let down by the controls. Ooh, Yahtzee hates the controls in a Wii game, what a bold defiance of established trends, sarcastic applause. Fuck you, buddy, I'll stop ragging on the Wii motion sensor when a heavenly choir descends to earth to fix the fucking things. You see, Mad World's stable mates, Devil May Cry and God Hand in particular, called for a certain amount of finesse. A split second between button presses could mean the difference between glory and sucking on scythe blades. And there is no finesse to Wiimote flailing, not when you could scarf down a bowl of fistios by the time the console even registers the fucking movement. I'm also convinced that the targeting system is programmed to completely not work whenever the game feels like being a dick, which is all the time. On the other hand, the dialogue and voice acting is good, with the omnipresent fast-talking television commentators often being a joy to listen to, but to hop instantly back onto the first hand, they're set up to spout a line for every particular in-game event, and it seems someone forgot that some events, like say killing a guy with a stick, might occur more than once. I like the idea of in-game commentary, but the fuckers repeat themselves more often than an amnesiac in an ear hospital, and the levels seem to get shorter and less interesting as time goes on, up until a piss-poor final boss fight and dull ending. If you could imagine a big red balloon with the air slowly being let out with the descending before shriveling down to nothing with a final pathetic high-pitched squit. That's basically Mad World. Also, someone's written a load of swear words on the balloon with a dry erase marker. At the end of the day, Mad World is a six to eight hour game with enough ideas to fill a three hour game. It's rather cynically aware that a spot of the old ultra-violence is a rarity on the Wii and seems to be taking refuge in that. I'm not against violence, I'm against censorship because withholding cock hemorrhage 4 from your kids only makes them more interested. If you stopped making a big deal of it, they'd probably swiftly recognise it for the giggling vacuum that it is. Once you've seen enough samey splatter to get desensitised, Mad World fails to stand up by its Itself, but it is fun for a while, and the biggest problem I have is the fact that it's on the Wii. Come on, developers, I know all that sweet Nintendo money is attractive for buying food and shit, but surely you're not that attached to your kids. And if you are, there's always pedigree chum. You've got to feel sorry for the American entertainment industry. The country comes home from a few decent world wars with a new image for itself as the glorious conquering heroes, and ever since then their existence has been one long quest for another worthy opponent. They're like Red Sonia minus the whole sex obligation, as much as that would liven up global politics. They had a good thing going with the Russians for a while before East Berlin paid the price for shoddy building contractors, and in all their other wars, it's difficult to root for America when the villains of the story live in a ditch and are armed with jagged rocks. At some point in recent years, they looked up from their international heroism to realise they'd alienated the entire world, and contemporary war stories now all seem to deftly avoid clearly associating the villains with a foreign power. It's quite entertaining to watch, really, like how they used to put bears on hot plates to make them dance. Tom Clancy's Hawks by Tom Clancy is another of my ventures into the gaming wilderness because I've never really been into flight simulators. That said, Hawks is a flight simulation in the same sense that, say, Space Invaders is a simulation of tactical guerrilla warfare. You're a jet fighter pilot in a near future where America America's military is now staffed entirely by the people who do movie trailer voiceovers, and you're tasked to enter various theatres of war to stabilise the situation with a few nice big explosions. Now, I'm no expert on this, or indeed anything, except dick analogies, but I do know that modern military jets are very fucking fast things. By the time you see one, it's already over there, so combat in such a thing would usually amount to pressing a button and watching something half a mile behind you burst into flames, and that's not just idle fact, it's cold hard speculation. But real life makes not for entertainment, so for this game we're all just going to dogfight in jets like it's 1940 fucking 5, okay? Obviously the big flaw in my pledge to try new things is that I have very little to 
compare them to? The closest thing to a flight sim I've ever gotten into was Frontier Elite 2, and Hawks doesn't give you the option to autopilot everywhere to the tune of Hall of the Mountain King. But I'm honestly surprised by how much I enjoyed Hawks. After a fairly brief adjustment period in which I learned to complete a low-flying bombing run without getting my nose cone stuck in somebody's chimney, I found the flying controls to be fairly intuitive and was soon gaily tearing up the skies, enjoying the lovely scenery served hot from Google Maps. There's something like 20 different planes you can fly, but that's really just a bone for the enthusiasts. The only appreciable differences are the exact design of the expensive military arse you have to stare at all day, and possibly a slight promotion from ludicrously fast to there is a mosquito-shaped hole in my teeth. Combat technology really has gotten pretty foolproof in 2014, makes me wonder why they even bother with pilots. For the ground-based and slow-moving targets, the computer does all the targeting for you. All you have to do is press the fire button as soon as you're in range, turning a large percentage of combat into a sequence of glorified quick-time events, but the subtraction of fiddly gunning mechanics does allow one to concentrate on strategy. In theory, anyway, for all the box blurb boasts, the only orders you can give to your wingmen are defend and attack. I've seen light switches with more tactical flexibility. And the thing is, they let us grow reliant on auto-aim, and then on maybe two occasions in the whole game they'll pull a dick move extraordinaire and jam your targeting system, forcing you to use your manual turrets on high-speed enemies, which is like threading a needle with the leg of an angry spider. The dogfights with other fighter jets help the game come alive, because at close range relying on your targeting system turns you into a meth-addicted sloth trying to keep up with a high-speed tennis match, so you're taught how to disable the safeties and go into a whole different viewpoint. It takes a bit of getting used to, in fact on the training level the unmanned drones shot me down three times, which was a little emasculating, but once I got the hang of it all the dodging and pursuing was actually quite fun and effective, so overall I enjoyed Hawks. In fact, I might go as far to say that Hawks could well have sold me on air combat games, but that's not funny, so let's find more things to rip on. The story is a nice fat target. I wonder how much input Tom Clancy actually has on all the games that wear his name. If it's a lot, he must be working pretty fucking flat out. I doubt he'd have time to sleep or salute the American flag that required six times a day. I'm going to give away some spoilers here, so if you're that bothered, stick your head in a bucket till the generic metal starts up. Because the actual standing army of a foreign nation would have inconvenient things like patriotism and families and adorable pet doggies and shit, the bad guys of Hawks turn out to be private military contractors, the true bogeymen of our time. You start off working for them because the US Air Force laid your ass off, but then they decide to support a militant group working against America so you defect back to the Air Force since everyone in the American military are also selflessly heroic It makes me want to puke. The PMC point out that the US can't stop them doing private business dealings with whoever they want, and that's probably true. But then, they invade Washington, bomb the White House, and try to shoot down Air Force One. I'm pretty sure the US are within their rights to stop them doing that. Who the hell's running this company? Scaramanga? Why would a PMC invade the US? What were they going to do after killing the president? Declare themselves king? And where were they hiding all the soldiers and hardware you'd need to wage war on a global superpower? The fucking moon? I know that drama demands that the enemy actually be a plausible threat, but I still think it'd have been more credible if the villains had been an army of disgruntled insect people from the Earth's core. Wearing silly hats! Well, my copy of that new Riddick thing is still on order, so in the meantime, let's leave the exciting space year 2009 and cast our minds back to the primitive pre-industrial dystopia of 2008. Survival horror is what I might call my pet genre, a pet I keep in the tool shed and feed broken glass. And in my awards for last year, I accused everything that claimed survival horror status of being nothing but a parade of action games where some of the enemies jump very suddenly out of cupboards. But some viewers took issue with that. What about Siren Blood Curse, they cried. While you were blindly clinging to the hope that the new developers would recover Silent Hill from the dustbin with the baked beans and fish heads cleaned off, the PS3 was enjoying a true original survival horror game full of all that Japanese style horror you hold in such high esteem, Watashi wa Baka Guardian, etc, etc. So, alright, I guess I'm gonna have to put my hands up to that one. Yes, there was at least one survival horror game last year, it's just that it was rubbish. Siren Blood Curse was released episodically in 12 bite sized chunks, and while I see no reason this couldn't work as a development strategy, the version I got hold of was a store bought box compilation of the chapters, with box art they probably put together with a type tool and two minutes of Photoshop filters, but anyway, would it have taken so long to cut out the previews and recaps, the starts and ends of every episode, especially early on when the episodes are short? It's like I'm hearing this story from a bloke with a bad stammer. Said story is a somewhat familiar survival horror setup. Some unknowable evil has befallen a small community and has released a mysterious signal that attracts idiotic fuck skulls with no survival instinct and the strange and mystical ability to lose all their good weapons during loading screens. I played the first Siren game on PS2 and found it lacking. Well, let's not mince words. A game could fire white hot shurikens from the disk drive that lodged directly in the smell centre of my brain so that I perceived nothing but eggy farts for all eternity and I'd still rate it higher than Siren 1. But I did think the whole sidejacking feature was an interesting one. You use an interface not dissimilar to a TV tuner to look through the eyes of your enemies in what is probably the only example of second person perspective gameplay. It goes well with the whole horror thing when you quantum leap into an enemy's viewpoint and realise he's rubbing his tummy and coming towards a fridge that looks a lot like the one you just hid inside. Blood Curse still boasts the feature and now you can split screen several enemy viewpoints into the action, although doing so will buttfuck the frame rate to the level of PowerPoint presentation. PowerPoint buttfuck aside, sidejacking in itself is a good idea with a lot of potential, but Siren never seems to know what to do with it. It's a small child wielding a power tool, idly eviscerating mummy's pot plants and making you wonder if you should tell someone now or wait until something gets chopped off. In a
In a stealth-based game, such an ability could be invaluable for determining enemy locations without having to go out into the open like a big stupid lemon with a target painted on it, but while it does indicate the direction a sidejacked enemy lies in, there's no way of telling how far away they are, so the information is confusing. And if there are any weapons around, it's all rendered moot. You could either sidejack all over the place to put together a carefully timed exit strategy, or you could just pick up a rake and bludgeon everyone to death. Of course, on some occasions, weapons are withheld for this very reason, but the sidejacking is still rarely useful when the missions are all so small and linear they might as well be dragging you through on a fucking choke chain. That's the other major problem I have. When you play Siren, you do things its way. It has that adventure game problem of every challenge having one and only one solution. You will step in line, motherfucker, and if you don't like it, you can fuck off back to your sandbox. I almost gave up on the very first chapter when I was asked to escape from a zombie cop, only to find that every route was a quite literal dead end that would get me shot and killed. Turns out I was supposed to go down a forest path that was virtually undetectable between muddy graphics, foliage, confusing camera angles, and my own personal retardation, then hide under a shed until the cop went away, after which I could return to the main road and get shot and killed as part of a cutscene to continue the story. As the leper said to his mistress, where's the bloody points? I've got nothing against linearity, especially in a story-heavy game, but you'll spend a lot of this game hand in hand with the trial and error twins because the game will only let you continue if you follow the rails of its very tightly predetermined storyline, which could perhaps be forgiven if the story was well told, but the presentation is so disjointed and schizophrenic, the only thing I could be sure of towards the end was that I badly wanted all the characters to die. Strangely, all the main characters are American and are voiced by Americans, but since it's a Japanese game, the dialogue comes across as a little bit off, like it was written by someone who got all their experience of Americans from TV and observing the tourists chained up in his basement, but the one character around whom all the pain revolves, who would go on to feature prominently in my fantasies alongside a vice and a frying pan, was the fucking little girl. Defenseless innocents in horror games are fair enough as long as they stay out of the way or die horribly, but don't make us control them and for fuck's sake don't make us escort them, especially not when they game over your ass if a monster so much as brushes against her thigh, and especially, especially not when the plot demands she die anyway, spoiler warning. Her crowning moment is when she gets trapped under a log and you have to run around distracting the monster of the hour from her and pouring gasoline on it, then when you've done that enough, she suddenly fucking frees herself, just in time to watch you and the monster burn together. A few seconds earlier would have been expedient, dearie. Though in short, Siren is one mishandled good idea and I recommend it only to people who are undecided on the abortion issue. Okay, so Pitch Black was a good film if you're into that sort of thing. It had Claudia Black getting her crotch pulled off and that's always a plus, but the best part was the character of Riddick, because he was clearly vital for the survival of the other characters, but utterly unpredictable. You were never sure if he was motivated by a genuine spark of compassion inside his stony psychotic exterior, or if he was only saving the others so he could pull out their brain matter and use their empty skulls as muesli balls. Vin Diesel then completely grabs the wrong end of entirely the wrong stick and decides that everyone was there to see Vin Diesel run around saying badass one-liners in a voice like he had severe congestion. So he vowed to see how long he could single-handedly keep a franchise going based around that alone. Shortly afterwards, the Chronicles of Riddick film burst into cinemas, killed all the characters' interesting mystique, and quietly slunk away to die. But let's be kind enough to forget about that and talk about the games. Okay, so Escape from Butcher Bay was a good game if you're into that sort of thing. It had the ability to creep up behind a guard and dig out all his memories of childhood with a screwdriver, and that's always a plus. But it wasn't the kind of Criterion Collection timeless classic that demands a remake, a notion which someone was thankfully able to successfully crowbar into Vin Diesel's head and persuade him to re-release Butcher Bay with an additional campaign tacked on, Assault and Vinegar, the uh, Dark Athena. Let's not waste the universe's time pretending that there's much essential difference between the setups of Assault on Vinegar and Escape from Smoky Bacon. Riddick is placed somewhere he doesn't want to be, with an interior design owing something to the Doom 3 engine, and endeavours to not be in the place he doesn't want to be. On the way, he kills a lot of people, but they all mutter to themselves about how much they like stomping on fluffy yellow Easter chicks all day, so it's alright. That's one of the recurring themes of the ongoing Riddick adventures, actually. Writers desperately trying to come up with enemies who are even less likeable than the socially inept, baldy-headed dude we're supposed to root for. Anyway, let's leave that aside for now and take a look under the gameplay bonnet. It's first person, all the better for Vin Diesel to project, except for occasional inexplicable cuts to third person whenever Riddick climbs up things, all the better for Vin Diesel to admire his imaginary self's rippling athletic bod, best of both worlds. Speaking of which, the gameplay is mostly stealth focused. Hang on, they've given us a gun! I guess it's a shooter now then. Oh no, wait, the gun contrivedly fell behind a fridge and all my other guns spontaneously disintegrated. Now it's a melee brawler. Gameplay does tend to trundle back and forth between the three major stations of the FPS circle line, and to its credit, they all function surprisingly well. The guards are sufficiently thick and slow moving enough to make stealth viable, and if you get bored, there's always the option of snapping people's necks like fleshy breadsticks. Melee combat is nicely visceral, and punching someone has the accurate feeling and weight of actually punching someone, as opposed to, say, waving your knuckles around until they fall over, and shooting people with guns is just as wholesome and rewarding as it is in real life, although the locational damage is a bit mental when a headshot is an instant kill and blowing both their kneecaps off is about as effective as a foot massage. At times, though, the schizophrenic exchanging of gameplay makes me want to fold my arms, sit down, and refuse to continue until the game makes its bloody mind up. I'll be crawling along from shadow to shadow in stealthy mode when suddenly 50 guys burst in and I'll realise we switched to shooter mode while I wasn't looking, which makes me feel like a bit of a wally. The difficulty curves all over the place when you can be riding around a powered robot suit one moment and having girly hair pulling slap fights the next. Assault on Cool Ranch Doritos gets particularly unfocused about four hours in after Riddick goes through what is unmistakably a final boss fight and something that is equally unmistakably an ending, only for the game to keep going in a new location for another hour or two before going through another final boss fight with the exact same villain who was pretty sprightly for someone who'd ended up with a fucking spike through the neck the first time around. My theory is that Dark Athena consists of two mission packs that were inexpertly mashed together.
together after it became clear that the second one was too short and too shit. It's in this chapter that we're introduced to the Spider Turret, a small wall mounted enemy that is very hard to spot and which can knock off all your health in two hits from two continents away. An enemy which can only have been designed by some kind of sinister conspiracy of 16th century Puritans working to eliminate the very concept of fun. Butcher Bay was good, but remakes are bad. See how this works? If all we do is remake and re-release what was good, then we end up circling the same drain various Nintendo properties have been monopolising for the last 20 lucrative years. Disregard that aspect and concentrate on the expansion pack, or packs, because that's exactly what Dark Athena is, more of the same gameplay in new, darker, Athena-y locales. I guess it'll be your thing if you thought Butcher Bay needed to have 6 hours of extra length that gradually glide downhill in quality, or if you still give a shit about Riddick as a character, in which case, hello Vin Diesel, for you are the only one. Riddick in Pitch Black had some personality, a sense of humour, actual flaws, and ambiguous morals, you know, like what us tiresome human beings have. But now he's just an infallible cardboard cutout who does nothing but growl threats and pretentious bullshit one-liners that are supposed to make him sound like a warrior poet but more give the impression that he has fortune cookie papers glued to the inside of his goggles. I understand that it's fun to jerk off, Mr Diesel, but most of us don't try to make a franchise out of the sticky tissues, and since you asked, no I probably wouldn't say that to your face. Well we knew this was going to happen sooner or later, if I'm going to explore unfamiliar territory I couldn't hang around the flight sims and RTSs forever, I was going to have to traverse the dreadlands of JRPG, a howling wasteland of dodgy English dubs and outfits that were created by crashing a riding lawnmower through the wall of a theatrical costume supplier. If you're new to this series, let me briefly summarise my feelings for Japanese RPGs. And every single one of them is about androgynous teenagers killing Satan. Admittedly, Valkyria Chronicles is more turn-based strategy than traditional RPG, but it's definitely up to its knees in everything I despise about anime games, and again, admittedly, it's less androgynous teenagers killing Satan and more androgynous teenagers killing Adolf Hitler like there's any fucking difference. Sorry, did I say Adolf Hitler? I was of course referring to Gadolf Schmittler, Chancellor of Germany. Valkyria Chronicles concerns the outbreak of war on the continent of Europa between the evil empire in the east, for there are no good empires, and the allied federation in the west. It's World War II in everything but names, and the disguise is cling film thin, but I suppose demonising the actual Germans would have been a little hypocritical for a Japanese game, oh yes. We all know whose brat vs you lot were snacking on back then. The focus is on a small idyllic country caught in the middle of the conflict and which evokes a mashup of Holland, Belgium and Switzerland as depicted by Winnie the Pooh. The main characters are your standard JRPG pick and mix, the pretty boy hero who comes across as wetter than a swimming pool in New Orleans, the angry immature girl who secretly craves pretty boy cock, the hero's adopted sister whose non-blood related status is made abundantly clear to a somewhat suspect degree, and they all link arms and merrily trot off to war to get killed, or rather to get everyone with less screen time killed. So here's how this works. After joining the army, the hero becomes a squadron commander, apparently by virtue of the fact that he was the only new recruit with the presence of mind to bring his own tank. He, that is you, then have to handpick 20 odd recruits for your squad, with no more information to go on than their fondness for meadows or tendency towards lesbianism. Work has been put into giving every soldier a distinct face, personality and one-line backstory, which is probably just intended to make us give a shit, but was really useful in helping me remember the useless fatheads. There was this one guy, a sniper, looked like he was suffering from reverse ageing and he just felt his testicles being absorbed into his body, seemed to hit maybe one out of every ten shots. And every time I brought him along, the enemy would always aim for him first. It was uncanny. It was like he was so dense that his gravitational pull sucked every passing bullet right into his face. Battles are turn-based, of course, the gentlemanly way to fight. When you're moving someone, you zoom into their perspective and control them third-person shooter style until the movement points run out and you're left jogging on the spot like a tard. It's an interesting attempt to combine turn-based gameplay and shooter action, but some things just don't combine, like Republicans and compassion. The attempts to work in exciting shooter action only serve to underline the oddities of a turn-based system, for e.g., while you're controlling a unit, nearby enemies will shoot at you and only you, except when you're aiming when they apparently realise that shit has gotten serious, and they keep shooting you even if you're not moving, so if you're interested in all that overrated staying alive business, you have to get used to ending your go as soon as you're done firing, whereupon your unit instantly vanishes from the enemy's mental radar. So make sure you're not playing this game in a belfry way, it could be distracted at any moment by cheeky low-flying bats. Also, why can you only crouch behind sandbags? Behind perfectly functional cover like crates and chest-high walls, all you can do is gormlessly stand there like an androgynous teenage wooden duck. As shocking as this revelation may be, before you battle you actually have to get to the battles. There's a lot of micromanagement faffing around to be done at HQ in between missions, and a lot of it seems unnecessary. Guns can be upgraded, but only in one way, and it seems like the technicians could do that automatically without waiting to be asked, and just let me worry about who to point them at. And throughout all this, you have to navigate a menu system apparently designed by a man with his head stuck in a filing cabinet. You have to go into an entire separate menu just to change the tabs in the main menu. It's a bloated fractal spreadsheet nightmare. And it has the Microsoft Windows problem of always asking, are you sure? Are you sure you want to watch this cutscene? Frankly, Valkyria Chronicles, no. I'm not sure I want to lose another five minutes of my life watching your androgynous teenage gobshites witter on about shit I don't care about, but it's the only way to proceed, so I'm a little perplexed as to why you asked, and while we're on the subject, yes I'm sure I want to watch the next three cutscenes too, rather than having to come back to the chapter select screen to be asked if I'm sure between every single fucking one. Valkyria Chronicles helped me come to two distressing realisations about myself, firstly that I might technically be a Nazi sympathiser, and secondly that turn-based strategy is something I might be able to get into. Here and there in battle I caught myself getting slightly entertained, but Valkyria Chronicles messes itself around too much, aside from the action being outnumbered 5 to 1 by cutscenes and muddy menu-driven micromanagement motherfuckery, enemies should not be able to shoot you when it's not their fucking turn. It's like an opponent in chess flicking an astral
plastic bands at your pawns while you're trying to think. As a final point though, where the fuck is autosave? This may sound petty, but I won't apologise for having gotten used to autosave. When the schmartzy gorm troopers have exterminated my entire army in a protracted bollock course, I believe I have the right to rage quit without losing all my progress, because that's generally the last thing I remember before I wake up with blood in my teeth and another missing house pet. Another week, another game concerning World War II, beginning with V and prominently featuring female soldiers with their bums hanging out, but that's where the similarities end, while Valkyria Chronicles is about uniform cuties gossiping about boys and defending the hundred acre wood from mean old farmer Hitler, Velvet Assassin is about an emotionally dead young woman slitting the throats of Nazis because they just peeled off a Jewish baby's face and jerked off with it. The two games form interesting counterpoints of each other, on the one side thinly disguised idealistic pussyfooting remote controlled from the top of the general's ivory tower, and on the other intense behind enemy lines morally ambiguous realism so gritty you could lay it down in your front yard and call it a driveway. Velvet Velvet Assassin is loosely based on the life of British wartime spy Violet Zabo, and it couldn't get much looser without slipping off altogether. The game character is Violet Summer, a British wartime spy with a much more relatably Anglo-Saxon last name, who looks like she does her eyeshadow with a catapult and her hair with a fire hose, and whose arse extrudes a good 10 or 11 inches from the rest of her. She's posted in occupied France, and after a particularly intense croissant binge, lies comatose in a hospital where she dreams of her favourite throat slitting moments. It's basically just a Hitman Blood Money-esque framing device to take us through the highlights of her glorious career up to that point, which seemed to mainly consist of crouched walking around sewer tunnels, failing to make friends. So it's a third person stealth game with a splinter cell crossed with Hitman crossed with Schindler's List sort of feel, with a dash of Thieves atmosphere and a sprinkling of Metal Gear Solid's confused, vaguely anti war bullshit message. The mechanics are simple enough enemy soldiers walk stiffly around predetermined paths with their delicious fleshy throats on display, and you're either in shadow and invisible, or not and not. I have a special little black hole in my cold obsidian heart for stealth gameplay, but it's like owning a tiger. It's very impressive if you know how to look after it, but if you don't, you're gonna be cleaning massive dollops of your former children off the kitchen floor. Instant game over is the moment the guards so much as smell your farts for an example of bad stealth. And while Velvet Assassin does give you the opportunity to fight back or evade when you're spotted, they have assault rifles, you have a pistol, they have several friends, you have a bad haircut, so they might as well just dump you to the load screen to try again for the 16 hyper belillionth time. Alternatively, you can use the morphine mode feature, which deserves a frank description without colourful analogies. You can have one morphine syringe at a time, and when you use it, the enemies freeze in place, the world fills with mist, rose petals fall from the ceiling, and most of Violet's clothes fly off. There really needs to be a word meaning artsy in a way that's cool rather than gay. As interesting as the effect is, its only real purpose is a one time get out of fuck up free card, allowing you to swiftly delete one inconveniently alerted Nazi. Once you kill someone, you go back to reality, so if there was more than one alerted Nazi around, then the fuck-up remedy has instead resulted in what we experts call boomerang fuck-up. Alternatively, alternatively, you can put on an SS uniform and hide in plain sight, which turns the game into Hitman, incredibly scaled down and fueled with estrogen, with only one outfit and in which you can't get close to anyone because you emit the unmistakable stench of a British agent, a combination of tea and extremely greasy food. Velvet Assassin suffers from repetition and the levels are extremely linear, which is what turned me off Splinter Cell. It'd be nice to see another stealth game with a little more explorative freedom like what Assassin's Creed very nearly didn't completely fail to be, but what is nice is seeing a game ignore the pressure to try to please everyone and concentrate totally on the stealth mechanic to really bring to life the emotive and nerve-wracking combat alternative I like so much, is what I would be saying if Velvet Assassin didn't wrap its lips around the very same shotgun death cock Assassin's Creed snacked on and clunkily revert to mandatory run-and-gun shooty action for the last mission because they couldn't think of any other way to make things feel climactic. If Violet hadn't spent the whole mission running around in a skimpy night attire it would have been a complete disappointment. Yeah, you heard me. Remember how this game was supposed to be based on an actual person? I'm pretty sure they were making shit up by this point. If there were female soldiers battling in their lingerie back then, there'd probably be more photos of it. The general feel of artsiness makes me think Velvet Assassin is trying to make a point, but I'm not sure what that point is. Possibly that the Nazis were bad? Yeah, we figured that out around the Normandy landings. But then again, things aren't as clear cut as that. You keep finding the letters the soldiers wrote to their girlfriends, talking about how much they're looking forward to coming home and living extremely long, idyllic lives with five children and a pristine, undamaged neck. And Violet herself comes across as a bit of a psycho, murdering captive allied spies before they can talk, and when she's busy introducing Mr. Jugular to Lady Foster, Washington Switchblade, she always looks like she's just a little bit too into it. One thing's for sure, this definitely wasn't an American production, because if it was, it would have ended with Hitler's Volcano Doom Fortress sinking into the ocean while Violet watches from the deck of a nearby submarine with the orphan children she rescued from the underground genetics lab. Out of curiosity, I looked up the developers, and they're actually German, which surprised me, because I heard that if you even mention the Nazis in Germany, then the government come over and set your house on fire. Between this and Valkyria Chronicles, what's with all the World War II games being developed by the Axis forces? What is this, community service? I've never claimed to be a humble man, in fact I think I can safely say that I'm unequivocally the least humble person in the entire history of the universe, but even I find myself humbled by Duke Nukem Forever. Who would have thought, after 12 long, extremely stupid years of speculation and engine changes, occasional screenshots, and presumably several roomfuls of people paid to sit and go all day long, that the game would not only be finally released, but would be worth every nanosecond of waiting and would be of such astounding depth and complexity that every previous conventionally good game shrivels before its mightiness like it's a cold day in the locker room. Duke Nukem Forever is a genre-defying masterpiece, combining elements 
of first person shooters, adventure games, RTSs, typing tutors, cooking mama, and ordinarily I'd expect such a game to feel schizophrenic and thinly spread, but it all merges seamlessly together in a way I thought impossible. I started the game first person shooting at terrorists in a military complex, then four or five hours later I was in a restaurant on the moon making ravioli for an incoming alien wedding party, and I honestly couldn't tell you where any significant changes occurred in the intervening time. But what really boggles my mind is the sheer amount of effort that went into the fake screenshots and trailers that were released throughout development to give the false impression that the game was an utterly generic brown FPS that any competent studio could have farted out in a year or two, and that the entire team were time-wasting cock sections with the work ethic of an overweight house cat with no legs, and I was honestly taken in. Another thing I'm impressed by is the reworking of Duke Nukem as a character, because I always felt that while his traditional image, i.e. spurting jets of gluey testosterone over the faces of submissive women, was perfectly acceptable up to the mid-90s when the world was backward and primitive, it would just come across as obnoxious in an age that has grown used to protagonists with more complexity than a colouring book. Duke Nukem Forever put all my concerns to rest. Ten years after the alien conquest of Earth, a middle-aged and jaded Duke is in hiding in Stockholm under the name Vladimir Lestrade, until a letter from his estranged daughter in the Resistance begs him to come to their aid, and thus begins an epic tale of redemption and self-discovery that will take us from the Swedish ghettos to beyond the furthest stars. And while I don't want to spoil too much, I was extremely moved by the scene in which Duke tearfully reunites with his daughter, and then she puts on a bikini and dry humps his leg. Every single mode of gameplay in this extravaganza is controlled through an intuitive full-body interface. You move Duke's arms with the analog sticks and his legs with the shoulder button, so to walk forward you alternate pressing L1 and R1, and you'd be amazed how immersive that gets after a while. The buttons are used for facial expressions, so you press X to move your mouth, triangle to pick your nose, and square and circle to wiggle your ears. These are all mostly used to endear yourself to the many rascally children you have to befriend, but they're also used for problem solving, such as at the point where Duke is strapped to an operating table and needs to activate a crossbow someone left next to his head. Also, for the first ten minutes or so you can use the six axis to rotate Duke's neck, but then there's a hilarious fourth wall breaking sequence where Duke bursts into the lead designer's office and punches him in the stomach for being so fucking stupid. It's difficult to pin down my favourite aspect of Duke Nukem Forever between the dolphin races and the gun that shoots dogs, and the liberal use of full frontal nudity, but I think the achievements deserve particular mention. It's not just the usual token achievement every time you beat a chapter and a big one at the end, no sir, Duke Nukem Forever makes you fucking work for your gamer score. There's the achievement for beating the final boss using only your ears, there's the achievement for playing the whole game with the controller immersed in icy water, the achievement for placing a Wii Fit board in front of the TV and obliterating it with a croquet mallet, but the hardest one of all is the achievement for turning off the console, leaving the house, meeting a nice girl, taking a sailing boat around the world, having three beautiful blonde children, and finally dying content with the knowledge that you didn't spend twelve years waiting for an utterly pedestrian sequel to a game that everyone stopped caring about around 1997 to be released by a developer that makes John Romero look on the ball. Which is a huge challenge, because if just one of those kids turns out brunette, then you have to start all over again. My one criticism for Junior Nukem Forever is that it comes on 14 DVDs, but I'd expect nothing less from a game with such a long development time, and every second is on display. And a good thing too, I mean, hypothetically, if 3D Realms hadn't used the time to put together a Titanic super game and had merely been jerking off for 12 years, then it raises unfortunate implications. It means that not only can a studio be staffed entirely by Howler Monkeys, but there are also investors who probably consider themselves to be quite serious people who will pay them to jump about and wee on things for over a decade, while talented people with great ideas for games are snubbed because they've never had dinner with John Carmack or whatever. And then when the monkeys present nothing more entertaining than a fistful of poo on a tray and they get sued for all their bananas, a bunch of extremely thick people who still genuinely believe that something half decent could come out of this rigmarole would say, that's tragic. No, it is not tragic. If you get sued because you were paid to do a job you didn't do, that is not tragic. That is how the world should be. And you are a magnificent retard who should have their brain taken away by social services. But anyway, the point was, I'm just glad I don't live in a world where such scenarios exist. Now I better stop here because I promised Jimi Hendrix that we'd go pony trekking under the sea. I know that as data storage goes, cartridges were only about one step above a piece of paper with holes in it, but if there was one area where they excelled, it was low loading times. I found myself musing on this while I waited for Bionic Commando to install itself on the PS3, then download an update, then sort the trophies, then lock itself in the bathroom for an hour to pluck its eyebrows, and even once I'd waded through the cutscenes and tutorials and gotten to the bit where I get to press buttons, the loading screen broke up the action so much I can now see the words press X to jump every time I close my eyes. I know such things may well be inevitable in the wonderful process of buggering world of modern technology, but wasn't there a time not so long ago when the ability to just pick up and play was the major advantage of consoles over PC gaming, besides Windows 3.1? Like myself, Bionic Commando is a stubbornly persistent remnant of a bike gone age, having started life on the NES, and it seems I'm not the only one who's having a bit of a sulk. The first Bionic Commando was a characteristically wholesome Nintendo platform and that taught us simple moral lessons like hookshot arms are awesome and all Nazis should die, but the new Bionic Commando has taken the dark and edgy route, meaning that everyone says fuck like it's on their word of the day calendar. After the events of the first game, people with Bionic limbs apparently won too many arm wrestling competitions and now everyone hates them. The Bionic Commando, a character so lasting and dynamic that I completely forgot his name, is on death row for being a Bionic Commando apparently, but then a group of radical Bionics nuke a city to make everyone realise what 
harmless and level-headed people they are, so the government give our hero his arm back and send him in. But they call him up every five minutes to call him a tosser, so at least they're not hypocrites. Also, there's a subplot concerning his missing wife, and the twist that resolves that subplot is officially the most retarded thing I've heard since I called the walrus hotline. Whatever, I don't give a toss about no wife, bitch. I'm here to make my little bionic monkey swing on shit. I'm still as fond of swinging as I was in my Spider-Man review, so once I'd run through the tutorial and obtained my bionic arm certification, they finally let me out to play and I found myself awestruck as I stood blinded by the daylight shining down between the dilapidated buildings of a ruined cityscape where every overhanging sign and vantage point were like sirens calling to me as they pushed their boobies together and made suggestive references to bobsledding. I immediately started hookshotting my way up the nearest building, and the first thing I noticed was that the swinging mechanic feels as smooth and pleasant as a clockwork bumfuck. No matter how fast you were going when you started, you always swing at the same speed, because momentum is for pussies, and at the end of the swing your character breaks wind and lurches forward sickeningly. It all feels very stiff and unnatural, and there's a dick joke in there somewhere. Anyway, once I got accustomed to all that and resumed climbing, halfway to the prize a big fat radiation symbol appeared and my skin fell off. Yes, turns out my asshole superiors forgot to mention that a recent nuke might leave some fallout around the place, and we discover what this expansive looking city really is, a great big linear corridor with death instead of walls. Not that every game has to be a sandbox, but often the only way you'll find out that a particular route has had a visit from the radiation fairy is after you've already swung right into it. Don't punish me for my exploration instinct, Bionic Commando, you're the one who didn't put up a fucking stop sign. So what, we're smart enough to bring along a momentum cancelling device but not a radiation suit? It soon transpired that mine weren't the only asshole superiors sending insufficiently equipped soldiers into extremely hostile environments because enemies are everywhere and the combat is probably my favourite part of this game, because as many games have demonstrated, merely getting an enemy out of the way is one thing but the ability to be extremely vindictive about it is another. You can use traditional guns if you're boring and unlikable and people's eyes glaze over when you're talking to them and you're my dad, but sexy and exciting people, like your mum, can use the hookshot arm to fling the scenery at the enemies, fling themselves at the enemies, or fling enemies at enemies if you're romantic, and there's enough room for creativity to keep things shard and freud -atastic. It's just a little weird that they teach you all the flinging moves in the tutorial at the start, but don't actually let you use them until a completely arbitrary point sometime later on. It seems unnecessary, especially for a game that already takes too long to get going. Don't hide your selling points, hookers don't wear suits of armour, except at E3. Is Bionic Commando a good game? It's a naughty question, the controls take some getting used to, but once you're there they work, I guess. Loading times are an arse, but the scenery is nice, at least I think it was, the levels whiz by so fast it's hard to tell. There was one odd moment when I strolled into a big boss arena-like place that probably took some designer quite a while to put together, but after a short unplayable cutscene in which my hero beats up another character, all I could do was stroll out again. Then I was all like, did I just win the boss fight? Yay me! But that doesn't make the game bad, it's just weird. I think what does make Bionic Commando bad is the fact that it's a whore, and not the wholesome kind, a corporate whore. Product placement is everywhere, with the most endemic being Pepsi. Everywhere you look, Pepsi machines, and you're not allowed to fling them as well weapons, presumably because the evil shadowy businessman didn't want the logo being associated with grievous bodily harm. Maybe I shouldn't be judgmental, maybe Capcom are all living under a bridge and they desperately need the money, but why Pepsi of all things? I hate Pepsi! It tastes like someone's wringing out their old gym socks into my mouth. So overall, Bionic Commando is a bad game because it drinks Pepsi. Yes, I can be petty. In my Fear 2 review, I made the point that government super soldier projects are a flawed premise because any death machine with free will will inevitably notice that there's something iffy about taking orders from cabals of ageing generals when they can beat bears to death from across the room using only their prostate. If superpowers are to be had, handing them out to random passers-by seems as good a system as any, because then we can all ask ourselves whether we'd use the gift to help people or blow up the entire world. Of course, I would ask why we can't have more options. Can't I just help people as a day job and destroy the world on the weekends? Or maybe I'd just fuck the whole complicated business and go back to working at Walmart, using my powers to jumpstart the little carts the fatties ride around on. Today's superpower lottery winner is Cole McGrath, a name that's half Irish and half dipshit, a courier who was dicking around with this package when it blew up in his face, which just goes to show that registered post is probably best for delivering your MacGuffins. Cole gains the power of electricity while everyone around him gains the power of dead, and Cole must decide whether to help rebuild the city he just destroyed or make what remains into his little electro bitch. Judging by the way he looks like a cross between an EastEnders character and an angry potato, and talks like a blender full of gravel, the game suspects he'll favour the second option, if that weren't already obvious from the fucking title. From a relatively sober beginning fighting gangs in hoodies, the plot gradually takes a left turn on fourth and bananas, and before long you're fighting giant trash robots built by psychic super hobos. I'd call it borderline indigo prophecy syndrome if the plot had made any attempt to make the slightest bit of sense. First let me blow your fucking mind by saying that this is exactly what a sound box game should be. You have a big city, you have the means to get around the big city quite fast, you can jump gleefully around on the rooftops like Down Syndrome Batman. If you've got some urgent doctor's appointment you can just do the story missions, or if like me you're working from home and spend most of your days arsing around in a dressing gown and getting paid perplexingly well for it, you can do the optional side missions too and add more and more territory to what is either your benevolent niceness kingdom or your electro bitch fascist state. And thankfully not all of the optional missions are just variations on a theme of go here and kill everything, only most of them. And lest we forget you can shoot various flavours of lightning out of your ass. Some of those flavours do seem a bit ridiculous 
ridiculous, like electric healing, since everyone knows that 50,000 volts are just a thing for a collapsed lung, and when you make electricity into little restraining manacles, which didn't make a lot of sense when the Super Friends did it either. Also, some of the later enemies have ridiculous amounts of health, and fighting them gets pretty tedious when you have to stand over them and zap them in the balls five times before they finally realise that staying down is the smarter option. The end boss is particularly guilty of this, it's like his health meter is a six foot Mars bar and you're diabetic. These complaints seem petty, even to me, but, well, I only had a weekend to play to the end and I stayed up all night to find this out, so I might as well mention it, if only to justify my disrupted sleep schedule and bleeding eyeballs. But then I realised that if I'm trying this hard to find complaints, then I may have forgotten what I'm in this gig for, to depict the majority of games as the bland garbage that they are, to highlight the few glittering belly dancers that rise above it. And Infamous is good. In fact, it's great. Huge, creative and fun. It's rare that I find a game for which I'm willing to suffer hemolacria. But having said that, I have one big complaint that I was saving until now, and it goes thus. Moral choice systems in games need to drink some paint and retard themselves out of existence. As I said way back in my Bioshock review, all they usually amount to is occasionally forcing us to pick whether we want to sing the orphans to sleep or murder their dogs with no middle ground, especially not in Infamous, because you need to be all the way good or all the way evil to be able to unlock the best toys. I was playing nice just to spite the title and they let me unlock a generic wind-up power blast thing that I never used because it would have been quicker to nipple tweak all the enemies to death, but apparently the evil path lets you arc lightning, lets you rip shit up Emperor Palpatine style, which really jostled my flaps and no mistake. You see, this is my issue. All this system really does is force us to play the game twice if we want to see all the content. It's not letting us roleplay because we're always Cole McGrath, you're just either Cole McNice or Cole McDick. It's not letting us impose our own values because the evil options are always so cartoonishly villainous you'd need to be Jeffrey Dahmer. But even he wouldn't have called himself evil and that's why karma meters are bullshit. Good and evil are utterly meaningless terms that vary from society to society. A few hundred years from now when overcrowding leaves us crammed shoulder to shoulder through the streets fighting over the last croissant in the patisserie, the denouncement of genocide will be remembered as tragically quaint. Anyway, everyone knows that a really evil person would take the good options to create a facade of benevolence while slowly building their power base and public confidence until just when you least expect it, bam, off-world slavery. And even then, the Republicans will probably still vote for them. As my father once said, never trust any trade convention that's named after an enzyme in the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, so I'm always wary about E3. Hype is a device invented by mean-spirited marketing executives who never discover the true meaning of Christmas, and I said last year how it makes the most logical sense to be pessimistic, so allow me to get right into it and explain why everything that was hyped at E3 2009 will definitely fail and be incredibly depressed can probably make you start cutting again. You're welcome. Project Natal. I know they pronounced it Natal, but I'm gonna keep calling it Natal because that's what it looks like and it's a really fucking creepy image. The only thing creepier would be a grown woman flirting with a dead-eyed CG ten-year-old while Peter Molyneux stands in the background gushing about it. It may be an amazing bit of technology, but all these motion sensor concepts have to eventually face the fact that people play games to unwind and no one unwinds by coming home and waving their arms about like an air traffic controller covered in beetles. Oh sure, you'll get a few sales from the gimmick crowd, but it's like selling shiny objects to magpies. Everything's fine until the moment someone invents a slightly shinier object and then you left crawling back to the core fan base you spent the last few years totally blowing off. Speaking of which, that brings me to Nintendo! Oh hello again Nintendo, I almost didn't recognise you with all that casual game of semen crusting around your mouth. What's that? Four new Mario games? Oh, what's the matter, you cool new mainstream friends starting to get bored and you somehow remembered that you're a video game company, not Fisher Price. Anyway, I'm very disappointed in you. As I said in my Super Mario Galaxy review, it'd be hard to find new territory after going into space, but now it seems like you're just not even gonna fucking try. Super Mario Galaxy 2, the expansion pack that walks like a sequel. Presumably we'll have to wait a bit longer for Super Mario Space Time Continuum, but in the meantime we can also play a new 2D Mario Brothers with multiplayer support, so now the Wii can annoy up to four people at the same time for maximum efficiency. Oh yes, and some hints were dropped concerning a new Zelda. Oh you coy little bitch! I look forward to discovering whether we get the grappling hook or the boomerang first this time. Sony! Sony and Microsoft continue their endless one-upmanship with Sony's own motion sensor baby toy that's even creepier than Peter Molyneux's enthusiasm, the iPets. It's the face, I think. It's just a little bit too human. It's like they dressed one of the Rice Krispie elves in a monkey suit and withheld food until he debased himself for our entertainment. But that aside, Sony is all about the exclusive titles, Metal Gear Solid Rising, the latest in the Undead franchise that not even Hideo Kojima's writing can kill. And I've got to say he's outdone himself this time because a lot of his games bore me, but this is the first one that's bored me before it even came out. The Last Guardian by Team Ico is slightly more interesting in that it seems they've just made Ico again, but replaced escorting a recent concussion victim with tearing shit up on a giant monster, which is definitely a positive step. But do bear in mind that the monster in question is far too lovable to survive to the end of a Team Ico game. Quite a few third party games to get through now, so let's keep it snappy. Assassin's Creed 2! A while ago, the idea got around that Assassin's Creed 2 would be set in the future, like what Assassin's Creed 1 was foreshadowing, but it seems Ubisoft feel that too much innovation all in one go will cause people's heads to explode. So we've instead moved from ancient history to slightly less ancient history. Thank God for that, I was almost getting interested. Uncharted 2, Among Thieves! We certainly are Among Thieves! Thieves of Tomb Raider, Thieves of Indiana Jones, oh snap! In all seriousness, there's multiplayer now, and the possibility of having to put up with more than one wisecracking Nathan Drake is officially my new vision of hell. Beatles Rock Band! Now that's what I call redundant, it's like saying Badger Mammal, or Inspector 
Morse Detective or Harmonic's obvious cash-in. Alan Wake! Ironically, waking will be the exact opposite of what this game will make you do. Sonic All-Stars Racing! First thought, why the fuck does Sonic the Hedgehog need a car? Second thought, why the fuck does Sonic the Hedgehog need to still exist? Final Fantasy XIV! I feel that anything I could say would be repeating myself, so I'm just going to express my feelings with a strangled noise from the back of my throat. <laughs> Halo Reach, as in, if anyone thinks a new Halo game would be the slightest bit worth a damn, that certainly would be a reach. Bayonetta, more like, hey yo better not play this game, oh fuck you. Silent Hill Shattered Memories. Oh right, so it's a whole new interpretation of the concept with retooled gameplay and an emphasis on psychological horror. Actually, that sounds pretty good, but I'm committed to this idea now, so it's probably going to be bad. Why? Because people are shit. Whenever I'm in a crowd, I think to myself, who left this shit all over the place? I'm shit, you're shit, the world is shit. And if you're sitting there thinking, yes, it's true, everyone is shit except me, then you're a double bacon shit with large fries, Mr. Shitface. Sorry, this reflects badly on me, doesn't it? I should have said, Mr. or Mrs. Shitface. In my Fear 2 review, I made the point that government super soldier projects are a flawed premise because any death machine with free will will inevitably notice that there's something iffy about... Oh wait, sorry, I've done this one. But you know what's an even worse idea than super soldiers? Biological weapons that turn their victims into super soldiers. I see several ways that could bite you in the arse. So here's Prototype, a suspiciously similar game to Infamous, but blatant copying is the foundation of the entertainment industry, so rather than argue over who got the idea first for a supervillain sandbox game, it was me! Let's compare them in a series of clinical trials. It's scientific! Plot. Prototype loses several million points right out of the gates by being about to guy with amnesia, and it only goes downhill from there. Infamous keeps things nice and straightforward. Magic Ball gives superpowers. Everyone want Magic Ball. Go find Magic Ball. Psychic trash robots. It does things comic book style, which is probably the right way to go when you're dealing with science so soft you could spread it on a croissant. Prototype, meanwhile, has more of a disaster movie conspiracy thriller feel to it that gets so confusing that they had to put in an entire gameplay mechanic based around eating the brains of people who might know what the fuck's going on. One point for Infamous. Main character, Cole McGrath and Alex Mercer, two ugly men with gravelly voices, but at least Cole tucks his shirt in. Personality-wise, they actually create a pretty interesting contrast. The player chooses whether Cole is a tragic selfless hero or electro-crossed with being the Merciless, but both personalities are at least consistent. Alex Mercer, on the other hand, doesn't make any moral choices besides murder everyone or murder everyone and eat them as well, but a lot of his dialogue and cutscenes keep trying to paint him as a decent but wronged man just out for justice. I had to laugh at a moment when I was on a mission ploughing a tank through a crowded street, and over the agonised screams, Alex said, Gosh, I sure hope this is the right thing to do. It's like if Mr. Bean were a mass murderer. Infamous wins if only for coherence. Combat. The trouble with Infamous is that zapping dudes is really the only string to your bow. Cole is a one-hit wonder, the vanilla ice of supervillains, while Alex prefers his killing sprees to be a little more indie and experimental. You can steal people's guns and shoot them, although you won't. You can throw cars and air conditioners at people, but you won't use that either. And you can twist your limbs into deadly claws, blades and bludgeons, but you definitely won't use any of those, because the ridiculously overpowered Extendo tentacle does huge damage, extremely long range, and can instantly liberate people's top halves from their bottom halves, so you will never use anything else. Admittedly, it's not much help against buildings or armoured targets, but then you just use it to hijack one of the gunships that the military will very kindly send to you in large quantities every time you bully their friends. One point for prototype. Sandbox. Infamous's city is kind of small and slummy on account of being a small slum, but Prototype City is much bigger with plenty of really tall buildings you can hurl yourself off for giggles. But sadly, they can't be given any points for it because they've just copied Manhattan off Google Maps, which is cheating. Prototype still wins, though, because a sandbox is only as good as the method by which you get around it, and Cole has a tendency to get bogged down with climbing, while Alex can shoot blood out of his wrists at jet engine velocity and fly like emo Peter Pan. I'd say it was made of wind, but if I did, I'd have to strangle myself. Side missions. Okay, Infamous definitely takes this one because there's an actual reason to do them, i.e. clearing out the city, whereas Prototype only has it for XP grinding, which you won't need because the Extendo Tentacle only has two upgrades. What's more, in Infamous, the side quests can consist of racing, scavenger hunts, escorting and posing for photos rather than just combat all the time, whereas Prototype side missions are mainly just killing, which I feel Alex gets enough of in the day job. There are a few racing and gliding challenges, but lacking context, they raise the question of why a brooding anti-hero on a determined quest for vengeance would take time out to see how fast he can climb the Empire State Building. Cathartic potential. Again, zapping people in the balls is really the only schadenfreude to be had in Infamous, and Prototype absolutely skull fucks it in the dicking around event. Eat an old man, take his appearance, run all the way up the tallest building, then elbow drop 200 stories directly onto his confused and frightened wife, then sneak up behind two soldiers and eat one without his friend noticing, then when the two of you get back to base, accuse your friend of being you in disguise, then when all the other soldiers are distracted shooting him, eat them too. If only Jeffrey Dahmer had had this game to blow off steam with, a lot of young Milwaukee gay boys could be walking around uncannibalized today. Conclusion. The final scores are... 
three points apiece. So much for the fucking scientific method. I suppose we could say then that the games are equally fun and that there's room in this world for both, but fuck that. History needs to know which is best, so I'm going to award victory to whichever game's developer sends me the best picture of the other game's main character wearing a woman's bra. Well, fuck. I really didn't want to end up in this position. The only reason I bought The Sims 3 after dark and while no one was watching, obviously, was as an emergency fallback for when the summer games drought kicked in. I was hoping to have Ghostbusters by now, but I guess time makes fools of us all. Australian release times, to be precise. My future self will probably be playing it by the time this video goes out, but fuck my future self. He's had something against me ever since he started putting on weight. I have to admit, I'm surprised that The Sims 3 even exists, considering that EA's usual policy of releasing a new fraction of a game every time the cocaine bucket runs dry seem to be serving them perfectly well. But I guess even Sims fans occasionally demand something more every now and again when they're not drinking Bacardi breezes and having periods. I know what you're thinking. Yeah, I'd see you inappropriate menstruation joke. Why the reluctance? The Sims is more popular than a chocolate cunnilingus machine and afterwards doesn't make you feel fat and ashamed. It's introduced millions of people to gaming and has made enough money to buy a lap dance for every depressive in the Western world. But this exercise assumed that you are the president of the Sims fan club. Well, I could say that the majority of its audience are casual gamers, pronouncing casual gamers the same way I pronounce the word tapeworms, but that argument's a wee bit no true Scotsman. Truly my objection comes because what I am is a critic of games, not a critic of computer programs that you just fuck around in. Okay, let's try to be professional about this. Oh boy, The Sims 3! It's like The Sims 2, but plus another one. Now you can explore the entire town and discover that everyone else's lives are just as bland and empty as yours. You can also customise the texture and colouring of virtually everything, so I painted all my clothes and furniture with yellow and orange stripes so that it'd be harder to tell when it's all inevitably caught fire. But nevertheless, it seems like half of the actual content has gone walkabout. What happened to the sci-fi and the gothic settings from The Sims 2? The only town available is Norman Rockwellville. There are less objects available to buy, I couldn't find any snooker tables or jacuzzis for my planned entertainment lounge, and there's very little variety of hairdos. Yes, my new vagina is growing quite nicely, thank you for asking, but I swiftly deduced that all these deficiencies are because they're saving stuff for the downloadable content that you have to buy with real money. Phew! EA aren't stupid after all. They're just greedy, exploitative fucks. If you put yourself into a chemical coma around the time Sims 1 came out, and frankly I don't blame you, The Sims is, as the name implies, a simulation of a gated community that has been taken over by meth addicts and flamboyant homosexuals. They eat, sleep, go to work, and occasionally urinate a mysterious blue liquid. So where does interactivity come into this? Well, you have to design and maintain the house in which they live. That's about it, actually. On the surface, you seem to have complete control over their lives. You can trap them in a tiny room with no amenities and watch them slowly starve. If you're a bitter antisocial dickhead and you've alienated everyone who ever loved you and you like to think you're funny and aloof, but really you're dying inside and also you smell. But the appeal in that runs out fast. Watching people trapped in small boxes as their lives visibly tick away brings back unpleasant memories of temporary office work. But beneath the surface, your power over these tiny lives is ultimately negligible. Assuming you're not a bitter antisocial dickhead, etc., and you're playing properly, your role is to keep the Sims happy. They've got various stats on display, and as soon as one goes in the red, you make them do a wee or eat leftover pancakes or whatever, and assuming they've got a job, you'll have just enough time in the day to get every stat in the green before they leave. You fall into a routine, and it gets harder and harder to break out. Days go by, all interchangeable, even the house parties at the weekend start to feel hollow and token. Sooner or later a big fat realisation drops onto your head and smothers your face in its blubbery rolls. Here you are, recreating the same work-sleep routine you're supposed to be using your free time to get away from, looking forward to simulated weekends even while your own drift by unfulfilled. You see what this is? You are not the ruler of your sims, you are the one rushing to meet their every whim. You are the slave. You are the real plaything. This may sound a little bit hysterical, but The Sims is probably the most evil game in the world. It's not the manhunt kind of evil that convinces children to put each other's heads in plastic bags. That's pussy evil. It's not even the World of Warcraft type of evil that turns millions of people into mindless zombies doomed to walk the earth devouring pizza and cheetos. No, The Sims is evil out of a sense of underlying wrongness. Despite physical appearance, every character feels the same, a facade of wholesomeness stretched over a dead, empty interior. A high like community of beings who make an effort to imitate human behaviour but don't quite grasp the subtleties. And you just know that if you peel their skin back you'll find reptilian scales or a black chitinous exoskeleton. But the most evil thing is the player. Trapping Sims Truman Show style to toy with their lives, not even for fun, but to indulge a twisted power fantasy, without having to go through all the trouble of birthing children of their own to abuse. So I guess what I'm saying is that all women are evil, bewitching innocents with their insidious emotions and absorbing our manhoods into their rank, blood-streaked spam sandwiches. Who needs them? Incidentally, I'm still not gay. A game based upon a film that was good, written by the same writers as the film that was good, with the same characters from the film that was good being played by the same actors from the film that was good, and with gameplay finger quotes inspired by that of a game that was good. Sort of, if you like that sort of thing. So you can see how Ghostbusters the game would make sense on paper, but then paper is a flimsy thing that goes see-through when you rub grease on it, and it's more than possible for the end result to be a whole shittier than the sum of its parts. Still, I can understand the appeal of voicing a version of yourself from around 20 years ago, from before your hair greyed and your tackle stopped working, even if the Ghostbusters have apparently been called out to the Haunted Valley a few too many times since last we saw them, if you see what I mean. A couple 
of years on from the last movie, the Ghostbusters are still making ends meet in the city with the shortest memory in the world and have hired a new trainee. That's you, who is a mute, because they obviously like hearing themselves talk so fucking much. The Ghostbusters' quest is to firstly save the city of ingrates from an ancient evil, and secondly, come up with various contrived reasons to revisit as many characters and locations from the movies as they feel they can get away with. If, like everyone who doesn't have blunt objects lodged in their brains, you thought Ghostbusters 2 was dreadful, you'll be gratified to hear that the decline since the first movie has remained constant. All the colour and lovability of the characters has been worn down like an old boiled sweet, and you can almost hear a doped up sitcom audience guffawing at the cringeworthy humour and cheering every time anyone walks in the room. That's what I always hate about revivals of really old franchises. The creators are always just a little bit too much in love with the subject matter. That's why everyone in the new Doctor Who spends all their time alternating between sucking the Doctor's balls and asking for more. One large giveaway that this is a game born out of Hollywood is that the action looks impressive, but you can barely tell what the fuck's going on. The appearance of the photon blast is faithfully recreated, i.e. it fills half the screen with glowing white particle effects and a large portion of what remains is occupied by your fat, stupid Gears of War jacket potato head. And bear in mind that up to four NPCs are all going to be firing their own lasers at the same time and you've got a visual equivalent of hiding in the back of a speeding fireworks truck in the middle of the nuclear holocaust. Fortunately, this is entirely compensated by the combat being extremely natural and intuitive. Ha ha as if. The ghost trapping process stringently follows established canon because Ghostbusters is nothing if not eager to jerk off. First you throw lasers at them until their unreasonably long health bars fall off, then you swing them country style around the room with your tethering laser that controls like the Half-Life 2 gravity gun if it was stuck up the arse of an excitable dog, then you calm them down by smacking them therapeutically against the walls and floor a few times, then finally hold them over a trap for long enough to suck them in. This has to be done for every single ghost, and when there are a lot of them around you basically roll the fucking dice as to whether you can get through this whole process without being blindsided by your victim's mates, or even by the victim themselves, because what with all the laser impaired vision it's hard to see them telegraph their attacks, and when you're trying to do the dodge move you have to wait a second or two for the signal to reach your avatar's doughy brains, so basically your entire body is one big greasy blindside. Oh yes, and you mustn't cross the streams. Of course, it's hard not to when everyone is aiming for the same fast-moving target, but I guess we're still too busy jerking off the movies to worry about that. You could argue that there's no need to help trap an enemy that your allies are already trapping, and then perhaps I could go and make a cup of tea and read the paper while they finish the game for me. Yeah, on that subject, if the tortuous writing and voice acting don't dissolve any affection you ever had for the Ghostbusters, the AI will seal the deal. I can see I'm not the only one who has trouble making out what's going on in the combat, because those smart asses get knocked over more often than a Subutio player mouthing off to his pimp. And just like in Gears of War, we'll need to be resurrected by an ally. So on top of all the aforesaid combat blindsiding issues, I have to break off the fight every now and again to do the retard roundup. It's like keeping plates spinning in the middle of a mosh pit and the plates won't shut the fuck up. Also, they always throw out traps as soon as I do, and we end up both tethering the ghost and fighting over whose trapper gets to go in. Jeez, guys, it's only a game. You don't have to be such jerks about it. This isn't the first time this sort of thing has happened. People or properties more commonly associated with famous movies, books, birthday card messages, etc. decide to grace the video game industry with their presence, and everyone's all like, ooh, show us how it's done, great sensei, because we've honestly just been guessing up to now. It belongs not only the endless disrespect video games receive, but also gaming's collective self-esteem problem. If something worked as a movie, then that qualifies it to work as a sequence of amusing lights and sounds that hold the average scumbag's jaw slack for around two hours, whereas a video game has to stand up to about ten hours of unpleasable nerds like me turning over every rock looking for stuff to complain about. My point is, asking a filmmaker to make a game is like asking a sausage maker to suck off a pig. You can sort of see the logical connection there, but it's a completely different skill set and the effort will just leave a bad taste in someone's mouth. Overlord and Evil Genius are both games that people People often tell me I would probably like, and frankly I'm not sure how to take that. Being a harsh critic doesn't make one evil, as hard as that may be to accept while running from an American Idol audition in floods of noisy tears. Criticism is a powerful force for good, nothing ever improves without coming to terms with its flaws. Without critics telling us what's stupid and what isn't, we'd all be wearing boulders for hats and drinking down hot Ebola soup for tea. No, being a harsh critic doesn't automatically lead me towards evil, it's my cannibalism that does that. Overlord 2 plonks you in the usual generic fantasy world and into the big renaissance fair booties of some guy who at least subscribes to the same magazines as Lord Sauron, and your task is to use an army of giggling imp minions to... actually that's a good point, what the fuck are we doing here? Taking over the world, probably, not that they ever tell you that. I guess once you've put your big spiky helmet on over your glowing eyes and raised an army of demons to do your bidding, you can't exactly go back to business school. But I find the world conquering motive a little questionable, since the world is small, boring and linear and not exactly jewel in the crown material. It reminds me of the Fable games, in fact this is about as Peter Molyneux as you can get without actually involving Peter Molyneux. Shallow levels, flimsy design, unfulfilled ambitions of epicness and liberal use of colloquial British accents. If one were to pull Overlord 2's trousers down, would one find the throbbing phallus of action adventure, the quivering vagina of real-time strategy, or the grotesque man who fell to earth neutrality of the hybrid. Truth be told, you'd probably find an inexpertly stitched on monstrosity with a label on it reading Property of Nintendo Corporation, because the core gameplay is most reminiscent of Pikmin. You have a small legion of imps, colour-coded for your convenience, brown ones are your basic melee workhorse, red ones have fireball attacks, invisible ones are probably some kind of psychotic delusion on your part, etc. You control them by group or all together, setting up guard points and fingering who to nibble to death, which is where the real-time strategy aspect comes in, except that there is no strategy, all you ever need to do is select all your 
imps and make them swamp anything you don't like. On the rare occasions that they all get killed, just raise another batch of practically no penalty and continue where they left off. Real time stupid, more like. Another thing Overlord 2 has in common with Peter Molyneux games is that it keeps trying to make us give a shit about his mindless constructions of ones and zeros. For example, every now and again throughout the story you come across women you can take as your mistress and keep in your doom fortress, which I suppose goes along with the theme, but if you must have this in your game, make them do something besides sit there eating all your evil pies. Give us some gameplay benefit as a reason to want to keep them happy besides the opportunity to have a pair of jubblies bouncing around the room. Also, is there a specific imp who has died and for whom you had a particular fondness? No there isn't, you fucking liar, they're all identical, but just in case there is, if you're the kind of person who assigns personalities to their dining room chairs, then you can resurrect specific ones for a small price, you weirdo. You see, the imps fail to endear themselves to me, which could be because they control like ass. A fat one, to be precise, sitting on a pair of stilts with roller skates on the end. There's a slight delay between holding down the send imps button and them actually moving the dozy bitches, and once you attempt tactics beyond everyone gang up on fuckface A, your control over the little bastards becomes increasingly stiff and unintuitive. But the worst control, the arsiest of the arse, is the control for moving your horde directly. I was playing the PC version because Steam is so gosh darn inexpensive and convenient, and the control for this was moving the mouse while holding down both buttons. I want you to try that for me now. Hold down both mouse buttons and imagine you're using it to push a platoon of minions through a labyrinth within a severely brief time limit and the minions interpret your movements more as vague suggestions than direct commands and see how you do. Because that's the puzzle that made me quit to the Windows desktop and start rearranging my shortcuts which was considerably more fulfilling. I was actually relieved. Oh good, I thought, an excuse to stop playing this boring piece of shit. And as a general game reviewing rule of thumb, that's usually a bad sign. It was only after I stopped playing and noticed how fascinating my ceiling had become that I realised how bored I had been. Partly it's the combat, partly it's the long linear levels. In your home base you have to go through an entire loading screen just to find your upgrade shop. The place would be needlessly large even if your movement speed wasn't so painfully slow. Overall, the game should be congratulated for finding a way to suck the fun out of being an asshole, but I think it may have been missing the point anyway, and it's another reason why I dislike moral choice systems. You see, while it is true that people enjoy being a dick in games, it stops being fun when the game actually wants you to be a dick. It's less about dickishness itself and more about defying the rules. That's why it's more fun to be a dick in, say, Half-Life 2, because the game is desperately trying to make you out as the hero, even while you're jumping on someone's head throwing broken bottles into people's eyes. Being a dick in a dickishness simulator is just as boring as being nice in any other game. It's like the difference between lawful evil and chaotic evil, and I really could not have put that any nerdier, could I? Once upon a time, a fresh-faced youngster saved up all his pennies and bought his first PS2, and with it he bought a game called Red Faction 1, and after rushing home to play he discovered that Red Faction 1 was not a very good game. Actually it was total shite on a crusty roll, and on that day something changed in that optimistic youth. He realised that for all the pomp and excitement of a new console generation there will always be shite, and no amount of emotion engines can unshite the shite. Thus began his downfall into the black, emotionless, flinty-hearted creature you see before you. Recently Red Faction Guerrilla came out, and you know when Conan the Barbarian watched his village being destroyed as a kid and 20 years later gets the opportunity to avenge himself on the guy who did it? That's kind of where I'm at right now. So here it is, a game about a bunch of twats doing shit no one cares about. Okay, okay, in the future Earth's economy is totally effed in the A, not to rip from today's headlines or anything, and everything hinges on the resources that can be bled from the recently terraformed Mars. But the residents of Mars don't like the idea of being bled very much, so conflict has broken out between the Earth military forces and the selfish resource-hogging colonists. And since it's probably hard to tell from that description, you're supposed to be rooting for the colonists. Neither can really claim the moral high ground, but the occupying Earth forces are all cartoonishly huge jerks who oppress and murder all over the place like they're taking orders from the Daleks or something. Then they make the mistake of killing your brother, and you are apparently a Norse god taking human form who can smash buildings to pieces using his mighty hammer. Either that or the economy is so bad that off-world colonies have to be built out of polystyrene and biscuits. Red Faction's recurring gimmick is Destructo Scenery. The first game made a big thing of its Geomod technology that let you destroy enough terrain to fill theoretically unlimited pairs of Steve McQueen's trousers for about five minutes, then they locked you in a bunch of immovable metal corridors for the rest of the game to chew in vain upon the rivets. Now Red Faction Guerrilla takes the opposite route, the terrain stays right where it is and all the buildings are put together with Pritt stick and string. They start you off in a big tutorial adventure playground with some explosives, the hammer of Mjolnir and a simple two word objective, go nuts. And I did go nuts and it was good. There's something almost primordially fun about knocking a tower's supports out and watching it collapse into expensive bits. It's like it directly stimulates that part of the brain that made you jump on your brother's sandcastle. The physics are a bit wonky though and a two story building can often be holding itself up on nothing but two breadsticks and a sponge pudding and still won't collapse until the very moment you walk your stupid ass underneath it. But hey, it's the future, right? After that, a load of boring plot happened and I was let into the real game, and still brimming with Viking rage, my first instinct was to see what effect Mjolnir would have on the nearest human being. For the first blow, they just told me to stop arsing around, and on the second, their spine snapped neatly in half. Ha! Teach him to tell me what to do. But then a little message came up saying that my morale had gone down. No, it fucking hadn't, Red Faction Gorilla. Now get out of the way so I can break all your stuff. My feeling is that the game kicks off putting you in the wrong mindset, letting you off the leash only to quickly yank back on the choke chain. Here is our world, it seems to say. It has a lot of things that are fun to destroy. Here are some fun toys to destroy them with, but don't have too much fun because if you do, we will stomp on your face. Oh, there is plenty to destroy, there are even reasons to destroy most of it, but things keep getting under your feet. It seems you only have to break a window to make a thousand troops with tanks burst out from every rock, and they let you
let you carry enough ammo to worry maybe half a scout troop. And it seemed like after doing absolutely anything, I had to keep running back to base to restock ammo and shake off the cops. Other rebels can join you, but you can't control when that happens. At one point while driving somewhere, I accidentally broke a lamppost and a bunch of rebels assumed I'd started the insurgency and began gunning down the filth. I was terribly embarrassed. And of course, they die very easily and you lose morale when they do. I can see why I was able to become the iconic hero of the revolution two hours after joining it, because clearly before me, all the revolution did was stand around with their thumbs up their butts. I found the best way to survive was to stay in a vehicle for as long as possible, ploughing right into your objectives, but the terrain becomes so strewn with debris, it's very easy to get stuck. It's like driving through post-nuclear Hiroshima right after the pubs close. But here comes the Count of Monte Cristo-esque twist in my planned revenge against Red Faction, because it's by the same developers as Saints Row 2, to which I recently got engaged. And sometimes Guerrilla feels like a Saints Row 2 palette swap with a washed out filter and cardboard scenery. It's even got that side mission where you ride shotguns spraying poo on buildings, only now the poo explodes. But if it is a palette swap of Saints Row 2, they also swapped out the colour, the variety, the uniqueness, and everything else I wrote about in that overlong wedding proposal disguised as a review. Guerrilla could have worked if it had actually been about sneaky, subtle guerrilla warfare rather than driving a monster truck into someone's front room and shooting them in the face, which is less guerrilla and more chimpanzee. Recently we received a mail from someone whose name I forget, explaining that they were going to stop watching Zero Punctuation. I don't remember their exact wording, but it went something like, I am an absolute cretin who can't tell a good thing from a stick up my ass, and I'm obviously very passive aggressive as well, but mainly it's because you keep ragging on my beloved Wii. So I guess I've got terrible taste and I'm probably also a paedophile, and I guess whoever he was at a point. I do tend to overstate that the Wii is a shiny white spunk bubble swelling out from between the yellow teeth of a crack whore, so in the name of winning back my lost audience, this review of Wii Sports Resort will contain nothing but absolute praise and possibly some child pornography. Woo yay, Wii Sports Resort! Now poor people can play Wii instead of going going on real holiday. Also woo yay, we motion plus. It only took three years for the fucking thing to start doing what it was always supposed to do, but living in the past is for squares, daddy-o. And when you slide the Wiimote erotically into the flexible rubber sheath and push the attachment into the moist quivering slot, you too will sprout a big fat hard-on for the Wii's rebirth. There's still a little response delay, so you better hope your reflexes work about a quarter of a second before you think they do, but there is now full one-to-one -one motion control, which I'm sure will be of great interest to all the third-party developers as they program their mandatory Wii won't waggle quick time events. There's really no other way to review a collection of minigames besides going through them all, so let's take them in no particular order. Wii wakeboarding. You wave the Wiimote around to do tricks while you're in the air and don't get points unless it's level when you re-enter the water, and in a truly innovative bit of game design, the actual levelness of the controller only counts about 50% of the time. A complex and sophisticated analogy for the brutality and unfairness of everyday life. Wii Sword Play. The Wii Motion Plus really makes a difference and the technology could be sensitive enough to be a perfect fencing simulator. It could be, but it isn't. And good thing too, because who the fuck wants to be a fencer, bunch of hoity-toity cunts with sieves on their faces? You'll pretty much just end up randomly flailing the controller around like Jackson Pollock with a scorpion on the end of his paintbrush, and it's nice to see Nintendo keeping things accessible to victims of neurological diseases. Wii Golf! It's the same golf that was in the first Wii Sports, because why fix what isn't broke, right? And indeed, why not repackage and resell what isn't broke to add another sprinkling of pennies to the official Nintendo money pile? Wii Basketball! Hold up the Wiimote and flick it, just like flicking a real basketball. At that point, where exactly the basketball goes is left up to the ineffable machinations of fate, but hey, you don't want skilled players making everyone else feel inadequate, those pricks. Wii Frisbee! This actually unironically works pretty well, and is therefore uninteresting to talk about, but it'll be good practice for when you are flinging all your other games into the nearest bin. We power cruising. It's just jet skiing, although it sounds like some kind of business executive euphemism for soliciting prostitutes. You hold the controllers out and rev the Wiimote to go faster, and it controls just like a real jet ski if it had both its handlebars broken off and was sitting on a gravel driveway. We table tennis, or more accurately, we tennis again. Please refer to comments regarding Wii Golf, but I can confirm that a table has gotten involved. We air sports. Say what you like about Nintendo, they pick a theme and then diligently stick to it, because dogfighting in biplanes is an increasingly popular pastime at beach resorts, particularly ones in the South Pacific, so 1943. We Archery. Again, this one unironically works pretty well. The motions have as much in common with archery as it does with playing an accordion sideways, but the arrows are pointy and the targets are soft, and that's all you can ask, really. We Cycling. This one works by rotating the controllers as you would the pedals of a bike. It will come extremely naturally to anyone who has completely the wrong idea of how a bike is supposed to work. Making turns also feels very natural when you have to rotate your phantom handlebars while also doing the spastic hand jive. We Bowling. Oh, fuck off. We Canoeing. I've always felt games that challenge the player based on skill or reflexes are old news. Now it's all about games that test one's willingness to embarrass oneself. This could apply to virtually anything on this list, but canoeing probably deserves the prize for the spazziest of the spazzy flails. In all seriousness, Wii Sports Resort is mostly functional, and you could probably have a lot of fun playing it with friends or some children you intend to molest. But I oppose it because I see what it represents, a dead end. Your motion sensor could have full one-to-one -one control and incorporate a 22-function Swiss Army knife, but that won't change the fact that without physical feedback, motion controls are unimmersive. In the long run, they can only hope to sucker in casual gamers with teaspoon shallow mini-games like Wii Sports, the gaming equivalent of the cartoon cinemas used to play before the film. I say stop buying the Wii, fuck Project Natal up the arse, and maybe this whole motion sensor trend can fuck off and make room for the next innovation. Like cyberspace. Or a controller made of fruit. Well, diddle my dog. Who would have thought when I first put two little white dots on a black spiky thing that it and I would today be celebrating our 100th video?
So to mark this occasion, I will be reviewing a game very close to my heart, Call of Juarez Bound in Blood. Well, alright, this was the game I had lined up to review anyway, but what the fuck do you want from me? It's just a number. 101 is also a number, as is 99, and 99 at least looks a bit like someone getting bum fucked. But Call of Juarez is still sort of special because I genuinely do feel like I have a spiritual bond with the Wild West. I wear an old fashioned hat, I once ate a horse, and I never wash. Bound in Blood is a prequel to the first Call of Juarez, and no, for some reason I cannot pronounce Juarez any other way, and follows the adventures of three brothers, Ray, Thomas, and William, who lose their mama and homestead and decide to dedicate their lives to ticking off everything on the Western story checklist. Outlaws, sheriffs, noble injuns, evil backstabbing Mexicans, gunfights, showdowns, chairs being smashed over people's heads, and a spicy undercurrent of homoeroticism. And in true Western tradition, your level of badassness is dictated by the size of your hats. Ray and Thomas both wear big hats and therefore eat danger and shit bullets. William doesn't get a hat, so the best he can hope for is to eat Weetabix and shit healthily. Together they search for a cursed Aztec treasure and fight over the affections of a redoubtable Mexican lady with that uncanny spaghetti Western love interest talent for almost getting raped by everyone she meets. Seriously, leave this bint alone in a waiting room for now and she'll find a way to get raped by the chair. The game is based mainly around shooting and is viewed from the first person perspective and someone should really come up with a name for that. At the start of each mission you choose which of the two effectual brothers you want to play as and the AI will control the other. As Thomas you can shoot more accurately, throw lassos and climb ledges and as Ray you can open the pause menu, restart the mission and choose Thomas instead, you fucking idiot. Ray takes less damage but health regenerates anyway so it hardly matters and he can dual wield pistols which means having twice as many weapons you have to stop and reload every 15 nanoseconds. It probably wouldn't surprise you to learn that a shooter with two central playable characters has a co-op mode, which is why it is surprising that it doesn't. Okay, there are a few missions where the brothers are separated, but even so, the opportunity was standing on a piano with its trousers down and they couldn't have missed it harder. They could even have had three-way co-op, let the third guy play as William. Press X to hide, press triangle to quote Bible, right trigger to poo pants. The trouble I often have with Western games is that historical accuracy demands that the guns all be absolute shite, and indeed running and gunning with most of the tools Call of Juarez hands out will leave you with so many bullets stuck in your face that you look like a renegade Cenobite. The emphasis is instead on cover based accurate shooting, yet another reason to never use Ray. And thankfully you take cover just by moving up to it, rather than the Gears of War method of pressing a button that velcros your spine to the wall. It feels kind of like a rail shooter with the tracks torn up if that makes any sense. You spend most of the combat hiding in a box, popping out the shoot at heads as they peer quizzically over cover like wooden ducks. But enemies are so crap and your health regenerates so fast that the veteran fans of shooters will probably find the combat a bit unchallenging if they can avoid drooling into their controller long enough to formulate an opinion. But then comes the showdown minigame, which is thrown into the chapters where they didn't feel like putting in a proper boss fight, which is every chapter. You have to sidestep around the enemy, keeping your hand next to your holster with the analogue stick, then when the bell rings, the first one to draw and fire a magical regeneration cancelling insta-kill bullet wins. It's alright at first, but towards the end the baddies can draw so fast I could only win by counting the seconds until the bell rang and starting to draw an instant beforehand. You have to do this with every major bad guy in the story, so what, we've been shooting each other all week, killing so many of each other's friends that our mutual Christmas card lists now fit on post-it notes, and now you want a fair fight. Why do I have to go along with this? Why can't I just press a button marked fuck off that makes my idiot brother sneak up behind them and smash a chair over their head. There's nothing wrong with the game being linear, but Bound in Blood doesn't agree and does everything it can to disguise its linear nature. The levels are huge and sprawling and actually look really pretty. If it were a character it would probably get raped at some point. There are even a couple of mini sandbox levels where you can either do some optional missions or go straight onto the next bit of story, but there's no way to come back and after two of them the game just shrugs its shoulders and tosses the whole concept. For the most part the action follows a strictly linear path, generally indicated by your tarred AI brother standing on the next objective and yelling at you. Progress is made by staying close to your NPC allies for long enough for them to remember what they're supposed to be doing, but the levels are big and demand exploration, and at one point I had to restart a mission in the mountains because deviating from the trail to play with some dead Indians apparently upset Ray's pathfinding, so he sat at the start of the level, sulking and waiting for me to apologise. This may surprise you, but- <laughs> Sorry. Call of Juarez is actually a good game. I've had a lot of stuff to complain about, but there's a lot to like, too. The shooting ultimately works, and the story and setting are surprisingly well realised. I know for a fact there's at least one guy at Rockstar who'll be disappointed, because he was hoping I'd totally bag it out and clear the way for their upcoming Red Dead Redemption thing. But hey, if that's good too, maybe we could have another of those cross-dressing art competitions. And if not, second place isn't so bad. It's just a number after all. Like, say, for example, 100. <laughs> No. No, 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 no. I can't do this. It's been too soon since Wii Sports Resort. I'm just going to say a load of things like how you could hollow out the Wii and fill it with beetles and very few people would notice. And frankly, it's getting boring even for me. I need something manly and hardcore, lots of small metal objects flying through the squishier of a monster's body parts. But, cry the munchkins, the conduit is a hardcore FPS that's really good for a Wii game. It's got lots of positive reviews and its balls are gently bumping my chin even as we speak. The five words that jump out of me there are good for a Wii game. I'm reminded of when Sarah Palin was said to have exceeded expectations in the vice presidential debates. It's only because the bar was set so 
fucking lowered snag on a limbo dancer's clip piercing. Well, since we all know it's coming, let's just get it over with first. Yes, the conduit's gameplay is marred by the limitations of the Wii controller. There's the usual immersion-breaking spastic jerks for melee attacks and grenade lobbing, but veteran Wii owners' wrists are probably all now hardened into pure cartilage, so that won't matter so much. But the aiming. Oh, the aiming. Pointing at the screen to shoot is the standard Wii FPS model, but the only way to turn is to aim to the size, and since the Wii mode only works when it's pointed directly at the screen, you stop turning if you aim too far, which is very unhelpful when a slime beast is latched onto your ear. There's a quick turn button, but if the enemy is 90 degrees to your side, then turning 180 degrees just puts you right back where you started, doesn't it? And if you're not going to let us look all the way up, pitting us against flying targets or ceiling-mounted enemy spawners is just cruel, like holding a Mars bar out of the reach of a wheelchair-bound Alaskan retard. All of this could have been saved by the Wii Motion Plus, of course, but it was not to be, because the relationship between Nintendo and third-party developers is equivocal to the relationship between James Spader and Mackie Gyllenhaal in the movie Secretary. Look it up! I read in the gaming journals that the conduit uses special technology that makes it look as good as games on the PS3 and Xbox, then I waited a few minutes for the punchline, but apparently they were serious. To put it charitably, the game is fucking ugly. This isn't even because of the Wii. I've seen better looking Wii games, and even GameCube games. This is more on the level of a PS2 that someone's trodden on. I can't remember the last time I saw a game depict a skyline by painting one on a wall and erecting it a few feet away from the window. That's shit I'd expect from a Tex Murphy game, and Christ, this is turning into a good review for obscure references, isn't it? The levels are uninspired grind boxes. I swear one mission ran me through the same office and stairwell five times, and most of the weapons are over-designed Fisher-Price toys that unsatisfyingly pew-pew-pew their way through legions of slavering cliches. But graphics aren't as important as a good story well told, right? The Conduit story is unique in that it's barely fucking there and at the same time virtually impenetrable. Aliens invade Washington and you are the only one who can stop them, sums it up. And they're obviously here for the sightseeing tour because most of the levels take place in well-known government buildings. But hold on, go back a bit. Why am I the only one who can stop them? They seem to be quite receptive to normal bullets in the squishy parts. Where are the armed forces? Come to think of it, where are the civilians? Modern day Washington DC gets swapped out for the post-apocalypse over the course of about a day. None of this is explained. There's some interplanetary conspiracy between aliens and some secret government departments that are apparently running things, but that's honestly all I can be certain of. In place of cinematics, we have pre-mission telephone conversations between the main character and his puppeteers before being dumped right into another infested tourist hotspot to kill a few dozen mutants arranged in single file. The scrolly text screens from Doom were better storytelling than this. But who needs a story when the gameplay is what matters, right? The sole element the conduit can claim as a unique gameplay mechanic is a glorified flashlight that reveals invisible locking mechanisms, essentially doing nothing but adding an extra phase to the press button open door routine. Don't worry if you're not keen on scavenger hunts though, because the presence of a nearby invisible thing is helpfully indicated by the soundtrack going while you're still trying to clear the room with those fucking insidious scuttlefuck spawners. And then when you think you've cleared the room and put your weapon away to shut the fucking thing up, lo and behold, there was another monster spawner on the ceiling you couldn't see because you can't look up. You also can't move faster than a brisk stroll, and you scream and lose health if you stand within six feet of a fire, leading me to conclude that your character was recruited from a home for the elderly. It's fitting that its signature device is a sphere, because the conduit appears to have cut so many corners that it metaphorically resembles one. The levels are standard and repetitive, boss monsters are shamelessly copy-pasted to swell the enemy ranks, the music consists of nothing but obnoxious five-second loops, and of course it ends on a cliffhanger without the slightest promise of a sequel, which I'm putting at the top of a list of game design deadly sins. The most delicious irony is that I suspect a lot of these crusts were trimmed in order to accommodate the improved graphics technology I didn't even fucking notice. And to what end? So that a Wii game can be judged by the same standards as PS3 and Xbox games? Trust me, that's the very last thing the Wii needs. Low standards are the only thing that allow its few hardcore titles a free ride, but if that's what it wants, by the standards of current day gaming, the conduit is a pile of sodden cereal boxes held together with string, and I would sooner recommend nailing your tongue to a subway train. My infrequent habit of pausing mid-rant to drop to my knees and wrap my lips around old favourite titles of mine is well established, and over the last two years, Silent Hill 2 has barely had time to wipe my saliva off week to week. I guess I've been saving this for a special occasion, but what could be more special than my 102nd video? <laughs> Sorry. You see, Silent Hill 2 isn't just a game I think is good. Silent Hill 2 is the game I replay every now and again to remind myself that for all the shiny brown quick time event RPG element Space Marines, gaming is still worth defending. If I were Batman, Silent Hill 2 would be my murdered parents, if you see what I mean. And the strangest thing about it is, from a cold critical non-gushy standpoint, the actual gameplay aspect of Silent Hill is kind of shitty. Combat feels like pulling your own teeth out, but then the main characters of the first four games are respectively a writer, a clerk, a teenage girl and a twat, so they're not really supposed to be close combat powerhouses, but I know they can't all have inner ear infections and the camera swings dizzily around like an elastic flail. Most of the puzzles involve looking for various interpretations of keys, for various interpretations of doors, and a lot of them only make sense in unique adventure game logic. There's a bit in Silent Hill 2 where you run around gathering a lighter, a wax doll and a horseshoe to make a new handle for a trapdoor, all the while obliviously lumping around at least 15 extremely cumbersome ways you could have prized it open. No, intuitive gameplay isn't Silent Hill's strong point, we're here to get our story on. Silent Hill 1 set the scene, a resort is built on a spot where a lot of people have been mean to a lot of other people over the years and subsequently has an alarming tendency to shift into evil foggy versions of itself, then a 
load of doofuses run around trying to stop an evil cult from summoning a dark god and ruining the tourist trade, but being on the PS1 it now looks like an arse made out of Lego and the level of doofy the doofuses exhibited make it hard to take seriously. Silent Hill 2 was smart enough to realise that the only character worth expanding on from that shower was the town itself, so it took the basic concept of an evil town where you can't use a microlides and took it in a new direction. Now the town had always had some dark power behind it and the events of the first game had just let it come out of its shell somewhat, so having freed itself from the first rack of doofuses it was now ready to knuckle down and really start fucking with some heads. The chief head fuck recipient for Silent Hill 2 is James Sunderland, a man also not above doofus behaviour. He gets a letter from his wife telling him to come to Silent Hill and pick her up, but they've been estranged for three years on account of her being dead, so he's understandably confused. He's even more confused when he gets there and finds that the whole town is trying to kill him, and those bits of it that aren't appear to be trying to sex him up. There is absolutely nothing physical stopping him from running straight back to his car and going home, maybe picking up a hooker or two on the way back, but he refuses to. He really does give the impression of having nothing else to live for, so he's probably one of those clingy types with no friends, and I guess he spent the last three years banging his head against a wall. But in the ranks of game characters, James has a special place in my heart. His voice acting is on the usual level for this sort of thing, somewhere between midget height and 50 feet below sea level, but he's complex and tragic and determined and wouldn't be caught dead pressing X to not die. So if Silent Hill 2 story and character make up for dodgy gameplay, why couldn't it just have been a book, or a film, or a Zoe trope rather than a game? Because what it does best, and better than any other game I know, is atmosphere, and that wouldn't work as well in an uninteractive medium, as Christoph Gans discovered to his smelly baguette eating cost. The atmosphere is like a foot thick sheet of whale blubber draped over your head and shoulders. It's the antithesis of Silent Hill Homecoming's noisy, frenetic, slime beast hoedown. This is the oppressive, crushing dread of being truly alone. Most of the time the town feels totally devoid of life, even the monsters feel more like wind-up toys than living things. The few humans you find are universally unreliable, behaving in subtly off ways as if they're not seeing the same things you are. All the other Silent Hills had at least one normal human sidekick whose job it was to stumble about making confused noises like Bwur? But here it's mostly just you, James, and a big cold haunted town. And after a while you start to wonder which one of the three is James' is biggest enemy. You see, Silent Hill 2 is very good at telling a story without words. Everything is drenched in symbolism. The basic monsters are all suspiciously effeminate, with the exception of Pyramid Head, in his first appearance before he totally sold out, an uber-masculine powerhouse repeatedly seen plunging his massive throbbing knife into the other monsters' moist, quivering bodies, which obviously symbolises neoconservative imperialism. You start to think that James' his nightmare might be entirely of his own creation, as if the town is just handing him a set of jump leads and watching as he sticks them on his balls. It's a fascinating voyage of pain and despair that leaves you emotionally drained and satisfied, like fucking a burning dolphin. Silent Hill 3 had some great moments, but made the mistake of continuing the story of the Silent Hill 1 doofus brigade. Silent Hill 4 was more interesting, but the gameplay design misstepped so hard that both its femurs burst out of its legs and rocketed off into the sky, and Origins and Homecoming were the crushingly bland butter sandwiches to Silent Hill 2's glorious meatball footlong. The upcoming Silent Hill Shattered Memories claims that it will have a psychological test at the start and adjust its content accordingly in order to really get into the player's head. Interesting, but it's worth remembering that Silent Hill 2 managed that without needing such a gimmick, with just a doofus, a stick with a nail in, and a big lad with trigonometry for a face. 2.5D is a term that infuriates geometrists, and it's had a couple of definitions in the history of gaming. It used to refer to 90s FPSs like Doom that weren't actually 3D despite the claims of Wolfenstein and Duke Nukem, but instead cobbled together an illusion of 3D using 2D planes, mirrors, and body doubles. That technology now sits alongside voxels and Mode 7 beneath the swamps of obsolescence, so 2.5D now refers to games with graphics fully rendered in 3D but gameplay controlled solely along a 2D axis. It's proved a popular avenue for smaller and newer developers because it lets them make use of the 3D animation degrees that their dads paid so much money for, and it means there's a whole wall they don't have to render. I'd like to talk about two recent 2.5D games, frankly because what the fuck else is there to talk about before the Christmas pre-releases, starting with Apostrophe Splosion Man on that wretched hive of scum and villainy, the Xbox Live Arcade. And as I've come to expect from the Kisbla, the game is refreshingly simple. You are an insane, constantly burning man escaping from a laboratory who possesses the ability to generate explosions without damaging himself. Okay, maybe it's not that simple. I find the character Explosion Man intriguing. Is he a conjuration of scientific folly whose madness stems from haunting existential uncertainty, or was he once human and now erects a giggling facade to conceal the wrenching internal sadness he feels for what he has lost? The game's answer to these questions is a resolute who gives a shit, now butcher your fellow man in a consequence-free environment, you pussy. It's nice to see simplicity in game design, and Explosion Man could only be simpler if it were Sugar Cube on the end of a cocktail stick. You only have one button, or rather four buttons that all do the same thing. To jump you explode, to deflect missiles you detonate, to throw levers you spontaneously combust. That's about it. But simple doesn't mean the same thing as easy. Well, okay, it does, but shut up. What I'm getting at is that the game very quickly becomes unforgiving, with timed crushy spike wall gauntlets after unavoidable stun lock shoves into boiling acid requiring absolutely perfect timing, and if you die over and over at a particular checkpoint, the game will pop up a window suggesting that perhaps you'd like to skip this level, which I found quite aggravating. Yes, maybe I'll skip this level, then I'll eat a few French fancies and maybe take a lovely scented bath to clean my massive vagina. Now get out the fucking way, this shit will not beat me. Explosion Man puts me in mind of N plus Crossford Portal, and then Crossford Portal a few more times until very little of N plus remained. It's set in a futuristic 
realistic laboratory like the one in Portal, but it doesn't get suspicious until you find your first cake. There's one on every level you can get for extra points, which is obviously way better than Portal, which just had the one, and even that one was of questionable status. And you remember how Portal memorably featured a jaunty song with quirky lyrics? Splosion Man has three. I appreciate that you have to do whatever it takes to stand out in the indie market, but Splosion Man really is trying too hard. Like an insecure man who goes to work in bright green trousers so that people will pay attention to him if only for long enough to tell him to change his stupid green trousers. I guess jumping around with explosions is fun once you have the timing down, but the one thing they should have ripped off from Portal was its appropriate length. There are 50 levels and they run out of ideas around number 23, leaving the rest of it to potter about in sameness. I guess it might be worth the price if they bundled it with something cool, like a frog. Anyway, the other game I have pinned to my special 2.5D dissection table is Trine on Steam and PlayStation Network. This is a far more sober affair, set in the time of legends, meaning the usual couple of square miles dug out of J.R.R. Tolkien's back garden. Through a contrived series of coincidences, a thief, a wizard and a knight all touch a magic MacGuffin at the same time, and now they're stuck together in one body, switching between the three forms where necessary, but they can still talk amongst themselves, and it is a little disquieting to see a beautiful female rogue speaking in a voice like Brian Blessed. Each character has their own special skills, the thief can swing on ropes in a way that makes her skirt fly pleasingly up, the wizard can conjure simple solid objects because he's got access to the level editor, and the knight can use a sword and shield, although for some stupid reason he points his shield at the mouse pointer rather than the direction he's facing, something which took me a few axe blades to the cod piece to figure out. Trine is best described as a physics platformer in that half the platforms are on hinges and seesaws, and you must combine jumping, swinging, and magically conjured physics objects to fabricate a way across the levels, and the key phrase of Trine is, was I supposed to do that? After climbing onto a high ledge by way of stacked boxes for the umpteenth time, I'll take a look back at the various other physics objects and rotating platforms scattered around, and wonder if somewhere out there I'm making a puzzle designer cry. The thought gets even more nagging later on when the wizard gets the ability to create floating platforms, because then I was just breezing over every hazard like I've got fucking no clip on. And most of the big boss monsters I found I could kill by standing somewhere out of their reach and shooting them repeatedly in the face. I asked myself, is this bad design or am I just that good? Anyway, the characters are nicely rounded and the gameplay is generally entertaining, so it's worth a look. If you could imagine the lost Vikings knocking up Little Big Planet, then the internet has clearly desensitized you to retarded sexualization. Having survived on table scraps for several years, the 90s adventure game tradition is enjoying a bit of a resurgence on PC. The Steam listings are getting quite bloated with a nouveau adventure stuff like Sherlock Holmes vs Cthulhu and Nancy Drew meets Mecha Godzilla. It's like having polished off the buffet at Mr PC's house, hardcore action titles are now mostly moved on to Mr Console's homestead and given adventure games a chance to shoulder their way onto a chair just in time for the sherry trifle. And if adventure games are coming back, then Monkey Island's reappearance was inevitable because if adventure games were a nation, Monkey Island would be on the fucking one dollar bill. The second instalment of the new Tales of Monkey Island episodes recently came out, so I will review them in two ways. Firstly, as a fan of the old series, in my normal voice, and secondly by their own merits in a ridiculous Irish accent. Monkey Island was part of my childhood, I had the first two on my Amiga, don't suppose you embryos would remember those times when a game like Monkey Island 2 came on 12 floppy disks and playing it was like operating an old fashioned switchboard. The first two games are still timelessly imaginative, sparkling and very very funny and therefore have no place in this review. The problem with the later instalment is the usual one that occurs when a series has been in cryogenics for a few years, that the new developers are almost always fans who in their eagerness to show respect for their beloved franchise prefer to lavish it in tongue baths in place of any significant evolution. In the second episode of Tales of Monkey Island, a character whistles a snatch of music from Monkey Island 2, which might have been kind of cool if he had not then said, Gee, I wonder where that music's from. Hmm <laughs> hmm, wink wink, slurp slurp, tongue bath. I'm reminded of a cat showing affection to its owner by gobbing a dead bird onto his rug. Oh, Faith and Begora, look at this lovely pirate game I've honestly never heard of. You play a pirate named Goybrush Threepwood. God, what a silly name. Who accidentally releases an evil plague upon all his pirate chums or something. I wasn't really paying attention because I was thinking about potatoes at the time. Sadly, the situation can't be resolved by murder, like with most games and Protestants. So the gameplay revolves around exploration, dialogues, and harvesting every loose object from the four corners of the map and rubbing them all against everything else. Have to say, I'm not a big fan of the push me pull your mouse movement controls. As I was saying to my wife Moira the other day, navigating a 3D environment with a 2D interface is like standing outside the living room window and trying to teach your dog to do his poos on the newspaper. Guybrush Threepwood, named after a combination of a PG Woodhouse character and a deluxe paint file extension, was made out in the original games as a lovable every lad whose determination to be a pirate was strong enough to overpower his weakness, incompetence, hopeless naivety, and svelte girlish figure. In this new series, he often seems quite alarmingly competent, which comes to a head in one particularly cringeworthy episode when he meets his number one fan, who breathlessly lists his achievements throughout the series and paints the words Author Surrogate across the sky in blazing green letters. All characters are free to develop, but in a story that sells itself on wit, a status upgrade can be all that changes a lovable underdog into a smug, wise King Tosser. Oh, shiver me shamrocks, there's some clever puzzle solving to be had here, to be sure. The zenith is where you get strapped to a chair and use various signalling devices to instruct a small monkey. But the clever bits are in a minority, and there's no over reliance on puzzles no more complex than finding a weird shaped key to put into a corresponding hole, which I think is cheating a bit. What is this, Resident Evil? And the inventory system is a bit poor. If you want to combine items, and when you're stuck and have rubbed every item you have on every static object in the world, this is all you have left. You have to go to the little square dancer, drag and bought items into a little combining machine, and pressing the on button. Don't see why we can't just click one, then the other. Seems like that would save me some time, which I could have spent beating me wife. The action takes 
takes place over several islands, and they all feel rather empty, with most of the important objects and characters crammed together in one location. In episode 2, you need to find bait and get your ship repaired, and on one island you find a bait and ship repair shop. It's lazy design dressed up as a joke that doesn't even make sense, like putting a fake moustache on a cat's arse. God, what am I on about? Well, speaking of laziness, I genuinely thought that the three identical characters on the first island would turn out to be a joke, like they're all the same fellow wearing different clothes, but no, it turns out they're just all based on the same model and I wasn't supposed to notice. The graphics in the early games were about as realistic as the low resolution could get, lending the humour a more subversive quality that I feel the more cartoony art style diminishes. That might sound like an elitist old bee reaching for excuses, and that's probably because it is. Tales of Monkey Island certainly has its moments, and it's ultimately harmless, but really, what is the point of it? Monkey Island 2 was tight enough to stand alone as a classic, and even attempted to end in a way that would ensure no more sequels, because everything after that would be a slimy white burst of fan wank circling the shower drain. And if you really loved the franchise, you'd understand that. Okay, it was a bit sad, but some stories need sad endings. Would Romeo and Juliet have been greatly improved by a sequel where they both spring to life and go on a motorcycle tour of the Mediterranean? Sadly, we live in a world where some people cannot be dissuaded from bad ideas, like spending half a review doing an offensively bad accent. Guinness, Leprechauns, Rosa Tralee, etc. Wolfenstein. Christ, we've been getting big-headed lately, haven't we? Not Wolfenstein 2, or Wolfenstein Revenge of the Man with the Chocolate Box Concealed in His Hairdo, just Wolfenstein. It's like what they did with Star Trek, Friday the 13th, The Final Destination. What, did some kind of apocalypse happen while I wasn't looking and now everything has to reset? You know what future historians will say about us, right? There were two very different games within the same 20-year period, both called Wolfenstein, and the second one was not, strictly speaking, a remake of the first. From this we conclude that the people of the early 21st century were taking the piss. It feels weird to call it generic, since this is the franchise that practically invented the genre, but Wolfenstein, the new one that is, subscribes to so many of the cliches of current generation action games that it's like the spy who loved me of FPSs. It's so obnoxiously safe and committee designed that any attempt to critique it in my normal manner would be equally as dull. That's why I've decided to review it in limerick form. In the tumultuous time before D-Day, there once was a man named BJ, with chocolate box hair and a face like a bear and a jacket he picked up on eBay. He was out one day murdering Germans as they tried to enact London's burning. He beat up some dudes and broke missile tubes so their boat got blown up, that'll learn them. But while there he made the discovery that the Nazis had powers like no other -y. He brought back a bangle with some mystical angle to which the Allies responded, oh buggery. At the secret service of Queen Lizzie, BJ's bosses find themselves in a tizzy, so they stand up and shout, BJ sort this all out, we do it ourselves but we're busy. So he's sent to a big German town where some serious shit's going down, there's an active resistance in need of assistance and everything's gone greyish brown. It soon becomes clear that the city's been invaded by occult committees mystical preachers and slavering creatures and gymnasts with stonking great titties. You may wonder if this is a sequel to some past Wolfenstein or a prequel depicting our hero in a previous era when he wasn't looked upon as an equal. It's actually meant to succeed Return to Castle Wolfenstein's lead, which is pretty damn slow because that was eight years ago and the memories have gone stale indeed. The new Wolfenstein seeks to enthrall with an ongoing high-octane brawl, but it's a game about war that we've all seen before and that just like the title adds fuck all. Any pretense of freshness is gone at the very outset of stage one. You escape your pursuers via underground sewers, so we start as we mean to go on. Your gun is of course your best friend, on which you must always depend. When you get into fights, you can lock down the sights and bullets come out of the end. Weapon choice doesn't start too exciting, two machine guns, a rifle for sniping, but later on, BFGs coming with guarantees to shoot various flavours of lightning. There are soldiers all over the place, who can't take two shots to the face, but before you force corn, they always respawn at a pretty disquieting pace. You don't need to worry about health if you're retarded and lousy at stealth, just get behind cover if you're in a bother and it'll all come back by itself. It won't help you avoid the bum rape later on when you get into scrapes with powerful blasters and big armored bastards with weak points the size of a grape. To help out you have on your side, magic spells that some crystals provide. On the appropriate queue, the world turns greenish blue, so it looks like your monitors died. You can take down the big lads in minutes, start a fight with ten men and still win it, make your weapons divine or just use bullet time, which wasn't that great when Max Payne did it. But the powers are hard to sustain, your magic is too swiftly drained, in the middle of a fight you'll end up in the shite and will suffer a whole world of pain. And in between all of the shooting, you also must think about looting, because if you want to upgrade, someone has to be paid and the shopkeepers don't like free booting. Why do all games need upgrading elements, even ones where it isn't quite relevant? It means all your big hitters start off in the shitter and your aim is unfirm and inelegant. So when you've extinguished the danger, you backtrack through all of the chambers, searching every last nook for cash and checkbooks, which you won't find much fun, I would wager. It transpires that the in-game reality has pretensions to non-linearity. The game says, on your bike, go wherever you like, as long as it's in this principality. But the freedom's a mere gilded cage that adds nothing to inspire or engage, it just means beating feet through the same boring streets just to get to the next fucking stage. There's very little to do except hunt for secrets and money up front, but the reward's pretty lame, all the streets look the same, and the bads keep respawning spawning the cunts. It's not a totally asinine sure, there are optional missions to score, but I went out of my way and found to my dismay that in total there's only like four. Guess the ultimate question is why should I even bother to try? Every last NPC fills me with apathy, am I expected to care when they die? I know what you're gonna say, Yahtzee you slick internet paparazzi! Surely it's always fun to stick the butt of a gun up the arse of a goose-stepping Nazi? Well if you like starting punch-ups in bars, or your head has been lodged up your arse, Wolfenstein may give at least some joy to Viv, otherwise don't bother, two stars. Like everyone else with the kind of social skills required to hang out on the internet, I love Batman. I adore him from his cute little pointy ears to his big stompy boots, and I especially love how he expects to be taken
taken seriously. I had my doubts about Arkham Asylum because it looked like a dark gritty game with scary horror elements and how can you have scary horror when you're Batman, ostensibly the most capable fictional character since Jesus, ooh edgy, and how can you have dark grittiness when you're Batman, a man who switches about in his underpants and a fabulous cape. This does feel like reaching for the low hanging fruit and Batman is nothing if not a low hanging fruit but I just love that bit in the Dark Knight when Gary Oldman and Aaron Eckhart are talking about bringing down the mob but it could almost be a scene from The Departed until Batman flounces in wearing pyjamas and a bucket on his head and no one bats an eye. But once I'd mentally adjusted for Batman's underpants I made the shocking discovery that Arkham Asylum is quite good, which probably won't be as shocking now that every other review has said the exact same thing but it really is, it's one of the rare games that balances stealth and action and makes them both equally fun. Where the stealth isn't just a frustrating game of grandmother's footsteps and the combat doesn't make me feel like I fucked up the stealth, Batman after all is a master at making even his fuck ups look like something he meant to do all along, the combat is controlled simply and animates beautifully, flowing seamlessly from punch to counter to eye watering heel kick to the chops with bone crunching, trouser tightening elegance and meanwhile hiding in the rafters tracking a quartet of thugs, picking them off one by one before pouncing onto the final terrified straggler holds all the appeal of following children home from school with none of the sex offender registration. But you don't call a sewage technician to redecorate your bathroom and you didn't come to me to hear about how a game is good, not when every other review's done that already. I could go on about how the combat flows and how the atmosphere's solid and how the highlights for me were the scarecrow sections where Batman's perceptions of reality are skewed in favour of a nightmarish introspective delusional glimpse into the darkest recesses of his soul and how jumping on people is cool, but I must always seek to stem my gushes constructively. For example, while it is cool to jump on people from high places, spreading your cape like a black and terrible flasher of the night, your cape fills such a massive portion of the screen as you're swooping down that it's hard to tell what you're jumping onto and whether or not they deserve it. Also, it's amazing how I only really care about auto run after it's been taken away. If I fail to hold down X every single time I move, Batman marches ridiculously around like a pompous sergeant major with a broomstick up his ass. I thought we'd perfected this technology, pushed the analog stick to run, push it halfway to walk. This would have also freed up a button that could have been used for, I don't know, the bat spank. Another tool in Batman's ass. And all is the detective vision. I guess you can't call it bat vision because that would just be a black screen. When it's turned on you can see enemies through walls, secrets, objectives and things that you can grapple onto so a pertinent question might be why would you ever want to turn it off? The pertinent answer would be because otherwise you'll see the whole game through a coloured filter and all the characters will be replaced by glowing teal skeletons and you might feel a bit guilty about all those artists who put so much work into not making the game look like a surreal radioactive skeleton fever dream. And then there are the boss fights if one can call them that. I expect more from a climactic encounter than just beating up legions of henchmen while their leader sits on top of a lamppost shouting encouragement. But but then this is the Batman mythos where half the villains are just gang leaders in gimp suits with no superpowers besides an amazingly good human resources department and any of them going toe to toe with Batman would end up with a perfectly flat surface where their face used to be. But even the fights with the actual superpowered ones aren't up to much, the absolute nadir of the whole game for me is an encounter in a sewer with Killer Croc which they spend the whole game hyping up and which consists of walking very slowly around a tedious labyrinth waiting for Croc to pop up whereupon you whack him back down with a single batarang in the manner of a dog owner wielding a rolled up newspaper. And then there's the fight with a roided up juggernaut fellow that's repeated something like 12 times which you win by, and I hope you're wearing a sturdy hat because this may blow your mind, sidestepping their charge so that they run into a wall. A gameplay mechanic that is only slightly less common than a fucking start button. Finally, the writing is, well it's not exactly terrible, but any game in which the line it's over is countered with the line I'm afraid it's only just begun isn't exactly going to astound the screenwriters guild. You might say I shouldn't expect too much from comic book writing, but what kind of excuse is that? Comic book writers do not undergo mandatory lobotomies. Was Watchmen just comic book writing? Was Schindler's List just a bunch of flickery lights on a wall? What I will blame on comic book writing is the fact that there's no closure, it all ends with disappointing inevitability with all status quo restored and all the big name villains drop down convenient holes so they can make their next guest appearance on Amazing Man Child number 165 or whatever. But after all that my complaints are still just minor fishes in a crust surrounding a very solid core and I can still recommend Arkham Asylum. Consider me a praiser by exception and that everything I don't mention is perfectly fine, which is why I should probably mention the box art. This is the pettiest gripe I've ever indulged but of all the colourful villains and visceral action this game has to offer the best they could come up with was Batman standing there with a look on his face like he forgot what he came in here for. Just goes to show, Batman is always the least interesting character in everything he's in. What can you do with a character who responds to everything by either punching it or deploying bat anti-thing spray? then punching it. Rhythm games are a bit of an indictment of our generation, aren't they? Why yes, I would like to clarify that position. We've never had a decent war to give us any sense of mutual achievement or confidence so we place anyone with the slightest talent or notoriety on ridiculous pedestals and tell ourselves we can never reach them because we're just so shit. And then rock band and guitar hero say yes, you are shit, real guitar's not in your league, all the shit will come off your shitty fingers and clog up the fretboard. But never mind, here's something that isn't much like playing real guitar but kind of looks like it and that's the best you could hope for isn't it you empty hopeless turd? Let me ask you something guitar hero, do you really want to create a generation surfing across mediocrity on a wave of 
thinky plonky plastic. And when the fuck are you going to license Stairway to Heaven? I'll admit the Beatles rock band's announcement caused me to have a little squirt. Maturing in the 90s, I was exposed mostly to stuff like the Spice Girls and Robson and Jerome and thought for the longest time that I just didn't like any music. But then I discovered the Beatles and realised that I was, in fact, the larval form of a classic rock snob. If there's any band I could still bear, even while their songs are being filtered through plinky plonky guitar rattles and the raucous caterwauling of a room full of early 20 somethings, it's the Beatles. But I'm forced to remind myself why I didn't like Guitar Hero Metallica and the whole concept of single band games. Surely the rock band model is intended for parties and its job is to supply a variety of songs for various bands and genres for maximum group appeal. And there will be people at a party who don't want to play the Beatles all bloody night. They'll be the ones who are drinking rubbing alcohol and trying to rape the cat. Guitar Hero 5, on the other hand, has a strong party focus. If it were a person, it would wear colourful sunglasses and communicate entirely through whoops and requests to borrow money. There's a party mode that plays random songs and lets you jump in at any time and all the songs are unlocked in quick play from the beginning. You might ask why you'd want to play through the career mode if that's the case. That would be a very good question. This aspect of Guitar Hero 5 really does phone it in and return the charges. I suppose if you want to pretend that you're Carlos Santana for a few brief, wonderful moments, or if you want to see the intro and outro cartoons, if you've got some kind of morbid desire to see what happens when an entire animation department have lost their will to live, and you'll unlock another bunch of brightly coloured venues full of the same three copy-pasted dudes who wobble about like they're all busting for a slash. But as always, it's all meaningless movement and colour you won't even look at because you must constantly stare at the notes until your own children start to resemble red and green lampshades. Beatles Rock Band's career mode raises a similar issue in that a lot of the songs have a colourful music video thing, with often quite elaborate production going on somewhere behind all the garish conveyor belts, but it is interesting to follow the Beatles' career all the way from a sweltering basement in England to a windy rooftop in England. Since the song order is based on release history rather than difficulty for once, the progression curve is wonky as fuck, and in one song it's monotonously bouncing your thumb off the strummer like a masturbating stroke victim, and the next it's rattling the buttons like you're trying to disentangle your hand from the udders of an excitable cow. But nevertheless, the Beatles were hardly the heaviest band in the world, so I breezed through the whole game five-starring every song on Expert. It's more of a memoriam to the band than any actual challenge. A very eclectic band that explored a variety of instruments, hence why the guitar track on one song sounded suspiciously like a cello. Come on, the controller's even smaller than a normal guitar, it's certainly not going to pass for one of those. Come to think of it, Guitar Hero 5 does the same thing, trying to sneak some keyboard sections under our frets. Cowards. Are there so few iconic guitar songs in the world that you have to pull shit like this? Of course not, it's just that they've all been used up by previous Guitar Hero games. How a Guitar Hero setlist usually works is one, you start off with some easy well-known classics to sucker us in, then two, you bridge the middle with lesser known stuff and sneak in a few complete unknowns while we're softened up, before three, dropping a few heavy classics on us for the big finish that will strip the flesh from our backs while we cry for more because we're bitches. Guitar Hero 5 gets as far as number two but knocks number three on the head in favour of extending its number two into a big brown coil. But even if it had been gold-plated Bowie from top to tails, what exactly does this game bring that couldn't have simply been added to Guitar Hero World Tour with downloadable content? Well, you can finally customise your band in single player so I can fulfil my dream of having a band consisting of three me's and one girl me. The in-game success and star power meters have been made harder to see because I always feel my eyesight grows stagnant when unchallenged. And of course the patch wouldn't give you the stimulating argument over which disc to put in every fucking time your mates come round. Still, Beatles Rock Band are certainly keen not to shoot their load too early. The set list features a rather barren 40-odd songs out of a library of 250, and while they aren't all hits, there's no Help, no Let It Be, no Eleanor Rigby, and no All You Need Is Love, although there has been released on DLC, and thus are the true colours revealed. I'm sure they'll be nickel and diming us for the good stuff until our udders turn black and fall off. Oh, but proceeds from All You Need Is Love go to charity, apparently. Or maybe I don't want to give to charity, maybe it's against my personal philosophy to acknowledge that there is good in human beings. Rereading this piece, I've made myself a little bit depressed. Why the hell do I still buy Guitar Hero games? Halfway through Guitar Hero 5, I suddenly realised I wasn't even listening to the music anymore. I just go into automatic with one eye on the score meter and everything else is just so much noise. I guess it's because as a gamer I live for a string of petty victories, and no victory comes pettier than from correctly pressing buttons in accordance with a big long rolling instruction sheet for retards. Some of you are now asking yourself what the hell is Darkest of Days, or has Yahtzee been fucked over by release dates again, or will alternative energy sources ever be sustainable, or what is the capital of Botswana, or why do nice girls hate me? To answer those questions in no particular order, no, self-esteem issues a little bit, an independent first person shooter available on Steam and Xbox 360, and Gabaroni. As for why I'm reviewing Darkest of Days, well would you believe it's because it's the first shooter I've encountered in years whose premise alone made me intrigued enough to buy it, rather than give me another reason to curse the existence of Halo and the ever-growing train of soporific bastard children that scamper around its legs pistol whipping and fucking each other, I just thought it would be nice to play a current gen FPS and actually be trying to like it for a change. You begin the game as arrow fodder in General Custer's army at the Battle of Little Bighorn, where you go through what is known in RPG circles as a supposed to lose fight. But seconds before whoopy arrow filled death, you are teleported to an agency in the far future which appears to consist of one room and about three guys. Apparently you are now free to act as a time travelling secret agent because the authorities of your time put you down as an MIA, and considering how every member of a given army in this game is totally identical, that's probably an easy mistake to make. Time travel is common in the future, and as with virtually everything else in the world, the tourists are spoiling it for everyone else. You're informed that your new job is to clean up after time-altering miscreants by infiltrating the armies of various historical battles and ensuring that things happen the way they were supposed to happen. Like Time Cop, but without the gratuitous naked bum scene. And your character is strangely okay with all this for someone who's been freshly wrenched from the 19th century, although he is a silent protagonist, so his new future bosses could just be mistaking compliance for absolute dumbfounded terror. When you're dealing with time travel, it's important to establish whose rules are in play. Is this 12 Monkeys rules where you can't change shit, or Back to 
to the future rules where you can change shit but the timeline is kind of easy going about it or terminator rules where you can change shit but then maybe you can't change shit and then you make a god awful tv series and christian bale yells at someone when history gets changed in darkest of days there's apparently enough leeway for you to pick it up on your future periscope and dispatch some armed agents to sort everything out with their magic time fixing bullets and even if they cock it up they can sort it out with more violence further down the line as long as the losers lose and the winners win it doesn't seem to matter it's an appealingly slapdash approach to time policing like a plumber who works with duct tape and string at the start your colleague makes clear the importance of sticking to dodgy period weapons but for reasons unclear to me he sometimes hands you an assault rifle and advises that history could probably survive you going peanut banana sandwich crazy for a few minutes and if you honestly don't see the appeal of mowing down the entire confederate army with an aim assisted automatic space gun then you should probably take a long hard look at what you're doing with your life the perplexingly named eight monkey labs make a big thing of their obsessive historical accuracy and original graphics engine the first one isn't my department i guess the civil war uniforms are accurate as far as i know but then they could have all been dressed up as klingons and they would have been accurate as far as i know i am fairly certain however that the union army didn't consist entirely of clones who transform into goose stepping paper cutouts if they get more than 50 yards away from you which brings me to the graphics engine it's like they took the kind of thing the total war games used for its real-time battle things and dropped you right in the middle of it with huge open maps and massive numbers of npcs all doing coordinated exercise routines with their 700 twin brothers it is nice to see something like this being used for something fun rather than some dry rts that appeals to middle managers who can no longer tell the difference between fun and microsoft access it looks fine if you don't examine too closely and overlook the fact that moving over terrain feels like you're riding a fucking hoverboard the gameplay is a string of disappointments lifting me up and knocking me down over and over again like it's playing guess who with my heart it makes itself out as a crisis style open-ended shooter where you can go anywhere on the map and pick your own method to meet the objective and for that reason it is going to hell for lying your objectives are always a strictly linear path often with waypoints marked out in case you suffer panic attacks if you aren't being steered around by the fucking nose every second of the day and any attempt to defy fate by fleeing over the hills to freedom which i feel would be a quite appropriate act of role play considering the circumstances will be met by bouncing painfully off one of the many invisible walls that infest the terrain i suppose a visible one would have been historically inaccurate would it and as for picking your own method your choices are pistol or rifle or turning off the game to punch yourself in the stomach it's occasionally suggested that you use stealth but there is none it's the old far cry problem of enemies instantly spotting you up a tree two miles away human beings had much keener vision in the days before the virtual boy ruined everyone's eyesight so i hope you like shooting because they certainly do i'm forced to admit that the only thing that sets dist of d's apart is that premise i liked so much it doesn't even handle that very well from a promising starting point of having all history's battles to fight in you just go back and forth between the american civil war and the russian front in world war one I. I can think of some way darker days than that the dark ages for a start and taking on fully armored medieval knights with a microwave gun would have been a whole new kind of entertainment the story is complex and intriguing but stick with it to the ending and it will all be fully explained by a single monologue from a guy standing in an empty room that's it and it's not even a denouement because the old to be continued car gets pulled which i'd usually jump all over with crampons and a backpack full of dumbbells but since this is the studio's debut title i guess if they want to ensure they've still got a job next week that's fair enough and i would actually like to see it continued because there's a lot of potential on display i'd like to see another one with more time periods to go to better storytelling more flexible objectives and while i'm fantasizing i'd also like a flying cat that dispenses harps I feel sorry for people who are God, and I shouldn't because that's like feeling sorry for Paris Hilton. You know how when your tie gets caught in a door you feel bad about moaning because there are homeless children running around with no legs who survive by sucking the buttock sweat from park benches for nourishment? Well when you're God you've got even less right to complain. But sometimes I get an urge for a grilled cheese sandwich and after going through the trouble of digging the breville out, chewing up my knuckles on a rusty cheese grater and finding that my special Branston pickle has solidified, the struggle makes it all the tastier. If I could just wave my hands and conjure not just a grilled cheese sandwich but two grilled cheese sandwiches being worn as a bra by a swimsuit model constructed from grilled cheese sandwiches, it'd take all satisfaction out of life. Scribblenauts is a game for the DS that shows us exactly how boring omnipotence can get. Scribblenauts comes to us from Fifth Cell Media, a bunch of work-shy cheaters whose most notable previous title is Drawn to Life, a game so unfinished that the player had to do half the art design themselves. Scribblenauts, meanwhile, is a rather spartan puzzler in which you help a guy in a stupid hat acquire stars, for as a great t-shirt once said, it is always stars. The stars are variously stuck up trees, frozen in ice, and misfiled by poorly trained temporary office workers, so you must recover them by writing down the name of what you're required to do so, whereupon it will materialise. I'm choosing to believe that this is an act of penance on the developer's part, after drawn to life they wanted to prove they're not above drawing stuff themselves so they drew every single object on earth talk about overcompensating well not every single object on earth you're not allowed to have anything profane or racially insensitive so don't try to spawn a chinaman's willy you're also not allowed alcoholic beverages which seems weirdly puritanical not that i'm hung up or anything but if you're fine with letting us play with rat poison smgs flamethrowers lovecraftian horrors and nitroglycerin it just seems a bit weird to draw the line at a cocksucking cowboy also while the tutorial doesn't mention this you can't spawn anything the developers didn't think of or didn't phrase properly at one point i wanted to spawn a big rock to form a stepping stone in lava but entering big rock or giant boulder or testicle of colossus produced relatively paltry specimens several levels later i discovered a massive rock that would have been of ideal proportions which went by the name huge boulder oh obviously should have guessed clearly this superpower is one of those ones that bugger you about a bit like an invisibility power that only works while you're playing a trombone i've got quite a big list of moments when scribble noughts pissed me off but the best way to illustrate them will be to change the first two words to movement physics and all the other ones to swears your character is not so much controlled as aimed like a retired rhino on rocket skates clicking on the point where you want to go sounds simple enough but when you sprint directly towards it flailing your arms regardless 
regardless of what obstacles are in the way or what carefully balanced conjurations you kick over, you have a recipe for grinning hyperactive disaster. Don't ask how I got into this situation, but on one level I had a truck hanging Italian job style over a lava pit with the star embedded in an ice block sitting on the end. I had an ice pick and all I had to do was carefully move along the truck, smash the ice and get the star. Even if I fell into the lava, if I had the star I'd still win, with an agonising flesh vaporising victory dance. But as I tapped on the block to break it, it shifted slightly and I clicked the background and fuck, it was like my character had been waiting all day for me to do that. He flung his pick into the air and started jumping up and down like he wanted to be a clown when he grew up. I'd call him a fucking drunken spastic, but apparently those words don't exist. In its sandbox mode, Scribble Noughts quickly becomes that special kind of Sunday afternoon boring that feels like giant mosquitoes are pumping cement into your brain, but you can't be asked to stop them. You can spawn various kinds of people and animals and mythical creatures and hand them all chainsaws and wiffle bats, then they fight by bumping up against each other like horny marionettes, and then the losers burst into PG-13 dust clouds. The entertainment value lies somewhere between fuzzy felt and banging two bricks together. The puzzle challenges will usually come down to moving object X to point Y. Most of them can be solved by spawning a helicopter and a length of rope. The challenge then is not coming up with a solution, but trying to get the rope physics to behave themselves for five seconds. Some levels have hostile creatures, so you spawn Cthulhu. Yes, it is kind of funny the first time you spawn Cthulhu, but when I was spawning Cthulhu every level to clear up the token hostiles, the humour sank to lolcat level. Then I would fail the mission, because sometimes killing enemies isn't allowed, not that they ever tell you that. Sometimes they don't tell you anything at all, like the level where your only hint is to reenact the climax of Back to the Future. Meaning what? Drive along the road very fast? Get struck by lightning? Contract Parkinson's disease? At the end, Scribble Noughts is just a single gimmick left to dangle unsupported like a pinata full of spiders. What little of it I would describe as a game is just a grind through the same handful of solutions. Helicopters, boulders and Cthulhu. You could say I just lack imagination, but when told I have everything, I just can't think of anything. It's like being asked to tell a joke. You might have Bob Monkhouse's entire repertoire memorised, but when you're put on the spot it all dries up. Perhaps a degree of limitation or a story campaign would have improved matters, but I still don't think the gimmick itself has any lasting appeal. If I were feeling charitable, I'd liken it to having infinite amounts of Lego and only being allowed to access ten blocks of it at a time. But it's not even that. It's more like no clipping through Doom 3 with all the lights turned up, all the content with no structure or entertainment value, not so much a game as a developer showing off. Congratulations guys, you've proved that you have a fuckload of free time and a dictionary. Come back when you've looked up what fun means. There's a school of gaming that thinks games need to be more cinematic, a school where they have to put padding on every solid surface and none of the students are allowed near anything sharper than a crayon. What's so great about cinema? Not only does it propagate the culture of dangerous extravagance and crass exploitation, but you can't buy snacks without a decent credit rating and you get muscled off your armrests by fat nose breathers with elbows the size of diving bells. But every now and again someone tries to sell a game by claiming that it's cinematic, meaning that it's an interactive experience that apes a non-interactive medium. It's the equivalent of a film consisting entirely of text scrolls in order to be more like a book, or a man sticking his head in a pond in order to be more like a newt. Wet, the title refers to wet work meaning assassinations, and nothing else, is the latest example of the spectacle fighter genre, a term I'm still determined to strong arm into common parlance. Like House of the Dead Overkill, it imitates the grindhouse feel of, well, grindhouse, right down to an omnipresent film grain filter and the occasional old style drive-in movie ad which pop about twice as many times as it takes to stop being funny. The main character is Ruby, a tomboyish assassin who is about as likeable and sympathetic as a deep sea angler fish in an SS uniform. She's arrogant, rude, surly, psychotic, selfish, greedy, joyless and really rather dim, and this may be a cheap shot but she looks like a 15 year old boy wearing a dirty mop head and a corset. The only way she could appeal is if your name is Russ Meyer and you built an entire filmmaking career around the same masochistic fantasy in which domineering women bite your knob off. Also she seems to confuse swearing with wit. That's my thing! The gunplay is based around Ruby's ability to automatically shoot one enemy while manually aiming with her other gun, which is an effective gameplay mechanic but it only works when she's leaping through the air or wall running or sliding along the ground like she's being carried along on an army of beetles, and at all other times she forgets she's holding more than one gun so apparently she has an air-cooled brain. It's most reminiscent of Stranglehold and has the same problem that game had. Yes, it's kind of thrilling when Inspector Tequila drives sideways in slow motion shooting dual pistols while doves fly out of his ass. but when he does it 50 times in a row you start to wonder if he hasn't got some kind of inner ear disabling dove shitting medical disorder. So much of this game is spent watching Ruby's fat ass gliding along like the fucking Hindenburg in repetitive slow motion combat, if it played at regular speed it'd be about half an hour long. At this point the game designer's boss says, okay that's the combat, what other gameplay mechanics will there be? Well, replies the game designer, whom I will name Pillock. How about on some of the levels everything goes all red and black and cell shaded? Uh no, says Pillock's boss, nobody's fool but his own, that's just the same gameplay mechanic in pretentious arty bullshit vision Oh right, I misunderstood you at first, replies Pillock. There's also some Prince of Persia style platforming sections, but you know how in Prince of Persia it was always clear where you were supposed to go and what was alleged and what wasn't? Well I think we should do the exact opposite of that and occasionally plunge important platforms in total darkness so you have to make leaps of faith like it's the last crusade. That sounds good, says Pillock's boss. Actually no, that sounds awful, and why is your head bandaged? Also, continues Pillock, every now and again during a cutscene a button will flash up and if you don't press it fast enough you have to start the cutscene all over again because of global flowable wobbly bits. Those are called quick time events, says Pillock's boss with increasing concern, and they're the worst idea in the world. I know it's the best idea in the world, says Pillock, so I'm just gonna make a load of those instead of boss fights, and the final climactic level will just be an extra long sequence of them because trying to be creative makes blood come out of my nose. I'd better go now, says Pillock's boss, making motions towards the exit and eventually a phone to call the police. Wait, yells Pillock, banging his head against the desk for attention. What about special challenge modes where you have to get around a training course in a certain time? That's actually not a bad idea, says his boss, stopping at the door. I know, says Pillock. That's why I'm going to occasionally force the player to complete one during story mode for no apparent reason except to appease the octopus that lives in my head.
head. Then Pillock's boss goes away and throws himself in front of a train, although it was stopping at the station so he pretty much just makes a fool of himself. Wet comes across as a project that set out with lots of ideas but ended up having to fling most of its weight out the rear door to pull out of a death dive. The climactic boss fight is a cutscene with six or seven quick time events. These are the big baddies who have been set up all game as unstoppable badasses who kick so much ass they have to buy shoe polish that's specially formulated for buttock smell. It's the equivalent of, say, John McClane reaching the centre of the terrorist hideout to find they've all given up and gone home, so the last ten minutes of the film depicts him doing a bit of tidying up before his taxi arrives. Wet is an attempt at a cinematic game that has nothing to offer as cinema, and even less as a game. Mind you, it is quite like a movie in one respect, and that's the fact that you spend most of it sitting on your ass doing nothing. The amount of loading is almost biblical, and it's particularly noticeable because they keep trying to hide it behind cutesy drive-in adverts, or a shot of Ruby standing in an elevator for five minutes, or expression of angry boredom neatly mirroring my own. But you'll also see a lot of good old-fashioned loading screens. In fact, at one point the game quietly crashed behind a loading screen and it never went away. Oh Jesus, I thought, it's finally happened, I've hit the loading screen singularity, an eternity of little spinning graphics and progress bars stuck permanently at 99%. Then I reset the console, quietly hoping that my save will be wiped and I'd have an excuse to pack this shit in. So that's basically wet, it's wet in the sense that it feels like it needs its nappy changing. I have a soft spot for second bananas, although you shouldn't buy bananas with soft spots because they might be bruised. It may just be because I too suffer from a terrible genetic disability called an older brother, but I've always preferred Luigi to Mario, who's usually made out as a coward, but hey, Falstaff was a coward, show me a Shakespearean character whose sole defining features are blindly following the instructions of some prissy royal bitch and a tendency to jump on things. Okay, Macbeth perhaps. The point is, Mario is a non-character, a blunt instrument whose only purpose is to blunder obliviously through hostile terrain in pursuit of an equally mindless princess who doesn't have the sense to not live in an underdefended castle that's within walking distance of her serial rapist's house. At least Luigi has a degree of survival instinct. And another thing, why was Tails considered inferior to Sonic? They ran at the exact same speed in Sonic 2 and Tails could fucking fly as well, and we're supposed to be rooting for the arrogant blue twat as he exploits a genetically malformed child. Anyway, I had a topic here somewhere. I would almost go as far to say that I love the Mario RPGs, although they shouldn't relax because my love can be just as caustic and poisonous as my hate. Both the Paper Marios and the Mario and Luigi series are fairly reliably fun to play with regular gameplay innovations, and best of all, they have a lightness of tone. It's nice to know that somewhere in that creaking soulless monster that is Nintendo, there's parts of it that isn't afraid to take the piss out of itself, and it's a refreshing alternative to the standard Western RPG with its self-righteous generic-based heroes fighting to overthrow the evil Archduke Nobin, or the standard Japanese RPG with its permanent bad hair day androjo tossers passive-aggressively sulking on a rooftop because their underage half-sisters never offer to suck them off. It's just a shame that so many people confuse light tone with kiddie game, apparently including the gameplay designers. It's particularly shameful because Luigi and Mario Bowser's Inside Story deals with some surprisingly deep themes that would go right over the heads of most twitching overgrown spermatozoa. Here we have two warring kingdoms, each a mirror of the other. On one side, a nation of decadent bourgeoisie toadstool people ruled by an aloof aristocrat whose original function has become buried beneath luxurious ceremony, while the other kingdom is populated by a downtrodden working class led by a charismatic union leader, a sort of Jimmy Hoffa if you were a fire-breathing turtle lizard thing. A tragic figure who evokes the paradox of the lower middle class as he loudly trumpets his opposition to those of higher status even while desperately seeking their approval. To this everlasting stalemate comes an anarchistic revolutionary who seeks to bring chaos to the two warring faces of order, symbolising the inevitable entropy and decay that comes with political stagnation. Then Bowser eats a magic mushroom and sucks the Mario Brothers into his body, but you probably shouldn't read too much into that. Thus begins an ever so slightly horrific odyssey in which you alternate between stomping around the surface world as Bowser and swimming around his bowels as Luigi and the other one. So if you've ever been curious about the exact biological workings of a fire-breathing turtle lizard thing, then Nintendo has finally met your perverse and curiously specific demands. This leads to many interesting moments, such as when Bowser attempts to lift something heavy while the bros play a little mini game inside his arm muscles to help him out, some of which drag on a bit too long and too frequently, but for most of the game I was thinking about the concept too much to notice. I mean, what if Bowser needed a poo? Would I have to make Mario and Luigi play a little breakout clone where they back pieces of sweet corn out his open sphincter? Moving hastily on from the mental image I've just given myself, another bizarre bit of gameplay is the 2D platforming with the Luigi brothers. They stand close together and the D-pad makes them both walk left and right as one, but for some stupid reason they have separate jump buttons. There will never be a situation where you want Mario to jump but not Luigi, because apparently they never got around to cutting their umbilical cords and they can't move away from each other, and it adds unnecessary complication to precision platforming like having someone blowing in your ear while you're trying to play. In any case, the core gameplay is the turn-based combat, that wretched little mechanic that the JRPGs always drag around with them like a piece of bog roll trailing off their shoe, but a particularly agreeable staple of the Mario RPGs is that you can actually dodge and counter enemy attacks rather than it just being a paralysed backing and forthing of blows like some kind of fist-based televised debate. That said though, in Luigi's Inside Story, once you figure out each enemy's timing and patterns, it's quite trivial to take absolutely no damage. Even the final boss I made into my little clumsy bitch on the very first try. I guess this is where the kiddie game label shines brightly. I don't have a problem with aiming games at kids, although I do despise kids. Seriously, I don't think you quite grasp how much I loathe children. Given three wishes, I'd ask for a puppy, a decent chip sandwich, and for every child-bearing womb on the planet to pop out and fly away like a cheery parade of greasy red balloons. But while kids are pretty fucking stupid, I mean even with all the crayons in the world they still can't draw a fucking house, that doesn't mean you can't try to challenge them. When I was a kid we played games where you had one life and every bird, insect, and blade of grass was trying to murder you. Kids today they get their hands held so hard their fingers turn white and drop off. The game feels disappointingly brief and side quest efficient, and every new gameplay mechanic is introduced with a lengthy tutorial teaching you what buttons are where, most of which you can safely skip unless you're some
some kind of recently unfrozen Neanderthal, and this is your first experience with electronic media, in which case, rawr, submit your soul to the one-eyed demon. Go me, I got through a whole review for a Mario game without complaining about the character being overused. But while I've never disliked Mario RPG, if Paper Mario Thousand Year Door is the jammy dodger zenith, then this is pretty close to the digestive nadir. You'd be pretty glad to have it on a long plane ride, but if it goes past the ten hour mark, you'd better have some emergency crosswords on hand. It's difficult to put down in words my opinion of Tim Schafer, but basically, if I had access to a doomsday machine, I'd reduce the entire population of the world to me, Tim Schafer, and maybe a woman if she promised to wear a Tim Schafer mask. In the past, I have literally executed corporal punishment against people who never bought his last game, Psychonauts, and his entire resume is a laundry list of standouts that have cemented my admiration, so when he descends from Mount Olympus to bring his first game since 2005, not really liking it puts me in a difficult position. Do I make excuses for old time's sake and compromise my integrity, or jeopardise my chances of being invited to his birthday party? I feel a little betrayed. This must be how a lioness feels when the alpha male eats one of her cubs. I just don't know where we stand right now, and he's not having any of my zebra tonight, that's for fucking certain. Brutal Legend is about Jack Black starring as Jack Black playing Jack Black, who is the heavy metal roadie mysteriously transported to a sort of cross between Narnia and the Ozfest, and so takes the Flash Gordon Army of Darkness approach to the fish out of water genre, that is, take the motherfucker over. On the way, there'll be a very expensive soundtrack of Guitar Hero classics and voice cameos from virtually everyone who ever curled two fingers into their palm while extending the other two, with the exception of Spider Man. It's a wide open sandbox game, so it can be added to the ever growing landslide of sandbox games. I mean, honestly, pretty soon there's going to be enough sand and boxes around to replicate Bondi Beach after a nearby warehouse explosion. Now, if all you want to do is play Dragon Force at full volume while ramping a high speed armoured rocket car off terrain that resembles various Megadeth album covers, then Brutal Legend provides, and frankly, I can think of a few more productive ways to spend an idle summer afternoon, but I'm less enthused by the whole game aspect. The reason Brutal Legend feels like a betrayal is that it's a stealth RTS, not an RTS with stealth elements where one might knock out an unaware guard from behind with a convoy of tanks, but an RTS that cloaks itself in the garments of other genres, which is particularly annoying for someone who likes other genres but doesn't really like RTS. If you just played the demo, you'd think it was a quirky God of War hack and slasher with open world driving and a slightly dodgy targeting system, but as the story continues and the game starts teaching you how to order troops around and where to buy 500 identical spiked helmets, you start to smell a big hairy zerg rushing rats. All the hacky slashy drive around you the game appears to be is mere crust upon a surface of big RTS battles that dominate the second half of a painfully underweight story campaign. It's like buying a car on the strength of its four magnificent wheels, but it starts to peel away in layers as you drive it along the highway until only a unicycle remains, which might be a perfectly good unicycle, but I don't know how to ride a fucking unicycle. Still, if I must be forced to play an RTS, it is quite gratifying to be able to personally wade in when things are going up the piddle pipe, and I bet I'd have had more fun with the Total War series if they'd let me jump into a fire-breathing monster truck and plough through the Roman infantry. That sentence alone should spell out that I'm not a great judge of RTSs, but I have a friend who likes them, and once I dredged him up from his abyss and reanimated him from a death-like torpor, he assured me that Brutal Legend's RTS aspect is quite lacking. Its controls unsuited for any strategy more complex than gather up all your mates and go stomp all over everything that's a different colour to you. He added that it had never occurred to him to use his car in battle, perhaps the veteran strategy player's mind can't think outside the box, or he was weakened from not having fed on the blood of a high-born virgin, or Brutal Legend has a terrible habit of not telling you shit. Climb to the top of the horn thrower to customise Mount Rockmore, says the game. Exactly what the horn thrower is, and why I should give a toss are conspicuously unmentioned. You have to raise motor forges to upgrade your car, but where a motor forge might be found or what they look like is left unsaid. This is what I'm starting to hate about sandbox games. Whatever other gameplay it employs, above all else you have to be proficient at scavenger hunts. There are a lot of upgrades, army commands, and important story elements that have to be searched for throughout the game world. Would it not make sense to give me these things as a reward for my playing skills, rather than my willingness to waste hours of my free time blindly wandering around the overworld hoping to trip over a present? I ask you now, how many more genres have to be sacrificed to the sandbox monster before we remember the importance of specialisation? We've already lost the RPGs, the racers, the shooters, the brawlers, the bakers, the candlestick makers, all stewed together into games of all trades, masters of none. And now we're losing real-time strategy. Where does it end? Will I one day be refused the straight line block in Tetris until I've journeyed to the Zargoth Plains and recovered the fifty sacred horse bollocks? Tim Schafer's characteristic style and sense of humour is here, but the format puts it through the ringer a wee bit. Psychonauts benefited from a very tight level design and story structure, but Brutal Legend is a sandbox, and sandboxes are by definition looser than your mum on a jet engine. You remember when you played Mousetrap, you'd set up the machine and watch every component fire off in turn all the way to its clattering conclusion in a perfect crescendo of brightly coloured plastic? Well, if that was Psychonauts, then Brutal Legend is throwing all the pieces into a bucket and hurling them at a dog's face. It's still entertaining in its own way, but it's not architecturally sound, and the dog probably wouldn't appreciate it either. It feels more like Jack Black's thing than Tim Schafer's, although the two men do look rather similar, and come to think of it, I've never seen them in the same room together. I'm not suggesting they might have some kind of fucked up Tyler Durden relationship, but oh wait, sorry, yes, that's pretty much exactly what I'm suggesting. You know, at the time I wouldn't have picked Uncharted 1 as a sequel sort of property, although the one on the end should probably have tipped me off. It wasn't awful, but it had fewer original thoughts than the BBC programme planning department. It had one ball from Gears of War in its mouth and another from Tomb Raider and was sucking for all its might. The plot was removed by Caesarean section from an Indiana Jones movie so sloppily that doctors were unable to save any of the relatable characters or coherent motivations, and also took a lead from the Dan Brown school of puzzles, i.e. present the viewer some ancient riddle and immediately solve it for them, because if they were smart they wouldn't be watching this piss. So I didn't expect to hear any more from this franchise, but I guess if you feed humanity flavourless wallpaper paste for decades then you shouldn't be surprised if that's all they want to eat now. So part-time adventurer and full-time cock-end, 
Nathan Drake returns, still just as much the lovable, flawed hero for today's cynical age. And when I say flawed, I mean that very particular brand of Hollywood flawed, that is to say not flawed at all. Like the supermodel who is considered ugly because she wears a baggy sweater, Drake is generically handsome beneath the strategically placed grime and inexplicably green designer stubble, supernaturally athletic despite his ceaseless grunts of exertion and retarded gibbon arm flailing jumping technique, and constantly spouts appalling wit and panicky self-effacement in the hope that you don't notice that he is a remorseless career thief who kills more foreigners than malaria, although having rid the world of blacks, Asians and Latinos in the last game, he has now moved on to non-American whites. In his continued efforts to essentially be Nicolas Cage in the movie National Treasure, he has now acquired his very own Sean Bean, who to his credit almost goes a whole hour before turning out to be the bad guy. So what's new since Uncharted 1? Well, something between bugger and all. It's still about 45% killing innocent defenseless mercenaries, 45% climbing all over ancient masonry while grunting like a smoker doing press-ups in a meadow full of talkative pigs, and 10% inexplicably functional ancient puzzles, which are usually solved by opening your journal and having it bold-facedly tell you the solution, so the only thing being tested is whether or not you still have eyeballs in your face. In true Indiana Jones tradition, there's also a new woman for Drake to put his little explorer in, but then they bring the one from the first game back as if to say, ha, bet you were hoping we'd be able to avoid rehashing at least one thing, right? The new lady is British, so obviously doesn't have much chance of a long-term thing because Drake has propagating the master race to think about. Actually, there's a bit more of a stealth focus this time. You can trim down the enemy numbers by jumping onto unaware guards and rendering them unconscious through a combination of noogies and homoerotic terror, but this aspect is complicated by Drake's crippling addiction to walls. When he takes cover by a wall, he immediately forms an attraction stronger than that of a mother to a child, such as his desire that more than once my attempts at going unnoticed were completely fucked over a bramble patch when I was forced to move a good few feet out of cover just to unstick myself from it, and things got even worse later on when Drake started grinding up bits of wall and snorting them loud enough to give away his position, but when that happens and you attempt melee combat, it is kind of cool that you do so by madly tapping the square button. It's nice to see a control mechanic based around what most players are going to do anyway, perhaps next they could introduce platforming sections that can only be solved by throwing your controller at the screen. I guess the big selling point is that it looks very nice. Looking nice isn't as hard as it used to be with all those high definition booby glisten renderers that are readily available, but Uncharted 2 does put a lot of effort into its scenery. This could be one of the reasons why they make us climb onto the tops of very high things all the bloody time, the other being to give us an opportunity to leap off into space and see if Nathan Drake can wisecrack his way out of a 50 story drop onto a bric a brac stall, the smug flat headed cunt. So it's a handsome looking game, except for the fact that all the characters' eyes are creepy bug like things that look like they should be peering out from beneath the oblong black fringes of scary Japanese girls. But you know what? If all you want is visuals, and you can go to the fucking National Portrait Gallery. Just like in the first game, the detailed scenery means that often the only way to tell the difference between a climbable ledge and climbable ledge effect wallpaper is to furiously jump up and down in front of it like you're praying to the ledge gods with a ceremonial dance. Eventually the game will give you a hint indicating which of the several bumps on the walls you're supposed to start from, but it always seems to be a bit snarky about it. Fuck you game, it's not my fault you can't be asked to tidy up. Let me just restate that Uncharted 2 is by no stretch of the word bad. It's all very balanced and compelling and cinematic and all the other words from the GameSpot review generator. Nathan Drake seemed to get beaten up a lot more than in the first game, which certainly improved the experience for me. Maybe by the end of the third game we'll be controlling a big pile of giblets and teeth, serves him right the glib self-righteous tosser. But apart from that, it doesn't add a single thing, not to its own series or to gaming as a whole. It's even got an unlockable zero gravity mode. You see, it's so opposed to the concept of newness, it feels it has to defy Sir Isaac new turn. Blimey, that was tortured. Anyway, you'll probably enjoy it at the time, but almost immediately forget about it once you're done. In fact, I've already forgotten where this sentence was going. It's a popcorn game, that's what it is. It's a little flavourless ball you can scoff while you're waiting for something that matters, and if you put butter on it, it smells a little bit like piss. Sometimes it's fruitful to take a step back and examine the basic workings we have come to accept, like saying the words Scunthorpe over and over again until it's reduced to meaningless syllables with a spicy hidden cuss. And there's something terribly weird about the standard fantasy setting, not least of which the fact that the phrase standard fantasy setting can be uttered without irony. Look at us, we're a civilization so steeped in escapism that we've managed to find mundanity in something that doesn't exist and never will, whatever your other kin friend might say. Why is it accepted fact that elves fire bows and arrows and commune with the trees? That was Tolkien's thing. Without him, elves would be just about qualified to sell rice krispies, and he made dwarves all have braided beards and wheeled back Axes. Real dwarves don't do that, they get hired by Lucasfilm or take corporate office jobs because they're an equal opportunities bonanza. Are we all but children playing forever on the same swing set while JRR is the grumpy dad watching from the park bench and trying not to get aroused? Dragon Age calls itself a dark fantasy, it's rather cute really, like a D&D nerd getting his ear pierced because he fancies the goth girl who works at Starbucks. Dragon Age isn't dark fantasy, nor is it light grey avocado or caffeine free fantasy, it's just straight fantasy classic, it's a straight line Tetris block wiping out four big fat rows of demand for traditional single player RPGs. It's got elves, dwarves, dragons, it's got a title screen depicting a sword sticking out of the ground and the world map looks like a fire breathing coffee drink has been sick on it. We're talking 100% commitment here, where every individual element could be taken out of context and every single one could make your girlfriend legitimately call you a sad bastard. Here's the story. At the borders of the Kingdom of Felden, a sinister army of darkspawn masses. A power struggle has broken out between the usurper turn Loghain and- oh Christ, are you listening to this? I feel like this should be scrolling over a picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger looking bored on a throne. So you start the game and you choose whether you're a human, an elf or a dwarf. Then just as you're reeling from all the staggering innovation, you pick warrior, rogue or mage. I can sort of see what they're going for. Another game might keep up some pretense of newness and have classes like Peace Killer or Shadow Humper or Garot. 
Markov and necessitate players sitting with a fucking glossary on hand, so better to just drop the trousers of pretension so everyone understands what you've got swinging around. Once that's all done, you get one of six unique starting levels depending on what sort of character you rolled, so you've got six entire games in one, in theory. Realistically, you'll probably just play through it once, then play the opening mission five times, because after that it's pretty much the same except for the occasional bit of dialogue. For example, I was an elf, and every now and again characters would say, Hello, you are an elf! If I were a human, presumably they'd say, Hello, you are an asshole! I'd like to see a Tolkien-esque fantasy where the humans aren't the biggest pricks in the room. I mean, a lot of my friends are humans, and some of them are alright. I won't waste too much time describing the gameplay, for the same reason why I wouldn't spend too much time describing the colour of a banana. If you've ever played a Bioware RPG, you've played this. If the elves all had lobsters for faces, you could convince yourself you're playing Mass Effect Brown Edition. You enter a new area, you gather quests for a load of work-shy peasants who won't lift a finger to chase the cottages out of their own toilets, and who have about two faces and four hairstyles between them all. Go to the dungeon and murder everyone you find, steal their pocket chains, steal their trousers, then come back, hand in the quest, sell all the trousers and flee, like some kind of extremely dedicated wandering second-hand clothing salesman. And various party members join you whose purpose is to aid in battle, wear all your spare trousers, and force me to go through the dull routine of making sure their trousers are marginally better than the ones I'm selling at the end of the day. And of course, what would a Bioware RPG be without dialogues? A whole bunch of silence and trousers, that's what. I remember hearing somewhere that Dragon Age contains nine novels worth of text, which didn't really sell it to me. Who the fuck sits down to read nine novels at once if they don't live in the fucking Bastille? So about 75% of your playtime is spent making rather creepy loving eye contact with NPCs, as they talk about the weather, the political situation, and the small group of ogres who are standing behind you and who will stove in your head with lead pipes literally the very instant this conversation ends, all in the same placid tone of voice, even when you're freshly battled and your body is spotted with blood splatters like a menstruating leopard, which makes everyone in the world seem a little bit mental. Then you choose between the friendly response, the neutral response, or the asshole response. This is what they call role-playing, children. Being an asshole doesn't really affect the game the way it did in Mass Effect or KOTOR, but they can occasionally make people attack you faster or not give you stuff, which I call blatant asshole-ism. I haven't mentioned whether Dragon Age is good or not yet, and here's why. Because at time of writing, I mean speaking, I've been playing for 25 hours and there's still no end in sight. There are three-day accountancy conventions that don't feel as long as this game, but you know what? I'm actually enjoying it. Combat gets a bit clusterfucky, but the radial menu has the decency to pause the game when it's open so you don't get bisected by gnolls while you're hunting for the summon fiery apocalypse button, like you're trying to read a manual on cocksucking while your first customer is already speeding towards your gums. It's easy to mock the straight face cliche of it all, but the fact that I can play it for 25 hours and still want to know what happens next means that I shouldn't complain. Besides, people like what's familiar, that's why Blizzard recently bought their 14th yacht. Basically, if you like fantasy RPGs, then Dragon Age is about as definitive as they get, and if you don't like fantasy RPGs, then I guess you could just go off and have sex with people instead. Stop those credits, it's time to announce the winner of the Stonking Great Game Contest. We had some very strong entries, and some utterly rubbish ones as well. Actually, there weren't many strong entries at all, and most of them were about as captivating as a dead dog in a skip. But to be fair, it wasn't much of a subject matter, really. An accurate game about my daily life would be like an MMO where all the fun and questing takes place on the other side of a big concrete wall, while the player sits in a dark room illegally downloading Avenged Sevenfold. Anyway, the winner was Yahtzee's Last Stand, a frantic platform shooter, sort of like Smash Brothers Brawl if all your opponents were launched at you with a man cannon. The connection to zero punctuation is visual alone. You could replace all the sprites with pictures of cucumbers and sprouts and resell as an educational game from the National Health Service, but again, with the given subject matter, what the fuck was I expecting you to do? A game where you shout into a microphone for five minutes, because someone else tried that and I beat it by placing my headset next to the tumble dryer. And Yahtzee's last stand was one of the few entries that noticed that between the word stonking great and the word contest was the word game, and had actual gameplay that was entertaining and challenging without becoming overwhelming, as opposed to a sequence of references held together with spit. The runners-up were Imps vs Fanboys, a neat little tower defence game to add to the several billion of those that the internet has grown like pubescent bum fluff, and Yahtzee the ultimate game critic in the Imps Invasion, a surprisingly graphically detailed side-scroller let down by some control issues and the fact that the flamethrower weapon is to balance gameplay what a crowbar is to a kneecap. Big thanks to all the judges and of course to everyone who entered. In a way, you're all winners, and by way I mean fucked up bizarro universe. Resume credits! According to the statistics, if you are an organic life form, you already own around 2.7 copies of Modern Warfare 2. This game has been selling like hotcakes lodged in copies of an unreleased Harry Potter book set during Hermione's bicurious phase because the much-touted controversial mission managed to find that magical sweet spot where it's not offensive enough to get banned, but enough to get lots of free publicity on national television. So in case you don't already know, and statistically that means you live on one of the moons of Jupiter, an early mission in the game has you join a small group of Russian terrorists gunning down unarmed civilians in Moscow airport, but it's okay because A, you're really an undercover CIA agent, and B, you don't actually have to kill anyone and can hang back and pretend your arthritis is flaring up, and C, they're Russian civilians and who gives a shit about them. As controversy goes, it's pretty fucking weak sauce. GTA 4 practically lets you rub innocent civilians' intestines on your face and show photographs of it to their grandchildren, make all the victims apple-cheeked cub scouts doing bobber jobs to earn money for their grandmama's dialysis machine, and then we'll talk about controversy, Modern Warfare 2. Unimpressed by our controversy, are you? Says Infinity Ward. Well, suck on this. Russia invades America. Bam. Remember how in my Hawks 
review, I said that in today's enlightened times, modern day war games never tie the baddies directly to a foreign power when there are loads of perfectly good terrorist groups and PMCs that no one cares about offending. Well, MW2 skull fucks all that with an American flag wrapped around a baseball bat, and the whole thing plays like the violent delusions of a Cold War fantasist with his head stuck in a lathe. But if there's one thing the game hates more than Russians, it's player characters. It seems after the excellent and memorable sequence of Modern Warfare 1, in which one of the protagonists gets cooked to perfection in a nuclear blast, the developers thought with typical producer logic that the best way to top that would be to do it again about three times. It's a rather dim attempt to capture the same shock and awe, that's the thing about shock, once you're doing it every five minutes it just stops being special. Mind you, the plot is pretty special, in the same sense as in the phrase I'm sorry my son ate your shoes, he's a little bit special. At the point when I was ramping a snowmobile over a 60 foot abyss I realised that all pretense of realism had been savagely dropped and they adopted to write some demented and confusing James Bond story where James Bond gets murdered half an hour in to be replaced by a bloke called Bames John. The single player campaign is as short as fuck, and let me tell you, when I'm around fucks are legendarily short. It's barely six hours in all, but cutting out all my deaths, all the plot points that didn't make the slightest bit of sense and all the time spent hiding under walls waiting for blood to fall off my face, then it comes down to about 15 minutes. The combat tends to go for a sort of noisy, frantic warfare thing with bullets and explosions going off all around you while some general is yelling into your headset to pick him up some toffees on your way back. And while it's nice to create a thrilling mood in case burglars invade the player's home to capitalise on their inner alertness, you often have to be watching every direction like a cat with his tail caught in a fucking ceiling fan or else get shot so hard by various unseen attackers that your eyeballs burst several times. This was particularly upsetting in one mission when I died about 70 million times trying to push through a squad of evil Ruskies, only to finally succeed and then get killed as part of the end mission cutscene. So what was all that effort in aid of? Would it honestly have ended the story right there if I died about 15 feet further back? Like the last 70 million times. What, was I tied to a bungee cord this whole time and at the point of death I was being catapulted into the sky? So after completing the single player campaign in about the space of time it takes to make a cup of tea, I did something a little drastic and decided to check out the multiplayer. Not the online multiplayer, fuck no. Experience has taught me to never play any multiplayer game in which I am unable to reach over and slap the other players across the face. Fortunately there are some short snacky one-off missions that I could play co-op with my male friend. You complete them to gain stars to buy more of them. So it's basically the Guitar Hero estate sponsored genocide. But we actually had a lot of fun with them. I even caught myself using phrases like take point and watch my six without any trace of irony or mock Jack Bauer voice. We especially enjoyed the stealth missions in which we lay together in the long grass watching each other's backs, not gay. All in all makes me wonder why they couldn't have been used to pad the story mode out a bit so it was a little bit more than a short squeaky fart in an elevator full of conspiracy theorists. I mean you always have an AI partner or two, there's no reason you couldn't have a co-op mode throughout except that the surprise protagonist murders would have to become even more contrived. From a purely mechanical standpoint Modern Warfare 2 is absolutely perfect. Bullets fly at things you point out and those things can generally be trusted to die. And the graphics depict a succession of dusty war-torn hell holes with enormous detail and polish so if that alone sells it to you then feel free to hand over your money. But remember to leave a little aside to buy some lovely three in one oil for your squeaky joints, you fucking robot. If you ask that efficient controls and decent graphics be threaded onto some kind of a coherent narrative or appropriate context, as opposed to a length of patchy dental floss that's been recently employed by a homeless coprophage, then save your pennies for food and shelter and air and everything else you require as one of us emotional, squishy, organic life forms. Modern Warfare 2's story really does come across as the product of a development team who couldn't quite believe how well the original did, so half of them wanted to see how much they could get away with, while the other half were trying to drag them away from the writing table. So just to summarise, fellas, the soldier new king was good, but civilian shooting, bit of a flop. By all means experiment. For Modern Warfare 3, how about having a stomp on a little girl's puppy, then scoop up the remains on a bit of paper with a holocaust denial written on it. Being European, there's an old saying I'm quite fond of. In heaven, the food is Italian, the police are British, the platformers are French, the shooters are Croatian, and it's all run by two international software giants and electronics corporation. In hell, the food is British, the shooters are Canadian, and I forget the rest, but basically the gist of the saying is that Italians are all tossers. About the only important things Italy ever did were the Renaissance and murdering Jesus, deicide and a whole bunch of painters running around being gay. But it's in that gay, painty period of history that we find the setting of Assassin's Creed 2, or to use its other name, Ubisoft's 20-hour Assassin's Creed 1 repentance. If you're just joining us, Assassin's Creed 1 was a game with a solid concept let down by a bit of repetition syndrome and a faffing about fetish. There were no big deal breakers, it wasn't the kind of game that beats you about the face and neck with a steel truncheon for six hours, more the sort that stands behind you gently prodding the back of your head every ten seconds. It recounted the adventures of Desmond the Futury Man and favourite candidate for the blandest sentient life form in the universe competition, as he uncovered a global conspiracy by delving into the racial memories of Altair the medieval pasty man, an assassin with the ability to turn completely invisible when sitting on benches looking serious, hampered since birth with a unique genetic deformity that makes him water soluble. The game was well presented but earned a bit of stick for its repeated grinding of the same side quests that meant you could cut out 55 minutes of every hour of playtime and miss fuck all. But I hope you didn't do that because Assassin's Creed 2's plot doesn't even have a decent recap before blandy future Desmond hooks up with a fish woman who takes him to her secret society consisting of two people who look like they were hired from the local community youth group. Now Desmond must relive the memories of Italian Renaissance man Ezio Auditore di Dem di Dem di Dem in order to learn assassin skills. I guess all the stuff we did with Altair in the first game was just for warm ups or they wanted him to learn the skills from someone with more emotion than a spoonful of rice pudding and who doesn't react to water like a fucking Barocca and who could walk briskly down the road without a 12th century SWAT team descending on his hooded ass like a platoon of winged monkeys. Yes, yeah, someone at Ubisoft thankfully started taking practicality pills and Ezio can actually run at full pelt down the street without guards getting suspicious because this is Renaissance Italy where it's more suspicious to not dress and act like a complete bell end. Also, thank fuck there's a fast travel system now and you don't have to take lengthy horse journeys between every fucking mission, unless you want to. Like if you've got a lady friend round and you want to hypnotise her with the sight of a horse's ass bobbing up and down for half an hour. Before you start relaxing though, Ubisoft were apparently determined to keep at least one thing that annoyed the shit out of me, so those fucking beggars who nipped at your turnips like Case 
useless terriers return in the shape of wandering minstrels, and I swear those motherfuckers have started hunting in packs. Overall though, Ask Creed 2 is an improvement on Ask Creed 1, the progression is much less rigidly structured, and Ezio has more opportunities to actually be an assassin rather than some kind of courier stroke chimney sweep, and it seems the creative freedom the Renaissance brought to the world also extended to the art of murder. Will it be the classic retracto blade death cuddle, the efficiency of the Florentine double ear piercing, or the bohemian freshness of the surprise roll in the hay? Sword fighting's still a bit obnoxious, especially since it's mostly spent waiting to counterattack, but when an enemy's beaten down, you can generally grab them and cut their throat in a technique I like to call the oh fuck this. Ezio has so many weapons, some of them get a bit redundant. The poison blade, for example, makes the subject acquire ants in their pantaloons for a few seconds before dropping dead, and it seems virtually anything else would be more efficient, if less funny. Ezio can also collect cash as part of Screed 2's most prize-winningly vestigial feature. You use it to buy medicine, ammo, armor, usual stuff, but none of it costs that much. The best armor in the game you get for free, anyway, if you collect enough cereal box tokens. No, most of the money you sink into the management of your home villa in a sort of Sim City for Retards minigame, renovating shops and buildings to increase the villa's worth. To what end, you ask? To increase the amount of money the villa pays you every now and again, and the game constantly nags you to keep traipsing back to the villa to pick up the money, and the only reason to do half the side quests is to acquire even more money, then presumably you pilot into a pond and swim around in it like a swarthy European Scrooge McDuck because there's fuck all else used for it. It seems after the complaints about Screed 1's dullness, Ubisoft overcompensated and stuffed Screed 2 with ideas so hard a whole lot of dead weight started oozing out of its nose and mouth. There was a bit of hype going on about being able to get around with Da Vinci's flying machine, but there was so little room left in the game's well-stuffed orifices that you only do that for one brief mission. Considering all the tower climbing we have to do, I'm surprised the game would miss out on another opportunity to hike up its skirt and shove its soft warm environment engine in my face. I guess I can't really complain about a game having too much stuff, so I'll complain about something else. The story gets very hard to follow around the middle, not helped at all by several arbitrary jumps forward in time. After one mission, for example, it suddenly jumps to Ezio sitting on a bench two years later when some lady comes up and hands him some evidence she took from the scene of his mission two years ago. What the fuck was she waiting for, and why was Ezio's first reaction not to slap her across the tits? The other thing is that while Screed 2 is definitely better than its predecessor, it's just too easy. While guard pursuits in Screed 1 could be almost harrowing, the guards in Screed 2 are willing to dismiss you if you so much as turn your collar up the other way. One of the later weapons you unlock is no joke, a fucking gun. Now in the 15th century that's just not giving anyone else a chance, is it? And without wishing to spoil anything, the final final boss fight is a punch up with a fat bloke. Beating the game felt like winning gold in the Olympic nose picking event, and all my opponents were earthworms. 4 is very rarely the magic number. A fourth blind mouse would have just been redundant, as would a fourth little pig who built his house out of depleted uranium. And while a threesome with two women is fun, any more than that, and you're gonna run out of bits to share around. But 4 is a significant number in the video games world because it's the maximum number of controllers you can buy before you start to think you might have a little bit too much disposable income. 4 players is the perfect number. You, one to take all the power ups, one to run on ahead of everyone else and lose all the lives, and one to poke you in the eye every five minutes with a sharpened core jet. And without two guitarists, a drummer, and a singer when playing rock band, you might even be able to actually hear the music. Today I'd like to review two recent four player co op titles. Left 4 Dead 2, the latest in a series that is increasingly trying to resemble a car registration number, and New Super Mario Super Wii Brothers 2 The Revenge of the Return, etc. First of all, yes, I was forced to play the cut down Australian version of Left 5 Dead 7 because of our crotchety old man government who think that everyone under the age of 40 is a serial rapist waiting to happen, so playing it was like visiting a McDonald's in a foreign country, the same but with an odd sense of unfamiliarity and they don't sell chicken nuggets. The changes are mostly gore related, taking out persistent bodies, dismemberment, and blood splattering on your screen like you're all wearing fucking motorcycle helmets, so the Australian version is at least much easier on the processor, but honestly, it doesn't matter if the zombies bleed, dribble, or shoot wee wee out of their armpits. As long as zombies and an apocalypse are going on, then it's officially a zombie apocalypse. And now it's inflicting itself upon four new unlucky bastards, namely Uncle Phil, Leisure Suit Larry, some guy from Deliverance, and a girl, whose only defining feature is that I always end up having to play the insipid cow. Meanwhile, the character selection in New Super Mario Bros. Wii consists of Mario, Luigi, and two different coloured toads. So the arguments with your mates start before the game even begins. You know whoever gets lumped with the two generic townsfolk are the bottomers in that particular circle of friends. It's like playing a superhero game where you get to play as either Superman, Batman, or two recently hatched ducklings. Not that it matters so much, the character differences are entirely cosmetic and everyone has the same basic controls. Press 2 to jump and fall down a pit. Hold 1 to run so that you can jump further and fall down a different pit. Basically everything you'll have come to expect from a 2D Mario platformer, assuming you stopped playing them around 1993. Some levels have you swimming, some scroll vertically, but generally you just keep holding right until you hear the victory music. Or you fall down a pit. What's clear about Left 4 Dead 2 Rocky 5, and which becomes even clearer in the Australian version with all the blood and disembodied titties wiped out of your eyes, is that if it weren't for the number in the title, the second number that is, you'd call it little more than an expansion pack that dreams of the stars. The most significant addition is Malay weapons, including swords, guitars, crowbars, and of course chainsaws, which historically have now probably been used more often against zombies in games than against wood in real life. But the usefulness of melee is linked directly to the speed of your connection. In a worst case scenario, it could be swinging your axe several seconds after the zombies have already eaten your face, digested it, and pooed it down your nose hole. There are some new special zombies and a whole bunch of new levels in a daytime deep south sort of setting, but besides new weapons, characters, and environments, it's pretty much the same. I appreciate that that sounds like saying Star Wars would be identical to Sister Act 2 back in the habit if you changed the character's plot, setting, and title, but the general feel of Left 4 Dead is unchanged. 
changed. While we're still backwards running from the entire zombified London Marathon as a 14-year-old from Nome, Alaska steals all the health kits, everything else is so much salad dressing. Mind you, at least Left 4 Dead 2 London SW1 has some steps forward, even if it's just a shuffling of the feet towards a cliff edge. Even a single chip of plaster knocked off a prison wall is at least some progress. Super Wii New Brothers Mario is the prisoner who cements over his own escape attempts, then sticks his head in the toilet. Nintendo's Mario team really don't seem to have any ambition besides subsisting on bits of crust they can scrape from the pimply underbelly of nostalgia, lest anything as dangerous as a new idea appear in their brains and give them a fucking seizure. But as the disbelieving friend said to the inventor of the feces-powered helicopter, this shit will not fly. What really has been the point of the last 15 years if you're just going to make Mario 3 again, complete with chirpy NES sound effects still intact on what is ostensibly a current generation console, no less? Oh, but there is four-player co-op, a feature that is absolutely perfect if you find yourself short of gift-buying money this Christmas and need to lose three friends as quickly as possible. The player characters all bounce off each other, so once you go beyond one player, it's like trying to precision platform in a tumble dryer full of cricket balls. And the power-ups are virtually designed to come out in such a way that one player takes all of them, one player who will go home with so many feet up their ass that they will spend the next few days coughing up odour eaters. Even bad games have a place in gaming history, even if it's just a feature in some how-not-to-do-it guide. New Nooper Nario Nother's Knee is a rare example of a game that has absolutely no right to exist. Super Mario World was better, Yoshi's Island was better. This is supposed to be the future, damn it! If everyone has to buy digital televisions before 2010, then that means you aren't allowed to suddenly ignore 20 years of gameplay innovation. Release a photograph of the Nintendo Board of Executives pulling their buttocks apart, and that might at least be worth noting. As for Left 4 Dead 2 Springfield 30 or 6, well, it made Left 4 Dead fresh enough again for me to enjoy playing it for a few more hours, and hell, people have paid a lot more money for entertainment that doesn't last as long as that. But while this and all those staggered out Team Fortress 2 extras are mildly diverting Valve, wasn't there a Half-Life Episode 3 you were supposed to be working on? I'm starting to feel like I've come to a Rolling Stones concert, and the Rolling Stones don't feel like coming out, so they're trying to keep us amused with an old TV showing episodes of the Jetsons. Demon's Souls, that's Demon's Souls, not Demon's Souls, although they both mean the same thing, so why they go for the one that's incredibly awkward to say, I don't know, unless they've been locked in a cupboard for 2,000 years and have never heard spoken English, which considering it's a Japanese game could well be the case, is a pseudo-online fantasy hack and slasher that several people have recommended to me because apparently it's very hard, which isn't a great selling point in itself. Bread goes hard if you leave it out on the sideboard, but it's hardly an improvement. Oh, but surely you'd appreciate a real challenge after all those generic mainstream titles that hold your hand like a creepy uncle, go the recommenders, and I suppose it's true, most games these days seem to cater largely for people who are coming off the effects of general anaesthetic, so what the hoo-ha. Demon's Souls is a Japanese game that seeks to ape Western-style fantasy games, and judging by the character creator, the developers got everything they know about Western appearances by watching muscle beaches through a slit in a piece of cardboard. So once I'd finished tweaking my boggle-eyed, fish-lipped avatar with a forehead the size of a fucking airplane luggage compartment, the intro cinematic clued me in. Apparently some evil dark fog has descended upon the kingdom of Boletaria, and large numbers of adventurers have wandered into it and never returned. So obviously being some kind of world-class intellect, my character thinks the best idea would be to do exactly the same thing. But don't you see I am the world's last hope? Yes, just me and the other 50,000 players who are hanging around. After that, a brief tutorial runs me through what to expect. For example, it taught me that pressing circle would cause me to do a quick hop backwards in order to dodge an attack. Alrighty, I thought, let's try it out on this undead swordsman who's shuffling towards me. Nimbly, I hopped back as he swung his sword, whereupon he took a step forward and cut my nipples out. Oh, I said. Okay, a dodge move that can't dodge shit. Yeah, I guess that would make for a hard game, but it doesn't seem like I'm being given much of a chance here. It's like they're giving me a crossbow that only works when I'm sticking it at my nose. Anyway, after defeating the zombie and healing up by eating what I think was a punnet of watercress, I turned a corner and was immediately flattened by a giant turd monster. Things weren't going very well. Fortunately, my fecal friend was a supposed to lose fight and I was transported to a new area where a mysterious lady with pancakes stitched to her face told me I was dead. Being dead isn't the handicap it used to be though, all it really does is reduce your maximum health by half, but the pancake lady explains that I can be restored to life and therefore full health by defeating boss monsters. Truly a game that stomps you to death 20 minutes in and tells you you can have your health bar back once you've proved you don't need it is a game that does not fuck around, and thus does the true Demon Souls begin, or at least that's what a thing on the floor told me once I entered the first mission. You see, the online gimmick of the game is that you don't actually interact with other players, but you sometimes see their ghosts that can help distract monsters, and you can leave notes on the ground for each other like a bunch of passive-aggressive housemates with post-its. Thus, the difficulty is abated by camaraderie. For example, one message said, watch out for the fall ahead, and was positioned two feet away from a giant hole. Sadly, you can only leave messages composed of pre-selected words and phrases, so I couldn't leave a reply reading, no shit, butt munch. One of the things that makes Demon's Souls so hard is that there are no save points. When you die, you go all the way back to the start of the level and all the baddies respawn. It quickly teaches you to be very cautious and to scarf down healing watercress at every turn. Although you have to time that right, because you can only slowly and delicately pop it into your mouth like a gourmet sampling this season's brie, and hope no enemies feel like sharpening their swords on your hip bone while you're preoccupied. Eventually, though, I got through the first dingy castle full of jerks and found the first demon, which was a giant slow-moving cowpat. Probably fitting for the very first tier, but I was starting to think the game was making fun of me. Anyway, some helpful prior player advised me via the medium of floor to use fire-based weapons, so I opened the menu to put some fire on my sword, whereupon I was cowpatted to death because opening the menu doesn't pause the game. Pause, it seemed to say. What kind of faggot are you? I don't care if you need to answer 
onto the phone. Real gamers have no friends. Presumably this is something to do with accommodating the online players. The ones who so far don't appear to have done anything except warn me about cunning traps that are three feet away in plain sight. Anyway, I eventually managed to return the monster to Cowpat's hell, which meant I was rewarded with an actual fucking checkpoint at last and being restored to life, filling my health bar to full and flooding my limbs with renewed strength. Boldly, I stepped out onto the battlements of the castle, whereupon I was immediately insta-killed by a fire-breathing dragon. Whoops, guess you'll have to wait till the next boss to come back to life again, smarmed the game as I entertained the thought of microwaving the disc and feeding the art book and soundtrack CD to next door's goat. I soon learned that I had to perfectly time when the dragon was flying over and sprint from tower to tower like a commuter in the rain. I did find an underground tunnel that probably could have let me bypass the fiery dragon security system, but going that route led me to getting torn apart by a pack of wild dogs. So finally I timed the runs correctly and reached the end of the dragon section where a small group of elite soldiers and archers were waiting who promptly turned me into a cold steel sandwich. I felt the best way to review Demon Souls would be to simply describe my entire experience, so in conclusion, fuck you Demon Souls. A challenge is one thing, but trying to break down a fucking cement wall with your forehead isn't a challenge, it's grounds for getting fucking sectioned. Although I suppose succeeding in breaking the wall down will give a great sense of accomplishment, which is just as well because you'll have lost all your other senses by then. I think I've realised the problem with World War II games is that everyone already knows how they're going to end. A load of fascists with hard-ons for sausages and hanging big red banners and everything take over continental Europe, spread themselves over too many fronts like a single cunted hooker filling in for her triple cunted friend, Hitler kills himself just in time for some Russians to come and laugh at his mono bollock, then an entire subgenre of alternate history fiction is born. And stories concerning the French resistance are no less predictable. Allies will be victorious, Germans will hop onto the next sausage back to Berlin, and everything will smell faintly of cheese. The Saboteur was the very last game developed by Pandemic Studios before they went the way of all underperforming EA subsidiaries, but will it be a glorious swan song or the last spasmodic twitches and bowel evacuations of a bullet riddled corpse? The first problem one runs into when pitching a French resistance game is that nobody likes the French. They're fine as villains or as mustachioed Lothario types who come to seduce our women, but the term French hero just doesn't sit well on the tongue, and neither does their cheese. Ha! Okay then, why not base a game on the life of William Grover Williams, an Anglo-French race driver who was tasked by a secret British operation to foster the French resistance? A better idea, but unfortunately no one likes the British either. So let's keep the race driver thing, but make him a hard-drinking, two-fisted Irishman. Yeah, everyone loves the Irish. That is to say, Americans love the Irish. Sadly, the only voice actor they could find was the bloke who did Travis Touchdown in No More Heroes, whose best Irish accent bears about as much resemblance to the genuine article as the photocopy of a poorly wiped anus does to a photograph of Mikhail Gorbachev. Saboteur is a sandbox game, and the bastard offspring of about 15 different sandbox games. Chiefly, I'd call it the result of a bout of the soggy biscuit game involving Red Faction, Guerrilla, and Assassin's Creed, with Infamous taking the place of the biscuit. From Guerrilla, it takes an emphasis on property destruction, although you can only blow up selected Nazi structures because the Nazi war machine apparently builds everything out of potato crisps held together with Pritt stick. From Screed, it takes the ability to evade pursuing guards by hiding in things, but the things in question are about as easy to find as a virgin in a maternity ward, and from Infamous it takes restoring areas of the map, direct testicle assaults and climbing up buildings, but the climbing is cat in pants annoying because main character Sean Devlin is Irish and therefore breathtakingly stupid, and you have to continually tap the jump button so he doesn't get distracted by thoughts of guineas and leprechauns and stuff like that. At this point the saboteur seems to be just the thing for people who played any sandbox game this year but felt like it was just a little bit not mediocre enough. So does the saboteur have no unique features? Well it does have this arty thing going on where Nazi controlled areas are all in black and white Schindler's List mode, while liberated areas are all colourful and shiny places where accordion players can sell onions free of oppression. Getting rid of all the monochrome becomes the main incentive for liberating the city, besides, you know, morality and justice and shit like that, because the heavy black shadows make it impossible to tell what the fuck's going on, whether you're about to plough through a flimsy fence or smack into a brick wall, or if the evil goose-stepping Nazi upon whom you're about to commit vehicular homicide is actually an elderly French woman in a funny hat. And this isn't helped when you jump into a car and by default the camera stares at the fucking ground like it's being scolded by the teacher. Paris is one of those old European cities where the roads have been built up over the centuries from the ancient dirt tracks where some proto-Frenchman long ago left a sickly goat out in the sun to create the very first disgusting cheese, so that leaves us with a lot of narrow twisty roads inhabited by lots of nuns, poodles and strolling lovers in the brief moments before they all get tangled up in your wheel arches, and the missions have a terrible habit of making you drive tediously all the way across the map between objectives, it's like they've got a grudge against nuns, perhaps Sean went to a Catholic school. The missions themselves generally involve entering an area the Nazis would rather you didn't, finding a prisoner, an enemy or a piece of equipment, and either freeing them, killing them or breaking it. To do this you either take the sneaky approach by stealing an enemy uniform, slowly walking around the guards and taking them out with silenced attacks when nobody's looking, or you take the direct approach, run screaming in the front door spraying bullets, get your potatoes shot off by three snipers you didn't notice, die, reload, then take the sneaky approach instead. Some missions don't let you do the sneaky though, not that you'll know that until you actually start it. This one time I blew all my money on a silenced machine gun in preparation for a big mission, then the alarm got set off the moment I arrived. It was rather embarrassing really, like I'd shown up to a dinner party in my gimp suit. I guess there are a few games that give you an achievement for hurling yourself off the top of the Eiffel Tower and landing in a pond, so the saboteur can at least hold my attention, but it just doesn't have any identity of its own. It seems more like a grab bag of sandbox game features that other games have done better, all spread unappealingly thin like green shamrock filled butter, with no emphasis on any one mechanic that could have added a tasty layer of marmite. The only innovation it could hope to have is in the story department, since very few games have a protagonist who talks like the thing from the Lucky Charms box. But as I implied at the start, game stories just lose a big chunk of intrigue the moment Nazis get involved. I've honestly 
actually lost count of all the ways I've killed Nazis in my life as a gamer. I've killed them in linear first and third person, sandbox first and third person, I've shot their planes down in flight sims, I've invaded their installations in RTSs, and in the Indiana Jones adventure games I point and click their lights out. Now the saboteur has let me beat the Nazis in a go-kart race, so all I have to do now to have the full collection is smack a Nazi to death with a Guitar Hero controller.